Welcome to the Full Stack MERN Real Estate Project course. In this course, you will develop and deploy a robust MERN stack web application with advanced authentication and search functionality. I will guide you in creating a MERN stack real estate application similar to industry leading platforms like Realtor or other real estate websites. Our focus will be on using the latest versions of React, MongoDB, Node, and Express. The project starts with the installation of React and Tailwind CSS. Then we will dive into using the most recent version of React Router DOM to create routes and dynamic pages. Then we will work on building authentication functionalities. The application's authentication will include both email and password authentication through the use of JSON web tokens, along with Google OAuth integration. For better state management, we will use Redux Toolkit to make the management of global states easier. To ensure a secure user experience, specific pages, such as the user profile page, will be protected on both client and backend sides. The profile page will offer users the ability to update their information, including their username, email, and password. Moreover, users can modify their profile images. You will learn complete CRUD operations, including creation, reading, updating, and deletion, all used by the MongoDB database. Each user will have the ability to create new property listings, giving them the flexibility to apply discounted prices and upload up to six images. Furthermore, users will be able to adjust the number of images associated with their listings even after upload. The platform lets the users manage their listings effortlessly through their profiles, facilitating editing and updates with ease. Each listing page will feature an image slider and convenient contact options for potential tenants or buyers. One of the most exciting aspects of this project is the inclusion of an advanced search functionality. This feature enables users to search by title, limit search results, and apply sorting options through a modern sidebar. We will use cutting-edge search query techniques when working with the MongoDB database. Finally, we will use the Render platform to deploy our fully functional MERN stack real estate application for free. This will enable you to share your creation with others or include it in your portfolio. The prerequisites for this course include a basic understanding of JavaScript and React. If you are excited as I am to build this app, then let's get started. You can find the final version in this address, state.100jsprojects.com. As you can see, we have a homepage here that it has a title and also a button to explore more. Once we click on this button, we are redirected to the listing result page. As you can see, we see the nine listings and also we have a show more button. When we click on it, we see the rest of the listings. You can also click on each listing and explore each of them. We have an image slider at the top. And also we have the title, description, the number of beds, bath, parking spot, and furnish. And also we can contact the landlord and ask about this listing. Inside the homepage, we also have an image slider. We, we can see the recent places with offers, recent places for rent, and recent places for sale. And also we have the ability to create a new listings. For example, here, if I click on my profile image, first thing first, we can actually create a, an account here. So if I sign out, we can see that we can sign up a new user. We have the ability to sign up with username, email, and password. And also we can sign up with Google. For example, if I click on Go continue with Google, here I can choose one of my Gmail accounts, for example, this one. And then we can go to the profile here. We have the ability to change the image of the user. For example, I choose one of the images from my computer. As you can see, we are uploading it. And once it is uploaded, we can see the image and also we can update it inside the database as well. And also we can change the username, email, and password, and we click on update to update it. So as you can see, it is updated inside the database. And if we refresh the page even, we see still the current image. And also we have the ability to create a new listing. So when we click on it, we have the ability to create a new listing with the 
name, description, address. We can choose the type of the listing like sell and rent. We can add the parking spot, furnish, and we can make it an offer. And also we can specify the number of beds and bathroom. And also we can upload an image individually here using this input. So let me create a new listing. For example, I just call it new listing. I'm going to just uh, copy this one and use it for description and address. We can create add a parking spot. Let's create an offer with two bedrooms and three bathrooms, four bathrooms. For example, for the regular price, I choose $1,000 per month. And for the discounted, I use 900. We can upload images. For example, we can choose up to six images. For example, I choose three images here. And when we click on upload, this is going to upload it to the storage. And also you can see the preview of the images here. You can delete the one that you don't like, for example, by clicking on this one. And then you can click on create listing. Once you create it, you're going to be redirected to the page related to that listing. As you can see, this page has a sh share link button and also it has an image a slider. Also, we have the ability to edit this listing. So we can go back to the profile, see our listings by clicking on show listings. And here we see all the listing that is created by this user. For example, I can update this listing by clicking on edit. Also, we can delete them as well. So we click on edit. Here we see the, all the information in, inside the form. And also we can change it easily. You can add an image, for example. Let me add this image. So when we upload, we can add it here and you can keep the previous one and you can change the other things, for example, address and etc. We can click on edit listing. And this is going to edit that listing and add the image that we have added. Also, we have the ability to search here. For example, if I search for modern and I press enter, you can see that all the listings that includes the modern in their title. And also we can sort this result here by the price high to low, low to high, latest and oldest. And we can just see the offers. We can just see the places with parking. So we have the ability to update the search result here inside this sidebar. In the next section, we're going to start creating our project by installing React using Vite. And also we're going to install Tailwind CSS for styling our project. So see you in the next section. All right, in this section, we're going to install React.js and Tailwind CSS, and we're going to create our first template. As you can see, I have put the final version with the address estate.100jsprojects.com for our reference. And the first step we need to do is to install React.js using Vite, but first we need to create a folder. So I'm gonna create a folder here in my desktop. So I'm going to rename this one to the name of our project. I just call it Mern Estate. And then we can just open the Visual Studio Code. So Visual Studio Code, when you open it, it's just the welcome page and doesn't have any default folder. But if you drag this folder inside Visual Studio Code, this is going to uh, make the, this folder, Mern Estate, as the default folder of the Visual Studio Code. We can close the Welcome tab again. And then we can just go to the v menu, the view, and then we just click on terminal to open the terminal. Or you can use control backtick to open the terminal. So as you can see, now this is just this folder, Mern Estate. So we're going to create the client side inside another folder called client. So we're going to install it, the React.js using Vite by this command, npm create Vite at latest because we want to install the latest version and then we want to add the name of the folder that we want the uh, react to be installed in so for example we just say client and once we click on enter this is going to ask us which framework we want to install which is react in our case then we need to choose the typescript or javascript i'm going to choose 
JavaScript and then HWC, which is the faster version. And it's going, it's going to load faster. And as you can see, the folder is created. And inside the folder, we have all the files and folders we needed for React, including the SRC folder, which has the app.jsx file. And also we have a public folder, which all the public asset goes inside. We also have a package.json file, which includes some uh, basic dependencies for installing React, like React and Ro React DOM. In order to install them, and also these dev dependencies, we need to just run npm install. So we just need to go inside the folder. So inside this folder, client, which is a cd client. So now we are inside the client folder. You always have to check this one. And then we just say npm install or npm i. And if the npm doesn't work for you, it means that you don't have Node installed in your computer. You need to go to Google, search for Node.js and install it. Install the latest version uh, to be able to use npm or git. So the installation process is happening now. We can just go and install a Tailwind CSS. So here inside the Google, I'm going to search Tailwind, but we can just add Vite at the end. So we're going to install Tailwind using Vite. So here we see the install Tailwind CSS with Vite, and you have to in check this tab using React because we are, we are using React. And then we have few steps here, six steps. We have done the first step, which is installing React.js using Vite. Then the next step is to install Tailwind CSS. The first command line is going to install Tailwind CSS, post CSS, and auto prefixer. And then this command is going to initialize a tailwind.config.js file and also post css.config.js files, which we need to change later on in the next steps. So I'm going to copy the first one, the first command, and then we can just go back to Visual Studio Code and paste it here. As you can see, the installation is completed. And then we need to install the next part, which this one, which is going to initialize the config files. And as you can see, once we do the, this part, we get two extra files, postcss.config.js and tailwind.config.js. So in the third step, we need to configure this file, tailwind.config.js. So I'm going to copy this one. And then we go back to Visual Studio Code. We can just go to tailwind.config.js and we just delete everything and paste the new code. So this is basically is going to check the index.html file, this file, and also all the files with these extensions inside this folder, src folder. And any classes you add, any Tailwind CSS class you add is going to be detected and then the CSS equivalent of that is going to be created. So this is for this reason. In the four, uh, fourth step, we need to replace everything inside the index.css with these three lines of codes, which is going to apply the base classes of Tailwind CSS. So I'm going to copy this, and then we go to index.css. I'm going to delete everything and place these three lines of code. So, and then that is already done. So the last, they, they said you just run your terminal, npm run dev, and then you can just use Tailwind CSS by adding its classes. So, okay, we have done with the Tailwind CSS part. Let's clean up the, our project first before running it. So we don't need this app CSS file because we are using Tailwind CSS. So we can delete this part, uh, file. Inside the public folder, we can delete this vid.svc. Inside the assets, we can delete this react.svg. And then inside the app.jsx, we can actually delete everything and replace it with a React functional component that we can create by just typing rfc. But we, in order to see that suggestion, the rfc suggestion, you need to install a package, install a, an extension. If you open the extension here, 
you need to have this extension, ES7 React Redux React Native Snippets. So you just search the name of this extension here and then install it. You just need to install it and then you get the suggestion as I get. The other extension I have is auto rename tag, which is going to change the closing tag based on the changes in the opening tag. For example, here, I change this div to h1. So the closing tag is h12. And then we're gonna have a console ninja. This is free too, because, uh, and then uh, you can use it for console logging in, inside the Visual Studio code. For example, if you console log here, something, you get the answer here instead of the checking your browser. Then I have two optional extension, GitHub Copilot and GitHub Copilot Chat. GitHub Copilot suggests you coding, some uh, code suggestion while you're coding. So this is going to make your coding speed faster, but uh, you need to pay, I think, $10 per month for that. And uh, GitHub Copilot Chat is not available yet. I got it for testing and uh, maybe later it's going to be available. This is similar to ChatGPT and you can ask questions about your code and get suggestion as well. Prettier is going to, uh, well, when you save your file, for example, here, if I just like this one and then I save the file, you can see I get the auto format by this um, extension, Prettier. And also we have Tailwind CSS IntelliSense, which is going to suggest you some classes of Tailwind CSS, for example, the colored palettes or something. For example, here, if I add a class, for example, text, and if, I, uh, if you don't see the suggestion, use control space, and then you get the suggestion like that, for example, color red. And this uh, suggestion is all from this Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. You can get all the color suggestion like this. So that was for the extension. Let's run this application. We can run it simply. Let's clear this one first. We can simply run it using npm run this. And your server is going to run inside this URL, localhost 5173. You can change this port number if you wish to. You need to go to your package.json and change the host. But if you want to just run it here, you just keep the command or control in Windows and click on it. And this is going to open your application inside the browser. As you can see, we got the app. And uh, if you want to test your Tailwind CSS, for example, here I changed the text red 500. You can see now that the app is, uh, the color of the app is changed to red. So, if this is working for you, it means that you have installed Tailwind CSS correctly. Otherwise, you just go back and do all these steps again to get the same result. So that was it for the installation of React and Tailwind CSS and creating our first template. The next step, as always I do, is to add the project to, the GitHub, to a GitHub repository. So the reason I do that, because we need this GitHub repository later to deploy our application. And also, I'm going to uh, commit each section inside this GitHub repository, and you can compare your code in that section with my code inside the GitHub repository. And the GitHub repository is going to be available for you as well. In order to add it, you can just uh, stop the terminal using Ctrl C. And then here, you just write down git init to initialize the GitHub repository. Then we're going to add all the files inside our application using git add all or git add dot. And then we're going to have git commit to create a message for that. We just say git commit dash m, this dash m, and then you just put your message inside a double code. And this is uh, just say install React JS and Tailwind CSS and create the first template. So once you have written your message, you can just press enter, and this is going to create the commit. Now we can go to GitHub and create our GitHub repository. You just go to your GitHub, you just search here GitHub, and then in the search results, we can just click on github.com, 
make sure that you are signed in like me here and then it's totally free and you can just uh, use it so just make sure that you sign in and then you just click on this plus icon and just click on new repository you just create a name for your repository i'm just gonna call it mern dash estate and it's available for me and then create a description for that for example i just say real estate app using mern and tailwind css you just can keep it public so everybody can see your GitHub repository or we can make it private. And once you choose your decision, you just click on create repository. So this is going to tell you which command you need to add it. We have done the initialization part. So we just go ahead in the next part. And then here, as you can see, first we're gonna add this origin with this address. Then we're gonna create a branch. And also we're gonna push our code to this main branch. So I'm gonna copy the first code first and paste it here. We're gonna copy the second one. And finally, the last one, which is going to upload our code. So once you see the upload is completed here, here inside the GitHub, you can refresh the page. You can see all your code is added inside this GitHub repository with this address. So you can have it, you can have access to this one as well because I kept it public. And also I'm, I'm gonna add the final version here for you, you can check. So I'm gonna add it now. I'm gonna copy this code, this URL and I'll paste it here. Okay, so you can come and check the application before uh, creating it. All right, so that was it for installation of React.js and Tailwind CSS and creating our first template. Also, we have created the GitHub repository. In the next section, we're going to create the pages and routes of our application. As you can see, we have different pages like home page, we have search page, we have about page, profile, and etc. So see you in the next section for creating the pages and routes. All right, in the last section, we have completed installing React.js and Tailwind CSS, and we have created our first template. In this section, we're going to create the pages and routes. So we need to go to Visual Studio Code, and we go to the Explorer section, and inside the SRC folder, I'm going to create another folder here. I'm going to call this folder Pages. And inside this one, I'm going to create the pages we need. For example, we need an about page. So we just say about.jsx. And here we can use RFC to create a React functional component, which is going to return only a div saying about. And then let's create the other pages. For example, sign in.jsx. I'm just going to create it very fast. And here, sign out.jsx. The next one is profile.jsx. And what else we need for now? I think first we need to just create the authentication. So I'm just gonna create these pages like home.jsx. Okay, that's enough for now. We need to add these pages inside the app.jsx. But before doing that, we need to install a package called React Router DOM, which enables us to create these routes inside the application. So here, let me clear this terminal. I'm gonna install, uh, make sure you're inside the client side, and then we just say mkin install react router DOM, and we press enter. And then we go to app.jsx, we need to import a browser router from react router DOM. Also, we need to import routes, as well as route. So here we're gonna cover everything with the browser router like this. Let's delete this class name. We don't need it now. And then this app. And, and also we need to cover everything with the routes like this. Let me close the route. So I need to, okay, oh, what happened? Ah. So now everything is covered with the browser router and routes. 
And then we're going to create each route. For example, for the home page, we have, we have to import this home uh, React functional component. So in order to import it, you can just simply use control space and get this suggestion import. But we need to keep this file open inside the Visual Studio code to get this suggestion. And then the path for this one is forward slash. So the home page is in the forward slash. And then we're going to have, uh, let me copy this one four more times using alt shift arrow done or done arrow. And then here, this one should be sign in, sign dash in. So this is the path name. And then here we're going to say sign in as well. So we need to import it at the top. As you can see, sign in is imported as well. So let me close this. And then the next one would be sign up. Oh, I created sign out. Actually, it's sign up. So I need to change this to sign up and should be capital. And also inside the file, let's change this one to sign up. Okay. So inside the app at JSX, we need to import that sign up. And the next one is about page. So this one is going to be about. They have imported that one as well. And then finally, we're going to have for the, so we have about home profile. So we need to add the profile. Okay. So now if we test our application, if we, first we need to run it, we just say npm run dev. And then we just go to our website. As you can see inside the home page, we get home because we have rendered the home component. And if you go to other pages, like for example, forward slash profile, we get profile. We have the sign in. Also, we have sign off. And finally, I think we have created the about page. Okay, everything is working. So we have added the routes and created our necessary pages that we need to create for the authentication. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So as I mentioned in the last section, I'm going to add a new commit for each each section inside our GitHub repository. So we don't need to write it down here inside the terminal. We can just open the source control. We can add everything, all the files that we have changed by just pressing in this plus icon, which is going to add all of them. And then we can create a message here at the top. For example, we just say create pages and route. And then we can just commit or we can just click on this arrow button and then click on commit and push at the same time. So when we do that, and then if we go to our GitHub repository now, we refresh the page, we see that now we have two commits. And the last one is create pages and routes. And if you click on it, we can see that changes we have. So that was it for creating the pages and routes. In the next section, we're going to work on the header section. We're going to create the header section, as you can see from the final version. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed creating the pages of our website. And also we have created the routes using React Router DOM. In this section, we're going to work on the header section of the project. If you look at the final version, we can see that the header of the website is available in all pages, like home, about, and signing pages. So it's in everywhere. So we need to make a mechanism to keep this header in all pages. And also the header has a logo, a search bar, and the menu on the right side. And if we check the responsiveness, of the website uh, in the mobile size, we can see that uh, we don't see the other home and about in the mobile size, but in the bigger screen, we see these two menu and then the texts are different sizes. So we need to work on the responsiveness as well. So let's go to uh, Visual Studio Code. Let's close everything. And inside the SRC folder, we're gonna create another folder called components. And we want to add the components like header and etc. in this set in this folder. So first I want to add the header components. I just say header.jsx. For now, I just use RFC to create a React functional component. And then 
for adding this header is to all pages, what we need to do is to go to after JSX and outside this route, so these are all pages, and inside this browser router here, we're going to add the header component. So I'm going to just import the header. As you can see, we are importing it at the top. And now, uh, let's see what's the error here. Okay, I, I have to close this header. So now, if we check the, our website, the final version, we can see that the header is in all pages. For example, in this is the about page. If we go to home page, we see the header at the top. So we have the header in all pages. Let's bring this one to the right side so we can see the changes in real time. Let's close this explorer section and let's go to header.jsx and start creating the header component. So what we need to add here, I just want to firstly make this one header. So this is going to be good for SEO purposes. If you just change the uh, tags to something meaningful. Uh, so here inside this header, we're going to have two, three sections. We're going to have the logo on the left side, and then we're going to have the search, and then we're going to have a menu on the right side. So here, so let me just uh, add a menu, uh, add a H1 tag here. And inside the H1 tag, we're going to have two span, one for the one name, Sahand, and then we have another one for the state. So I want to have a different color for the this one and that one. And then we're going to style them. So for the first one, I just uh, change the text color to be a slate. 500 and for this one I just changed the color to be a slate 700 okay and then we're gonna uh, style both of them I want to change the text size so the class name here I want to make it firstly bold both of the letters and then we can just use text as small to make it a small in the mobile size Actually, we have a zoom here. If we remove the zoom, you can see they are very small. And then in the bigger size, we want to have a large size, like we just said, text X large. So this is for the full size. So after mobile, so we just say mobile this one. And after the mobile size, we have this one. And then we're going to have, we will uh, bring them next to each other. And also we want to, uh, set the flex to wrap. So the reason I'm doing that because in the mobile size, if you check it here, inspect and choose the mobile, so we can see that the, they are actually next to each other. And then when we add the uh, search bar and the menu, this is going to be a little bit big. So we want to bring them on top of each other after that. So I'm going to add the, I have added this flex wrap for this reason. So Let's continue for this part. So after this header, we're going to add the form for our input, the search bar. So we just, uh, I want to add a form and we don't need any action for that. But inside this, we're going to have an input. So we're going to have an input with the type of text. And also we're going to have a placeholder search. So we can add more like this one. And then we can just uh, style it. So let's style it ourselves. Let's close this one. We don't get an error. Okay. As you can see, we have this search bar here. The first things I want to do is actually bring them next to each other here. At first, I want to make this header with the background color of a slate. Mm, I can say 200. Now we can see. Uh, the changes and also we want to add a shadow effect of medium on the bottom like this and then uh, what I want to do I want to make them bring them in say, in the center so in order to do that we cannot do it like this we need to add an extra div here and bring everything inside this div and then here I want to first thing first I want to bring them next to each other just using flex and then we can just add a space between them. We just say justify between to add a space between the elements. But now we have two elements. So 
the search one went on the right side and then the logo is on the left side but if we have more items like three items the search is going to be in the center and then we want to bring them uh, or uh, vertically center center them using on item center and also we want to add a maximum width of 6xl which is 1152 pixels so this is going to actually add a space around them but as you can see it's not uh, they are not on the in the center so for bringing them to the center we just add mx auto which is margin x auto so now you can see we have equally size on the right and left side and also we want to add some padding so we push them a little bit inside here we just add a padding of three i just want to use a very simple tailwind css classes so we just can focus on the react part of the project but you can work more on your project make them more beautiful they are uh, uh, tailwind css is exactly like css so you have all the flexibility and you can add whatever you want here as well but uh, let's just focus on our application more. So inside the input, we want to have a class name as well. Here, I just want to remove the background color. So just say background transparent. The reason I'm doing it, we want, because I want to make this form to have a different color. So this form, I want to make this one with the background color, a slate 100. So in this way, I can add this uh icon the search icon inside as well so here so we added this background color in the form and also i want to make the padding of three so we add some space and also i want to add a rounded corner like around the large so you can see a little bit of the round corner and let's add the icon to the the place i want to get the icon is a package called react icons so we need to install a package called react icons and then we can use all their icons here so it's very simple you just need to i want to open another terminal but you have to be inside the client side and here we're going to install a package called react dash icons and when you install this what we want to have here is to import the search icon. So I, mean, I want to import here at the top. We don't need to import React, so we can delete it. So the name of the icon is FA search. We just say FA search, and this is coming from React dash icons forward slash FA. And FA stands for Font Awesome. So we're going to have the icon from the Font Awesome website, but using this package. So after this input, we, I'm going to add this. Uh, I want to add this uh, icon. It's very easy to do that. We just need to add this icon component here. We just say FA search and then we just close it like this. And also I have added the color uh, slate 500 or you can just choose 600 like this. And then we need to bring them next to each other. So we know already how to do it. We just need to change the display to flex. And then we want to center them uh, vertically as well. So we just use item center. So what happens? Uh, oh, item center. Sorry. Okay. Now they are centered. So what else we can add here to have a better styling? I think everything is done. When we click on this uh, search input, I want to remove this outline because it makes it ugly. So here I'm going to add this focus. If there is a focus, I want to remove the outline. We just say outline none like this. Now we don't have the outline. So, and then we can just set the width of this in a different sizes in the mobile and the uh, biggest screen sizes. So here I'm just say set the width to be 24 in the mobile size, a smaller because we want to have the menu too. And then in the small size and above, we want to set the width to be 64. So we're going to have a bigger search bar in the bigger screen. 
All right, so that's very easy to do responsiveness in Tailwind CSS. You just need to write down the mobile first, and then you just say after mobile do this one. Or if you want to more be more specific, you can just say uh, for tablet as well. For example, you just say medium above do the other one. So there are, uh, you can do for all the sizes, but I feel I feel this is the best way to just focus on the mobile and the bigger screens. So everything else will be easy to do. So after here, after this form, we're going to have a, our menu, which is an unordered list. And inside this list, we're going to have the first list, is, which is going to be, uh, we're going to have home and about. We just say home. And then we're going to have another one, uh, two more, about and sign in. Okay. And the, the things we want to do here is to bring them next to each other. So I'm going to add another class name here. We just say flex and we want to add some space between them. We just say gap. Uh, we can just say gap four. And as you can see, it's just a little bit squeezed. Uh, just we want to remove this home and above in the a small size. So in the small size, we just say make this home hidden. Sorry, we, add, we need to add the class name first. We just say hidden so we don't see it now but in the small size and above we want to make this one in line so in the bigger size we can see the home and then we can do the same things for the about as well let me add the hover effect as uh, two so we can just uh, first i want to add the text color a slate 700 and then we can just say if there is a hover of effect if we hover over it just change add the underline so now we when we hover over it oh we don't see the underline underline i missed the r here okay now we see the underline and then we can do the same things for the other about and sign in i'm just gonna paste this same code here okay now all of them are working, but when we click on them, when we click on them, we want to go to their specific page. For example, if I click on about, I want to go to forward slash about. So there is a simple solution for that. We can easily import a link from React Router DOM, and link is going to bring us from one page to another without refreshing the page. So this is very helpful here. For example, in this, uh, h1 tag i want to we can wrap this one with the link tag and then the the two attributes should be forward slash and then we want to close the link tag here so now if you click on here we go to home page so if i if i'm in the about page if i click here i go to the home page so let's do the same thing for uh, uh, and also i want to keep this sign in uh, and then i don't want to make it hidden so i'm going to remove this hidden part for the sign in so we can see the sign-in only in the mobile screen size. So uh, the next step we need to do is to add this link to other things as well, like this home. I want to add the link. Let's get help from the GitHub Copilot to do it faster. So here we're going to have the link to the About page. And also the last one is going to be the uh, to the sign-in page. So sign in and then close here. So let's test all of them. So this one goes to sign in, about goes to about, and then home goes to the home page. So it's working fine. So for adding the functionality of the search, we need to create our website first. We need to add our listings and everything, and then we can add the searching functionality. For now, we're going to keep the UI, and then later we're going to add this search functionality when we have the, the content in our website so that was it for the header section in the next section we're going to work on the back end part of the project because we need to create the sign in and sign up pages and uh, we need to firstly create the back end and the api of these routes and then we can just uh, create the client size and interact the between the client and the back end that time so first, let's add this one to the GitHub. So we here, we have these uh, changes. So we can uh, just uh, 
what you do here you just add the plus icon and add everything all the changes and then here we just create a message we just say create header component all right so and then we just click on commit and push all right that was it for this section in the next section we're going to work on the back end side so see you in the next section All right, in the last section, we have completed the header part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the backend side and we start creating the backend part of the project. And create first, I want, we want to create the server. We want to run the server. So we can just go to Visual Studio Code. And here, we can open the Explorer section here. We just create a separate folder with the name API. And then we need to initialize a package.json file here, but we need to do it in the root of our project, not inside the API folder. Because actually when we deploy our website, the, the render platform is going to check the root of our website and consider both of the backend and the frontend. So the backend, the package.json should be inside the root. So here we go back by just saying cd dot dot and make sure you are inside the root with this folder and then we just initialize a package.json file using npm init dash y and we press enter and then as you can see inside this package.json we already have the name of our projects which is created based on the folder we have then we have the version description is empty and the main file here is index.js so we have to create a file called index.js and these are the scripts that we're going to modify soon but now we just want to create this file inside the api api folder and then here we just say index.js and here we need to first thing first we want to install express here we just say npm install let me clear this so you can see it better at the top and here we just say npm install express so we need to use Express Framework to easily create our backend and APIs. And once we install it, we can just import Express from Express. And using Express, we can create an application, which is a const app equals to Express. And the app gives us a lot of uh, like a methods to use. The first one we want to use is to listen a port number. We just say app to that listen you want to listen to if check so listen to port 3000 and then we want to return we just say server is running on port 3000 so this is going to listen to this port number and then we're gonna uh, in this callback function we're gonna say console log server is running on port 3000 and it can be any port number it can be 4,000, 5,000, it doesn't matter. And here, we can run our server, we just use a node, we just have to run this file, which is inside this folder API. We just say API for slash index.js. So let's see what error we are getting. Uh, as we are using import here, we need to change the type from, uh, as you can see, saying that the type module is required for using this kind of import so we need to go to this package.json file and here after this main we can just add type this is json so we need to put it inside a double code and then this one can be module here so the default one is common js so in order to import packages if you don't want to use type module you need to use require instead of import so now if you run again we can see that uh, it's, it is showing server is running on port 3000. But if I do some changes here, for example, if I add an exclamation mark here, we see that it is still showing server is running on port 3000 without exclamation mark. So actually you need to restart the server each time you do some changes, which is very time consuming and annoying. So we can fix this one using a package called Nodemon. So I'm going to stop the server using Ctrl C and I'm going to install this package. We just simply install Nodemon. And once we install it, we can 
just say node one API post slash index.js, but the best practice is actually add a script for that. So we can just go to a package.json here, and we have a test script here, but we can just add more things. We can just delete this one. I want to add a script called div. So for npm run div, I want to run nodeman api for slash index.js. And then each time I use npm start, I want to use node api for slash. The reason I'm, I have added this start is when we want to deploy the application to render, we need to add this npm start because the render is going, it needs to run our backend with using node. And you don't need to actually install the node mod in the dependency. You can install it in the dev dependency, in the development dependency. So you could add just that dev at the end and install it there because we don't use this node mod in the production. Okay. So if I want to run now node mod API for slash index yes, we just need to write down npn run dev. So this is going to run the node mod. As you can see, the server is running on port 3000. And then if I do some changes here, for example, if I remove these exclamation marks, you can see the service is run, uh, is restarting automatically using node mod. So we don't need to worry about restarting the server anymore. So that was it for creating and uh, starting the backend. So now let's add this one to the GitHub. I just uh, noticed that I have created the GitHub inside the client folder but we had to actually make it inside the root folder so we can use it for both folders. You can fix that one by just going to your client folder and then use this code, mv.get.forslash. This is going to move your GitHub repository to a folder, uh, to your root folder, the uh, one folder back, actually. So now, as you can see, we can we are actually our Git is detecting all the files that we have installed inside the API at the root folder, which is not good. We want to ignore these files. We don't want to just uh, upload these node modules files. We can fix that one by just moving the Git ignore file from the client side to the root section. You just move this one and bring it outside. You can see that now we have only 70 changes. And uh, let's see if there is a module here. No, there is no module. And also because we have moved the file, the source section from the client side, it's just showing that you deleted and updated. That's not important. But uh, the important thing is there's no module files to be uploaded. And also we are considering the API folder two. So let's see, we have this, let me close that. So the changes we have here, the package lock client are here. We have, yeah, we have this one index.js inside the API folder. So we can just, now you can see now we have two GitHub repository here actually. The one we want to add is this MERN estate. Okay, now here I want to create a message. We just say create and run this server. And uh, let's add everything. And then we just commit and push. Okay, this is, uh, this one fixed our, we can just uh, ignore this client. We just work on the MERN get, estate get. And then we just check our GitHub repository. Now, if you refresh the page, we see that we have a last commit, create and run the server. We just show inside the API folder, index.js, we have created uh, this file, index.js file, and also the package.json from the client, from the backend, everything moved to here. But from the next section, we don't have any problem actually adding our GitHub repository. So uh, see the changes. So this is the header section and this is the create and run the server. All right, so that was it for creating and running the server. In the next section, we're going to uh, connect our database to our server. We wanna install a package called Mongoose and then we're gonna 
use Mongoose to connect to our database, which in our case is MongoDB. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have created our server and we have run the server on port 3000. In this section, we're going to connect our application to the database. And the database we're going to use is MongoDB and we need to install a package called Mongoose to be able to easily interact with the database, create models and etc. So here inside a terminal, now uh, let's create another terminal one for the front end and one for the back end so the front end is a client here we just say npm run dev we run the client side and also the for the back end we just need to say npm run them as run dev as well to run the node mod so the server is running on port 3000 and uh, what we can do uh, i want to open another terminal but this terminal should be in the root of our project because we want to install in the back end so here i'm going to install a package called mongoose and then we need to import mongoose at the top here we just say import mongoose from mongoose and then we want to use a method from mongoose called connect so we just say mongoose.connect but here we want to uh, have our application string. So we need to get this application string from the MongoDB website. So we need to go to the Chrome. I'm going to search for MongoDB. And in the search result, we just go to mongodb.com. And here we need to, if you don't have an account, make sure to create an account. It's free. You can just click here start free and then you just fill the fill up the form and or create it with your google i already have an account so i'm going to just click on sign in and here i'm going to uh, connect with my mongodb applic account with my google account and then once you are inside your Mo Mongo mongodb you can see your previous projects uh, like this one my previous project and otherwise, if you wanted to create a new project, you just click on this uh, arrow and then you just click on new project. You can just name your project. For example, I just name it Mern Estate and just uh, click on next. And here uh, we don't want to add anyone else. So we just click on create project. So once we create our project, we need to create our database. So as you can see, we can create our uh, a deployment or you can just go to here database and then build a database here so we just click on build a database they ask you which uh, type of uh, service we need we can just choose the free one uh, it doesn't matter you can just test your application and later on if you have a successful application with a lot of traffic you can just change it anytime but choose the free one for now. You can choose which provider you need. You can just choose the AWS and choose this uh, region. You can choose your, the region near your place or the near the place that most of your customer will be. I just use the America. And then you just name it, name this cluster. For example, I just say Mern Estate. And then you just click on Create here. Once we do that, they ask you for the username, password, and just choose the IP address. So it's just a simple form you need to fill. I just use Sahand for username and password Sahand. So I can remember that. And then uh, you can just choose this cloud environment, advanced, because later we want to deploy it. So we need to add different things. And then after that, you just need to specify the IP address. So the IP address of your computer can be added here. For example, add my current IP address, uh, which is added already here for me. But if you want to have access to your application from everywhere, you just choose zero, zero, zero. So for your, if you want to change your computer or you think that you're going to go somewhere else, work on your computer and your IP will be different. So you add this zero, 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 but later you can change this one and remove that one and add your the IP address of your 
server that we're going to deploy. So here we're going to add this. And then finally, we just click on finish and close. And uh, as you can see, congratulations on setting up your access rules. We just go and overview. So your, our application is created. We just need to connect to it. We just click on connect here. If you click on connect, they give you several options, but we, we just want the, uh, the URI of this. So as we, as uh, we just uh, need to get this code, we, you just click on driver and then come here and copy this code. So you just click here to copy it. And then you just need to go to your Visual Studio code and paste it here. Once you do that, you get connected to the database, but you need to specify the password because the password is just the board password here. My password was Sahan. So I just add Sahan. So if you don't get an error here, it means that you are connected. And also you can choose a name for your cluster here to at after the forward slash. For example, I just say Mern estate. And then if you want to share your application with others, if you want to do that, if you want to put your application in places like GitHub, and share it with other people. So you, you cannot do put it like this, your code here, because everybody else can see your password and use it. So the best practice is to hide it using an environmental variable. So here we can just create a new file called .env. And here we're going to create a variable called Mongo or anything, any name would be acceptable. And then we can just uh, cut this one and paste it here all right so and then if you want to use it here you just need to say process dot env dot mongo okay so this is going to call that variable but inside the github people see only this word process that env dot mongo because this dot env is going to be ignored when you're uploading it and then uh, as you can see we are getting an error actually here the reason we are getting an error because by default you cannot use an environmental variable inside the backend. You need to install another package to be able to do that. So we're going to install another package here called .env. So you just say npn install .env and we need to import it at the top, import .env from .env and then we need to initialize it using .env.config like this. So if we check now, we can see that we are not getting an error here. That's a good sign, but we don't know actually we are connected or not. So we need to have some feedback to be able to detect that we are connected or not. So we need, we need, we can just say if we, the connection is successful, then for example, console log connected to DB. And then we just say, otherwise catch the, an error. If there is an error, catch the error and console log the error like this so let's see if we are uh, we need to close the parenthesis here okay and then we need to remove this branch okay so now we can see that inside the terminal we are getting the board connected to the mongodb so it means it's working all right so and if you for example and have an error for example if the my password is wrong i add an x here and then if you save this file again, you can see after we get an error here and we see the error here, which is bad authentication. Okay. So that's the feedback we can get and we know what is the error. So we can just uh, fix my password. So now we should see connected to DB correctly. All right. So that was it for connecting to database. In the next section, we're going to work on creating the model. But first, let's add this one to the GitHub. So if you check here, you can see that inside the source control, we are actually, we are having the .env. So we are actually, we can detect, we can upload the .env to the GitHub now, which is not good actually, because people can see our password. What we need to do is to go to this .ignore file and add the .env here as well. We just say, we just uh, say .env at the end. And this is going to ignore this .env file. So we, we just ignore that one. So now, which is ready, we can just press, uh, press on this plus icon. And then we just create a message for our commit. For example, I just say 
connect to database. All right. So, and then we can just, uh, we just say connect to database and then we can just say commit and push. So if you now check our GitHub repository and refresh the page, you can see that the last commit is connect to database. And we see the changes here. We have uh, modified the get ignore file. And also uh, inside the index.js, we have just installed, uh, after the installation of the .env and .mongoose, we have imported both of them. And also we have connected to our MongoDB using Mongoose here. All right, that was it for connecting to database. In the next section, we're going to create our first model for our database, which is for users, because we need to create a model which sets some conditions, sets some rules about the data that can be added to the database for us. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have connected to the database. In this section, we're going to work on creating models using Mongoose. So we need to create some model for the user. So in this case, we're going to have some rules and requirement. So the person who is interacting with the database uh, should uh, follow these rules and create the variables and data based on these rules. So what, uh, what we need to do is to go to Explorer section and inside the API folder, we need to create another folder called models and then inside this uh, or we just say uh, yeah, models and then inside this folder we're going to create a file called we can just call it uh, user.js or for more specific naming we can just say user.model.js this is exactly like user.js but you can uh, make it like this so you, when you're working with different files later, when you have many files, you're, gonna, you're not going to be confused by the file naming. So here inside this file, we're going to import Mongoose from Mongoose. And using Mongoose, we're going to first create the rules. As I mentioned, we have to create the rules and they call it a schema. So we're going to create the, a constant called user schema, and we're going to use a method inside mongoose uh, called a schema we should say new mongoose.schema and then here we need to specify different rules for example for username so we're going to have username email and password so for the username we're going to set the type to be a string and then we set it to be required so what i mean by type is string so any other types like uh, numbers or boolean are not allowed to be added for the username so you're gonna get an error if you do it so this is going to protect our database from uh, different type of uh, inputs so and then this is going to be required so no user can be added to the database without having username so you're gonna get an error for this one as well and also we can just make this one unique so we set the unique to true so it means that no one can have this uh, the username similar to others so everybody should have a different username so before adding the username to the database mongodb is going to check if the same username exists or not otherwise if there is a user with the same username they're going to send us an error so they they want anyone to add the same username so that is for the username for the email and password would be similar. So I'm going to copy this one using Alt Shift Done Arrow two times. So the use, username and then we have email. So the email should be with the type of a string. It should be required and also unique. And for the password, uh, it's, it is required and the type is a string, but it can be the same. For example, two users can have the same password so we're gonna remove that uh, unique true and also so that was this for this one we're gonna close this and also we want to add something called timestamp true which is going to tell the mongodb to record two important extra information one is the time of 
uh, up the once one is the time uh, time of creation of the user and also the other one is the time of update of the user so later when we want to for example sort this information we can use this two extra information to be able to easily sort them by time and latest so here we're going to add the timestamp true which is going to automatically add these two extra information for us so after creating the schema we're going to create the model so we're going to create a constant with the name of user and then here we're going to use a method inside the mongoose called model and here we're going to have we're going to set first the name of the model which is user and this one should be uppercase and singular but mongodb is going to automatically create add the s when we have more than one user the, we're going to be users okay so we don't need to write down users this is going to be automatically added by mongodb and then we're going to pass our user schema that we have created here and finally we just export it as a default so we just export default user to be able to use this model anywhere else in our application so later we need to use this model so we're going to import it easily okay so that was it for creating the model now let's add this one to the github repository so we're going to set a name for it for example i just call it create user model and then we can just add this file that we we have created and also click on commit and push so this is going to add this one to our uh, github repository and if you check our github repository and we go back here and inside the commits and if you refresh the page we see the new uh, get that is added and as you can see uh, we just created a file called user.model.js inside a folder called models we have imported mongoose from mongoose and then first we have created the user schema which includes the different uh, rules for username email and password and we have used the mongoose.schema to create this schema based on this user schema you have, we have created the model using mongoose.model we set the name to user and this is um, this must be singular and, and also we have exported as a default so we can use it anywhere else in our application so that was it for creating the model in the next section we're going to create uh, the first API route and we're going to create a test API route so see you in the next section all right in the last section we have created the user model in this section we're going to create our first API route so let me show you an example for an API route first so inside the explore section in the index.js file if you go down here we want to create a api route for example i just say app.get we're going to create an api route to the forward slash now for example so we create we just say forward slash and then we just say request that response request is the data that we get from the client side for example uh, this browser when we send a data this is uh, from request so this is request response is the data we sent back from the server side so we have server we have client so we want to interact between these two using these two uh, requests and response so request is from the browser client and response is from the server and then we're going to create a f uh, we, we can just send anything to the client for example we just say response.send hello world for example so let me test this one okay so we're going to create this api route and the, the way we test it is to go to here we just say and this is a forward slash okay so let me change this one to test so we're going to just say test but if you go now to forward slash test we don't get anything because the url here is 51 73 all right but the one in the server is 3000 so we need to change this one to 3000 as you can see now we test it we see the and we get the hello world but uh, 
because we don't want to do it each time, we want to create a proxy. So each time we request from this URL, we want to, uh, if the route is related to the API, we want to go to that a specific section. So uh, for now, we just leave it like this one with, with the test like 3000, we're going to create the API route, but when we cre create our client side and we want to interact with the backend, uh, instead of just using this 3000 all the time and change it, we're going to create the proxy. But for now, I'll, I just want to show you how to create the API route. So if we go to the test, we get this hello world. We can, it can be anything else. It c you can send back a JSON, a, a file, an object, anything. For example, here we can just say response.json. And instead of this hello world, we can send back an object, for example. We just say message hello world, like this. So if you now test again, you can see we get an object with a message hello world. So anything we can send to the client. But this is not the best practice, actually, for uh, creating API routes. Because we, can, we cannot create all the API routes, like a signing, sign up everything here inside the index.js. So this is going to be a, a long file if you do it. So what is the best practice? The best practice is to create a separate folder for API routes and also the, these functions that we have. For example, inside the API, we're gonna create another folder called routes. Okay, and here we're gonna create our first route. For example, we just for the user, we create a route, we just say routes user.route.js, and here we can just uh, first import express from express. We're gonna use express to create the route. So here we just say, uh, create a constant called router, and using express.router, we can create our router and just uh, pay attention, the route, this router is with the uppercase R. So express.router with uppercase R, and now we can just create our test API route. For example, we just say router.get. Uh, the reason we are getting get request because we just want to get the information. We don't want to send any information. If you want to send to the database, you need to use put request or post request. Okay. So get is just getting the information. And then we say forward slash test request.response. And then we just create, uh, we can just uh, response with this JSON saying hello world. So now we want to use this route inside the index.js. So all the routes should be defined inside the index.js. So here, instead of .get, we just say .use. And then here, we just say anytime someone goes to the forward slash API and forward slash user, use that route that we have created. So we need to export this one as a default here. So we can use it here and then we need to import it here at the top. So we just say import. And because we want to use different router, like uh, we want to create user router, we want to create authentication router later, we want to use the listing router. So we cannot just call it router. So this is going to be confusing. So we just say user router. We import it as a user router, but as we are exporting as a default, we can change its name. We don't need to say just router. We can just change its name, but the address must be the same address. So user router from forward slash routes, which is here, forward slash user.route.js. So they're gonna detect, oh, this one has a default export. So we changed its name to user router. And then here, we're gonna call that user router. So now if we test our application, so instead of test, we have to go API post slash user post slash test and we get the same JSON. So each time you go API user, okay, this is the route we want to uh, check and then we check all the routes, uh, the path name inside the user router, which is here and the first one is test. So API user test and we get this message. And the other things we need to consider is even you Putting the logic like this is not the best practice. We need to put this logic even inside a separate folder. So we're going to create another folder inside the API. And this folder is going to be controllers because they call these logics and functions controllers. 
And inside the controller, we're going to have our user controller. We just say user.controller.js. And we're going to just bring this function here. We just say export, export a function called a function test, for example. And then this is going to just return the same JSON here. And then we can use this function inside this API route. So instead of this, we're going to delete it. And then we just call that test, which is coming from forward slash controllers, forward slash user controller. And don't forget to add the dot JS here at the end. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. So now uh, we can test the same things. If you refresh the page, we get the same JSON, but this JSON is coming from this controller. So let's test it again. For example, I just changed this one to a API route is work. Okay. So each time we want to test our API, we just go to forward slash user, forward slash, forward slash API, forward slash user, forward slash test. And if you go to this route, we get this message. API route is working. So we are sure that our, our API is working. All right. So that was it for creating our test API route. In the next section, we're going to create the sign up API route. So we're going to go our application in a, so we can use our application and sign up the users. Before doing that, we just need to add this one to the GitHub repository real quick with the message of create a test API route. And then we can just commit and push. So now we go check. We can see if we go inside the commits and check our recent commits, we see the last one is create a test API route. And you can see that we have created a controller file inside a controllers folder. And this file just created a function called test, which is returning a JSON saying API route is working. And then we have added this function here inside the user.route.js here. And here we have used express to create a router using the express.router method. And we have created our first router, which is router.get with the get method. We just say, each time we go to the forward slash test, you call this function and we have exported as a default and we have imported this one on, at the top. We just call it user router. And then we just use app that use to create the API route. So each time we go to forward slash API forward slash user, we're going to call this router, which is going to call the function test here. All right. So that was it for creating the uh, test API route. In the next section, we're going to create the a sign up API route. So see you in the next section. All right. In the last section, we have created our test API route. In this section, we're going to work on creating the sign up API route. So what we want to do is to get the information like username, email and password from the our client side which is this browser and then we're gonna uh, change the password hash the password and save it inside the database so what we need to do here is to create the sign up api route first but as the authentication is very important we're not going to create the, that one inside the user we're going to create a separate file and for the authentication. So we're going to create, this is the user route. We're going to create another route. Uh, so here in this route, first we create a new route called user dot, no, sorry, out authentication or auth dot route dot JS. And here we're going to create that one. Similarly, we just import express from express. Let me and then we're just going to create our router using express.router with uppercase R. So that's ex exactly the same for the creating that. But here, instead of having a get request, we're going to have a post request. And this is going to be to post slash sign up. And we're going to create a function for that. So we're going to create the function inside a file inside a controller. So we're going to separate the functions. So here we just say auth.controller 
Node.js. And here we're going to export a constant called sign up. And this sign up is going to have the request and response. So let me just write it like this. So this is going to be with the request and response. And then let me close this. And then we add this one to here to auth.route.js. We just say sign up and then we need to import it. So we import it at the top, but don't forget to add this .js to prevent any possible errors. And then what we want to get, as I mentioned, we want to get the information from the browser. And this is coming from the body, what I, they call a body. Request that body is the information we get from the browser, right? So let me first show you what we get from the request.body. You just console log now, request.body. So we have created this function. We have added it inside the router. Let's export it as a default here. And then inside the index.js, we need to import it at the top. So here we're going to import auth router from routes forward slash auth dot route dot js. And then we're going to create that API route which is the same things like app.use, post slash API, but instead of user, we're going to have off. And then we're going to call that file, which is off router. So we have created them. Now we want to see this request.body. But in the browser, as we don't have now any form, we cannot send any data. So what we need to do is to use a, an API test software. There are plenty of softwares that we uh, we can use like Postmon, like Insomnia and etc. But for the sake of this project, I'm going to use Insomnia. This is my favorite API route test because it has a very beautiful user interface and it's very simple to use. So here inside the Google, we're going to search for Insomnia. And if you search Insomnia, you're going to get all about the sleeping disorder. You just add API test at the end and this is the website we are looking for insomnia.rest and if you click on this one you can just get it for free we can just click on get started for free and they have a free version that gives us everything we need so we don't need to actually pay for it so we just get downloaded you can download it for your operating system mine is mac os but if you have a windows they're going to suggest you to download it for windows so I have already downloaded and installed it in my machine. So I'm going to open it. So once you open it, this is my previous projects. If you want to get the same things, you just go to the home page here. Just click on home icon. And if you're inside the home, you just click on create. Just click on create and request collection. And here you just name your request collection. For example, for this project, I'm just going to say Mern estate and just click on create. So here you can just add your API routes. So we want to separate because we're going to have different routes like for listing, for user, for authentication. So we're going to separate them using a folder. So here we're going to create a new folder. Just click on plus icon, new folder. And here we, I, I just want to separate the authentication. I just say auth. And inside the folder, when you just hover over the folder, click on this arrow and just say HTTP request. And you can just change your request name by double clicking on it or, okay, you cannot change it like this. You can just click on rename. And the first one is sign up. And this is a post request. So you change the get to post and you need to specify the address of your API, which is in our case, it's localhost, double clone 3000. And then the API route uh, address was API for slash auth. If we remember this, inside the index.js, we have API for slash auth. And then inside the auth.route.js, we have for slash sign up. So here we just add the for slash sign up. Now we can add the body section. As I mentioned before, we couldn't do it inside the browser, but here we can add the information we want to send inside the body by just adding a JSON here. We just say JSON. JSON, the variable should be inside a double code. For example, we want to add username. The username, we just say, 
I just say, for example, test. We want to send email. So test at gmail.com. And then we're going to send the password. So the password, I just use the hand here. That's fine. And if we click on send now, we should trigger that console log request.body. And then we should see it inside the terminal. So I'm going to click on send. Here, nothing happens. But inside the terminal, we get undefined. So we are not getting the information. We are getting undefined. The reason we are getting undefined is by default, we are not allowed to send any JSON to the server. We need to allow the JSON as the input. So we need to go to index.js. Here, after the app, we create the app. We're going to just say app.use. And we just say express.json. This is going to allow JSON as the input of the server. So if you try again now inside the Insomnia, we send the information, the same information. And we go back to Visual Studio Code. We can see we are getting the JSON here. We get the username, test, email, test at gmail.com, and password, sahan. But actually, this is not what we want to do. We don't want to just show it and console log it. We want to save this one inside the database. So what we do here, I want to destructure what we have inside the request.body. So I want to just get all the information we need. We just create a constant and this is going to, we're going to get the username, email, and password from the request.body. So we can use this information and save it inside the database. The reason I'm doing it because we need to actually change the password later. We cannot save it as it is. Then we're going to save it inside the database using, we just say create new user and we're going to use the model that we have created. Remember, we have created a model here, user.model.js. We use that model to save these three informations. So we just say new user, username, email, and password. We get this information, and also we need to import this user model. We're just going to use that control space and import it at the top. But don't forget to add the .js because mostly automatically VS Code doesn't add the .js in the backend it makes uh, an error if you don't do it. After creating the new user, we can just save it. We just say new user.save. And this is going to save it inside the database. But this saving takes time. For example, a few seconds, depending on your internet speed, this is going to take a uh, different time. So in order to prevent an error, we just use a wait. So the the code is going to stay in this line until this operation finished, and then we go to the next line. But if we use await, you need to change this function from synchronous to asynchronous, like this. So this is going to save it inside the database. What we want to do next is to create a response. Uh, first, I want to make a status of 201, which means something is created. And then we're going to have a JSON, but I'm going to just uh, give a message. You, uh, user created successfully. Okay. We can just say user created successfully. Let's test this one in our insomnia. So insomnia, we have already this information. So let's send this one now. Now we are getting an error server return nothing. So let's see what we did here that caused that error. So, uh, so this is connected and we see what error we got here. Our user validation failed. Password is required. So the password, uh, this is password. This one is password. Password, that is correct. But what about our model? The uh, user.model. Pass, our uh, password here, I made the typo. So we just have to check everywhere to be sure that everything is correct. All right. So now if we test again, we get user created successfully. That's a good sign, but we have to check our database if we see that this one is added or not. Uh, I have to go again inside my MongoDB account. So you just go to mongodb.com and sign in because if you, you already sign up, just choose my Google account to go inside the account. 
and once you're inside you have to go and check the same project name so make sure this project name is correct mern dash state for myself and then you can just click on database here on the left and then we already connected we want to check the inside the database so we click on browse collection and if you see that we have created the users is automatically is with the s but if you remember inside the model we just write down user okay so that's the first thing we need to check users and then the first user is added with the name username test email test at gmail.com and password sahan but here we have a problem actually uh, the problem is this password is actually saved as it is so we don't want to save the password like this because if somebody hack the database and find the information of our user they're gonna see all their password and also if we have an admin they can have access to our database they can see it as well so this is not the best practice the best practice is to hash the password they encrypt the password there are there are plenty of ways to do the encryption there are some packages the package i want to use is bcrypt.bcrypt.js so here inside the backend make sure you are in the root folder mern estate and then here we just install the package called bcrypt.js so once you install it we just need to go to our auth.controller.js and here we're going to import that bcrypt.js from bcrypt.js and after getting the password from the body we're going to hash the password so we just say const hashed password is going to be equal to because uh, the, we can just use this one bcrypt js dot hash sync uh, hash sync it means it waits for the hash so we don't need to use await here this already is using await itself we're going to pass the password and also we're going to pass something called salt number which is the run the number of round for creating the salt salt is just a hash number or variable which is going to be combined with our password and make it encrypted so in this way we have a hash password now instead of the password we want to pass this hash password so if we try again inside insomnia we cannot uh, actually save the same one because we get an error so i'm going to change its name to test 2 and then we're going to send this one user is created successfully so if you check again if for refreshing this one you don't need to refresh the page you just need to click on this main state and this one again and this is going to automatically refresh it for you so the new one is test2 with the email test2 at gmail.com but the password is hashed so now we have successfully stored the data but what if we get an error for example if i want to add the same username and email we should get an error because as i mentioned before in the model in in the model uh, user.model.js we said that username and email must be unique so if we try to save the same uh, send the same information we should get an error but we don't get an error here we don't see the error we only see the error inside the uh, server we get an error here showing us duplicate key and it says that the username has a duplicate key so the name must be different but we don't want to see the error here inside the console we want to send back the error to the user and based on that error we're going to send an error uh, show the error to the user so here inside the after controller instead of just saving it we're going to put this one inside a try and catch a statement so we just use the try and catch a statement we put this await and respond inside a try and if an error happened we want to send an error we just say response dot status for example status 500 which means an error happened inside the server and we're going to send back this error for example we can just send back this error and see it inside the insomnia let's test it again so if you send now we get uh, we get the 500 internal server error and what we want to see uh, we are not getting the correct response actually let's see response.json.error so let's uh, just uh, return the error.message okay so let's test again 
Okay, now we are getting the message duplicate key for the username. All right. So uh, that was successful too. We could track the error and send it back to the user. In the next section, we're going to actually handle this error in a different way. We're going to add a middleware and a function to handle the error. But for now, I just want to show you how we can just send back an error. But this is not the proper way to do it. The best practice is to have a function and a middleware for handling the error. So for now, we just add this one to GitHub, which is create sign up API route. We can just commit and push. And if you get uh, to go back here, if you go to our database and check the new commits inside the re GitHub repository, you see that the last one is create sign up API route. So that was it for creating the sign up API route. In the next section, we're going to create the mid a middleware for handling the error. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed uh, the sign up API route. In this section, we're going to add a middleware and a function to handle the errors. As you can see, each time we have to create a try and catch a statement and response our error. So it's going to be repetitive in our project if we have too many uh, API routes. So what we can do is to create a middleware firstly inside the index.js. So inside the API folder, we go to index.js and here at the end, we just create the API route, uh, sorry, the middleware. So we just say app.use and this is going to take four things. We're going to have the error re request. Error is the error that is coming from the input of this middleware, which is the error that we sent to the middleware. Request is the data from the uh, browser or client and response, the, it's our response from the server to client side. And also next, we use next to go to the next middleware. And then here, let's uh, open this. So let me uh, fix this one real quick. Okay, so, so what we can get here, we want to create a constant and we call it a status code. And the status code we want to add is the status code that we get from the input of this middleware. So whatever the error that a status code is, we get. Or if there is no status code in the error, we're going to say just use 500, which is the internal server error. And also, we want to make the message as well. We just create another constant for message. And if there is a message, we just say error.message, get it. Otherwise, just say internal server error. So in this case, if there is no status code or there is no message, we don't get an error later because we have an alternative message and a status code. And finally, we're going to return a response with the same status code here, the status code we get and create, and also with some other messages. We can just return the message. What I wanted to do mostly is to add a success, false, error, or we just uh, pass this message. We don't need to do extra things. And also I want to pass the status code. We, uh, we don't need to say a status code equals to a status code. Both is actually correct, but after ES6, if the uh, variable and the key has the same name, we can just remove one of them. And also, we just close this. I think we don't need this parenthesis. Uh, I think we close this. Oh, this is for this one. So we need to close this one. And then this parenthesis here. Okay, now it's okay. So how we use this is uh, middleware. So we just have this middleware. In order to use that, inside the auth.controller.js, instead of just writing this one, we can just get the next here to use the middleware. We just here, we just say next, and then we pass this error that we catch inside the try and catch a statement. So if you try now to get an error, for example, remember I just tried to get an error using the same username and email. I got this error. If I try again, this time we get a more comprehensive 
error which has the success false is the code of 500 and the message is this one so actually this error handling is coming from our middleware and there are some situations that there is no error in the system but we want to throw an error for example the password the person is putting is not long enough so it's not an error but we can just create an error for that so we need to create a function to handle these kind of errors so here inside the api folder we, i'm going to create another folder called utils and then inside this folder i want to create a file called error.js so what we need to do for this error.js to, uh, to create a function so we just export a function called uh, error handler for example and this error handler so this error handler let me write down the name so this is going to take two things we want to have the we want to give this function the status code and the message ourselves so this is going to be a manual a status code and message it's not the real uh, error so we just say a status code and message and once we give it we can just create an error here we can just say create a constant for the error and we use the javascript error constructor to create an error for example we just say new error like this and then we create the message we just say error dot status code for example error dot a status code is equal to this status code which we are getting manually from the input of the function and then also error.message which is going to be the same message we get from the error and also at the end we want to throw the error or we can just return the error okay so now we have created this function and the way we can use it is to go to auth.controller.js and here for example i want to use it here for example imagine that there is no error and we want to create an error so instead of this error i can use that error handler function we need to import it at the top error handler from utils forward slash error.js and we pass the status code and the message i just want to create a different a status code for example 550 and then we just create a message error uh, error uh, from the function so we know that this is the error that we created okay so now if we try to get an error inside insomnia this time okay we, we are getting i think an error here so let's check okay so i think i didn't close the parenthesis here okay that's fine let's try again so this time we get an error but the, with the status code of 550 and the message error from the function so this error is actually is created by us so completely manual error but actually an error happens and the server send an error to the client side so we don't need it actually now i can just uh, revert this one to our previous one because here we actually have the error we don't need to do it but later in our project in some cases we need to handle the error so we're going to use this custom function so all right so that was it for creating a middleware and a function let's add this one to the github so we just have changed it inside uh, created the change inside these three files and the message for this one is going to be create a middleware and a function to handle possible errors and then we can just commit and push to github so let's see what we have done. We can refresh the page here. So here we see the create a middleware and a function to handle possible errors. So what we did first is to create a middleware inside index.js. We have created this middleware. We just said app.use and we got these four inputs for the error request response and next. We have created the status code by getting the status code from this error and if there is no status code we just say use 500 status code for the message we did the same thing but we just said use this message instead and then we have returned this um, status code and the message and also we have added this success false or extra information so we have used this 
middleware by passing the next here and using this next we pass this error so we could handle the error using the middleware and also we have created a custom error handler by creating a function called error handler we gave manually the inputs a status code and message and also we throw an error using uh, the error constructor and also we just set the status code and message and finally we return an error so that was it for creating a middleware and a function to handle errors in the next section we're going to create the ui of the sign up page so see you in the next section All right, in the last section, we have handled the errors using a middleware and a custom function. In this section, we're going to create the UI of the sign up page. If you look at the final version and we go to sign up page here, you can see we just have three inputs and the sign up button. And also here we have have an account sign in. For the Google button, I'm going to create it later when we want to add the OAuth, Google OAuth authentication but for now we just create these three inputs and this button and here and also this title so you, you have to go to your our website and go to forward slash sign up and also i want to make a zoom a little bit so you can see it better so i'll bring it to the right side and also in here our visual studio code i want to bring it to the left side so and then we just need to go to client src pages and sign up.jsx so we have a zoom here i can remove the zoom so you don't you get the same i think it's a big enough so first we first thing we need to do is to create and add an h1 tag saying sign up and then we want to just create a class name for that we want to add some a styling for we just say text tree x large we want to make it bigger and also we want to bring it to the center using text center and what we need to do next is to add a font semi bold to make it a little bit thicker and also we want to add some space to the top and bottom using margin y7 for example so that's it for the h1 tag then we want to add a form so that form we don't need to, uh, action for this form and inside the form we're going to have three inputs the first input is going to be a t with the type of text and with the place holder of saying username like this you can see it here it doesn't have any style yet i just want to give it a border uh, sorry uh, in the class name we need to add a border so a thin border and what we want to do more is to add a padding of three to add a space around it and also i want to make the rounded large so we have a rounded corner so that's it for this one and also we want to add an id for that so we want to know which input is changing when later we want to add some for example handle change and unchange event listener so for him for this one we just say username and that's it for the input the other inputs are very similar so i'm going to copy them copy this uh, input using alt shift done arrow two times and what we want to do is uh, to add the change its name for example this one to email the id is email the type is email as well for this one the type is password the placeholder is password and the id is password as well okay so now they are next to each other first so I can bring them on top of each other by adding a flex to this form and change the flex direction to column. So this one is bringing them on top of each other. So what I want to do next is to add some a space between them. So we just say gap four to add a space between them like this. And then uh, what we want to do later, if you look at the final version, you see that we have a background color here so that's why it's different we can easily add this background color to everything by just going to index.css file inside the here 
inside the src folder index.css we can add a css and add uh, for the body i want to add the background color we just choose a background color like we, i choose an rgb color for the red i choose 241 for the green i choose 245 and this one 241 so this is going to give us a green color and this color is applied in all pages for example in signing page we have the same color and then what we want to do we, we can just close this and then here inside the sign up.jsx i want to add some padding around them but i want to add the, this padding to everything to all the places we have so here inside the, this class name i want to add the padding of three and also i want to make it max with the maximum width of large so in the biggest screen we don't get bigger than um, large but this is in the not this is not in the center in order to bring it to the center we just say mx auto so now it's in the center so that was it for creating the inputs after that we're gonna have the button so after the input i want to add a button saying sign up so let's style this button the style I want to use is just to add a background color, a slate 700. Let's change the text color to be white. And after that, we want to add the padding of three to add some space around it. Let's make it rounded large as well. So we make a rounded corner and uh, we just make it uppercase. So all the letters are uppercase. And what else we need to do is to, for example, add a hover effect. If someone hover over the button, I want to just change its opacity to 95%. So when we hover over it, you see a little bit get uh, lighter. And also, if this is disabled, I want to change its opacity to 80%. I just choose 80. So now it's okay. But if we later add disabled here, we see this is disabled. Okay. So let's remove the disabled for now. So that was it for the button. And also we want to add that text here, have an account sign in. So we can do that one outside the form. So here outside the form, I'm going to add a div. And inside the div, I want to add a paragraph saying have an account with a question mark. And then we want to say just go to the sign in page. But I want to create a link for that. So when we click on it, we go to the sign in page. So I'm going to add this link. But this link, we need to import it at the top. We need to import link from React Router DOM. And then this link is going to uh, forward slash. No, sorry, it's forward slash sign in. And inside the link, we're going to have an span saying sign in. So let's uh, style them. For the sign in, I want to change its back, uh, color to text blue, for example, 700. And I want to bring them next to each other. So I change the direction to the display to flex. And also let's add some uh, space between them by just saying gap two. And finally, I want to add some margin at the top of five to add some space on the top. So that was it for creating our sign up page UI. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So we just say create, uh, com uh, create, or we just say complete, complete sign up page U UI. And we can commit and push it to GitHub. We don't need to review that. It's very simple because it's just a styling. But in the next section, we're going to add functionality to this page. So when we add the username, email, and password as the input, we want to track the changes. Firstly, using an unchanged event listener, and then we want to submit it and add it to the database when we click on sign up button. So see in the next section for completing the sign up page. All right, in the last section, we have completed the sign up page UI. In this section, we're going to add functionality to this page and connect it to the database. So we want to add an unchanged event listener to the inputs. So 
for each of them i want to add an unchanged event listener so after the class name or id i just want to put the dual cursor by keeping the alt so we keep the alt and then choose so we can type simultaneously and then we just add an unchanged event listener which is going to call a function called handle change and we need to create this function here at the top before the return so we're just going to call it handle change and also this one is going to take an event so we want to track the changes and this one let me close this so we don't get an error so we want to save the values of that so what we need to do is to create a piece of a state to keep track of the all the changes and i'm going to call that one form data so form data and we want to keep it an empty object from the beginning so this is going to be a an object and also we want to change this object using this function set form data and we need to import user state so i'm going to use control space to get the suggestion and import it at the top so what we want to do here is to set this form data like this this set form data we want to change the form data what we want to do is to we want to keep the previous information so whatever for example we have written username we want to keep the information and then add the email so we don't want to lose track of that so we want to keep it by a spread using the spread operator and keep the form data whatever it is here and then we want to add the new changes because if we have the id here username email and password we can decide we can understand which one is changing so we just say e.target.id so whatever is changing set that one to its value so we set it like that so now if we just console log form data and we open the console we just inspect here open this one and then go to the console we can see first let me clear this if you change for example username i just say sahand so you can see the username is sahand now and then once we write down the email we're going to keep the username because we a spread operator we use the spread operator for form data so here i just say sahand as you can see the email is there email gmail.com for example and uh, we can just write down the password to here so we keep we have all the information here uh, storing in this piece of state called form data so after that we want to submit this one submit the form so what we do is to add a form add an unsubmit un event listener inside the form which is going to call a function called um submit and we can create the function here too so we just want to put it here we create this function handle submit which is getting the event and also we want to use the e that e prevent default to prevent refreshing the page when we submit the form so here when we click on submit as you can see we don't see the changes here we, there is no refresh but if we don't have this one when we click on submit this is going to refresh the page so in react we want to prevent refreshing the page so we first we do this one we're gonna uh, keep uh, the, we, do, we don't want to refresh the page and then we want to submit the form what we do is to use the fetch method to request for our api route so if you remember our api route address is localhost 3000 forward slash api forward slash off forward slash sign up but uh, we don't want to add this uh, address all the time so for example if i want to do the fetch for example create get the response and then we just await for the fetch we don't want to write down http localhost 3000 each time i just want to write down forward slash api forward slash auth forward slash sign up okay so in this case we we, we are requesting actually to localhost 5000 uh, if you remember our uh, client side is in 5173 port number so how we fix that one we need to actually create a proxy so each time we don't write down here anything we're gonna request for the uh, 3000 instead so let me close this so we don't get an error 
and uh, we need to pass the form data here. And as we are using await, we need to change this function to asynchronous. So now we, we shouldn't get an error, but let's create the proxy so we can uh, request to the correct address. So we can just go to Explorer section and we go to vit.config.js. Here, inside the defined config, I want to add the server. This server is going to have a proxy and the proxy, we just say each time you have a request to forward slash API, you just go to add this one at the beginning, lo HTTP localhost 3000. And then, or we can just be more specific because this is not the secure. We can just uh, say, we want to add this one as a target. We just say target is equal to HTTP, this one. And also we want to say, set the secure to false. And then we want to close this. Also close that one and uh, this. One. So we have created a server and a proxy. We just say each time the address starts and includes the forward slash API, like the one we are doing for the sign up. It has the forward slash API. Each time you see forward slash API, add the localhost 3000 at the beginning. So this is going to request to the co correct place. So once we do this uh, fetch request, we want to get the response. Also, we, what we want to do is to, we don't want to just send the form data. We want to stringify it. We want to just uh, change it to a string because otherwise it's not secure to do that. So what we want to do here, first thing first, I want to change the method. So I want to add an object here. We just say po method is post and we want to add a header with saying content type JSON because it's a JSON type. And also we want to send the body by stringifying the form data. So we say, we just say send from the body of the browser and send this information, form data, and stringify it as well. So this is a correct way to do the request. And then what we want to do next is to change and convert the, the response we get to JSON. So we can use it and see it here. So let's console log. Now, console log data, we see what we get. So let's uh, just create another, we just say user one, user one at g.com. Anything is fine. We just write down a password. And once we click on sign up, we should get this data. As you can see, we got this user created successfully. If you remember, we have a response with just a message user created successfully. So that was successful. And if we check down our database, uh, let me sign in in the MongoDB. So inside the MongoDB, we should see inside the database and we go to the browse the collection, we should see the new uh, user one, user one and uh, user one at g.com. And this is the hash password. So Everything's working nice from the client side. So what we want to do is to handle the error. And also we want to handle the loading effect because when it's uh, loading, we want to disable this button. And also uh, we want to show some loading effect. For example, we changed its text. So what we need to do is to add two more piece of states. One for the error, we set it to be, uh, null at the beginning and then we're gonna have another one for the loading we set it to be false so what we do before request here before this request i want to set the loading to true and after the request is finished we want to test if the data we are getting has an error or the success is false if you remember inside the off.controller i'm sorry inside the index.js here in the backend. In the backend we have, uh, let me find it, index.js. We just say, if there is an error, set the success to false. So we can use that one. We just say, if data dot success is false, we want to set the error to the message we get from that. And also we want to set the loading to false. And then we want to return. Otherwise we want to set the loading to false here 
because the loading is completed. So, and then what we want to do is to add another paragraph here to handle the error and also for the loading. For the loading, for example, in the button, I want to add the disable. So each time we have loading true, we want to make it disable. And also we want to change its text when we have a loading. We want to say loading, otherwise we want to say sign up. So if the loading is true, we just say loading, otherwise we just say sign up. So each time we click, we see loading, and then we see now error happens because uh, we didn't put any input. But once the error happens, we want to set the loading to false. We set the loading to false here as well. Let's refresh and test again. Okay. Now, after the error happens, we want to set the loading to false. So let me, let me bring this one up here. Okay, I think this one is not working. Let's uh, see what we get inside the data at here before the error. So we have form data. Let's remove this form data. Okay, let's see what we can do to fix this one. So this is the error that actually is not defined from the backend. What we can do is to, to, to put a try and catch a statement here too to get the possible error happens in the front end. So we just add the try and catch a statement. We set everything to the uh, try. And inside the cache, also we want to set the loading to false and set the error to this error.message. So let's try again. Now I see now we are handling the error here too. So we don't see the error. And then once we, what we want to do is to show the error as a message at the bottom here so here at the bottom uh, we just write down if there is an error we just create a paragraph showing the error so let's see okay now we see that uh, we get the error here so let's try to get a different error for example i have already created the user one let's create the same name we just say at gmail whatever it is but uh, we have the same username. So if I click, uh, let's see what's. So let me copy this. So let's create first this one. Oh, we are getting an error here for no reason. We just check the the backend is not working. Okay, not one crashed. Let me increase the size here. You can see it better. So not one decrypted JS. Yeah. Actually, there is no error here. So that was for the previous error. Let's try again to create. So I want to create with the same username. So if you just click on sign up, you can see we get an error duplicate key. And the, the, the key we are using this one is here. And also, if we change the username, for example, user2 and sign up, now the, e uh, the email is a duplicate key. So we need to change the email. And once we do that, actually the, it's working and we sign up the new user. Let me check. So the last one is user two. It's working, but we want to clear the error if everything is fine. So if everything is all right, so after uh, there is no error or something like that, here also we want to set the error to null if everything is fine. So let's test again. So it just use, for example, user three. If you do sign up, we see the error is gone. And instead of the error, I want to just show them user is created successfully, or I want to bring them to the signing page. I want to navigate them to the signing page. So what we can do is to actually create, a, let's delete this one first. We want to use the, from the React router DOM, we want to use a package so uh, we want to use something called navig use navigate. So I want to import that one too. Use navigate and use navigate. We want to in uh, initialize it here. We just say const navigate equals to use navigate. And if everything is all right here and the error is clear, we want to just navigate to the sign in page like this. So let's try again. So we are in the sign up page. We just want to, for example, 
use another user for example user two uh, sorry user three we already created user two and if you click on sign up and if uh, we, we have already used this one user three so user four and everything is good now we went to the sign in page actually and so everything is done for this part so that was it for creating and adding functionality to the sign up page let's add this one to github i just want to just add these two files and we just create a message we just say complete sign up page functionality and we can just commit and push to github and if you check it inside the github and refresh the page so as you can see the most important part is uh, to add the proxy inside the vit.config.js like this and also we we just have added the unchanged event listener we handle the change here at the top by just uh, keeping it inside a state called form data and then we have submitted inside a try and catch a statement and first we just uh, get the response by fetching the data to this url and then if, if there is an error we set the error if there is no error we're gonna stop the loading effect and navigate to the signing page so that was it for this part in the next section we're gonna create the sign in api route so we want to just sign in the user and authenticate them so see you in the next section All right, in the last section, we have completed the sign up page functionality. In this section, we're going to firstly cre cre create the sign in API route, and then we're gonna complete its page. So, for creating the API route, if you remember in the sign up section, inside the API and inside the route and auth.route.js, we have created the uh, router.post for sign up. So we want to do the same things for sign in. So first thing first, we need to create the function for that inside the auth.controller.js. So here I want to create a function called sign up, sign in. And this is actually the same, like a asynchronous and it has request response and next because we want to use the middleware here. So I want to accept them. So we have these things and also uh, let's close this one so we don't get an error. And then what we want to do here is to get the data from the uh, request.body. So what we want to get is email and password. So we just say const email and password. And uh, we want to authenticate the user using their email and password. You can do it with the username and password as well. It doesn't matter. So you can do it the same way. And also we want to add a try and catch a statement. And here we want to catch the error using the middleware that we have created inside the index.js file, this middleware. So we're going to handle the error here. And uh, what we want to do with this email and password is firstly, we want to check if this email is existed or not. We want to check that is there is email like this. If the email is correct, then we want to check the password. So first we want to check the email. So here I want to just say valid user to check the email. The way we, we check the email inside the mongoose is to use a method called find one. And we need to add a wait here because we need, it takes time to check the email inside the database. And we want to use a method called find one. And in, we want to use our model that we have created here user.model.js which is exporting this user so you want to use that model and then we just search inside that inside the user cluster by using find one and the thing we want to search is the email so we want to search for this email we we we, we can say the email equals equal uh, email but actually because both key and the value has the same name, we can delete one of them after ex, ES6. So after checking the email, we need to see if the email is not correct. So if the e email, it doesn't return an email, so it's uh, false. We want to return something. We want to return an error. 
But how will it return an error? Because we have created the custom error utils that is error.js, we can handle the error here. So we use this middleware we have created next, and then we're gonna pass that error that we have created with the name error handler. So we just say error handler, and then we need to import it at the top here from the utils forward slash error.js. And then what we wanna add is 404, and we just say user not found. So first we check the email. If the email does not exist, we wanna just uh, return an error. Otherwise, we want to check the password. So the way that we do it, because the password here we are getting from the body is just a normal password, password, and the password inside the main, uh, database is a hashed password. So we need to compare it with bcrypt.js method, one of the bcrypt.js methods called compare sync. So we just say valid password. We use the bcrypt.js package and we use its method called compare sync. And we compare this password that we get from here with the one inside the database, which is coming from this uh, user that we get, the valid user dot password. And also we want to say if the password is not correct, we want to return an error using our middleware and also the error handler. And we just we can just say 401 wrong credentials or invalid password. It's, it's better don't say invalid password because the people are going to be sure that they have the password incorrect. So they're going to check it a few times. So they are sure about their email. So what we do is we just say wrong credential. So they don't know that the wrong one is email or password. Okay, wrong credential. I think should write down credential. Uh, this is correct. Wrong credentials. Here too, we can just say wrong credentials too. But for simplicity, I'll just leave it like that because we want to test what is wrong with the input and password and return the error as we wish. So if we are sure that both the email and password is correct, we need to authenticate the user. The way we do the authentication is to add a cookie inside the browser. And we need to create a hash token that includes the email of the user or the ID of the user. And then we save this token inside the browser uh, cookie. So each time you want to do the user want to do something, for example, change its uh, email password or something uh, crucial. So we need to check they are authenticated or not. We can use that cookie to do that. But we're not going to save the data as it is. We're going to hash that data as well. So the best package for doing that is JWT or JSON Web Token. And we can use this package to create the token. We create that hashed value of the users. So inside the backend, uh, make sure you are in the root directory. Let me clear this. So you have to be in the root directory and then you just install this package. JSON Web Token all together. So once you install it, you can just import it at the top like this. We just say import JWT from JSON Web Token. So once you do that, we can just create the token here. So here we just create a token. We just say const token. And then we use the method from JWT, which is sign. And we want to add some information that is unique for the user. It can be email, username, or ID. But as the ID, uh, ID is the best practice for doing that because uh, by checking the ID, if someone can uh, find the ID, they don't know exactly the information of the person, like the email or password. So it's better. This is the ID that is automatically saved inside the MongoDB. So if you check the MongoDB and you can see each of the users has an ID and the variable is underline ID and it's completely unique for everyone. So based on this ID, we can later authenticate the user. And this is unique for our database. So if this user signing in another website, get different ID. So this ID is completely unique for that person. So uh, let me come back here. So we want to use that uh, ID. So we just say ID equals to this valid user that we get that underline ID. And also we want to add some secret key. And this secret key is unique for our application. 
it can be any random number or, or letters. And this is going to make our token completely unique for our application. So it is, this is similar to the salt in creating the password. So this is going to be mixed with the ID of the user. And uh, the, this ID is going to be completely uh, hashed and based on our secret key, not someone else. So this is completely and makes our application secure. But we, wanna, we don't want to share this secret key with others. So we want to save it inside an environmental variable so we can just uh, use it later for uh, we, when we are uploading our application to GitHub. Nobody can see that. So we just say process.env, the JWT underline secret. I'm going to add this one to the environmental variable here. So here I just say JWT underline secret. And this is going to be equal to anything. It can be anything like a, a random letter or number. So you can just choose something like that. But later you have to add this one to your uh, when you deploy it, you need to add it to the platform you are deploying your application, like Versal or a Render. Okay, so it can be anything random, but it's you have to remember this, and also you need to upload it as an environmental variable to your server. So we have this uh, token now. After creating the token, we want to save this token as the cookie. So the way we do that is to do use dot. Uh, res.cookie we pass the, the name for that it can be anything token or access token I would like to call it access token and then access underline token and then we're going to pass this token here so we just save this token inside the cookie and then we want to add other information for example we just want to add some options here like HTTP only true which means no other third party application can have access to our cookie. So this is going to make our cookie safer. And then we want to add some max uh, expiry date for that. We can just say expires. And then we can just say, we can just create a time from now. Uh, as you can see, new date, which is today, plus some time in the future. So for this is based on second so this is a uh, one minute this is one hour when you collect uh, connect it and this is 24 hours so this is thousand days it should be like that so we can do that but uh, if you don't want to do like a uh, limit your cookie we can just get rid of this and make it just like that so this is going to be a session so now we have the cookie inside the browser so, and also we want to re return some other things like a status 200. And also we want to return uh, this uh, valid user. So we just say valid user. So let's test this one inside Insomnia. So we go to Insomnia and we already have created the sign up. We can just duplicate this one to save time. And we just change its name to sign in. And we don't need the username for that. We can just delete it. And uh, what we want to do, is we need to just change its address to sign in. And also we need to add this uh, function to the user, sorry, auth.route.js here. So we're going to duplicate this one too, change this one to sign in. And we want to import that sign in function too at the top. Uh, I think that's enough. We, this is going to work. Let's check that it's index.js. So here we have the authentication. Then we have here the sign in. So this is going to call this function, which is sign in. So here we just say forward slash API, forward slash auth, forward slash sign in. This is a post method and we're going to pass the email and password. So let's try this. If you click on send, we can see we got the user and the, with the response 200 because the email and password was correct. And then we have a cookie inside the uh, we have a cookie with the name access token which includes the user id but it is hashed so we don't know what it what this is because it's created using the jwc secret key so we don't know what it is so nobody can understand it but 
we can use later this one by decoding this one and get the user ID. But the problem here is we got the password of the person back. We don't want to see the password of the user, even if it is hashed. We don't want to send it to the user. It is not uh, okay and it's, it's not the best practice. So we need to remove this password before sending back the user. So here, when we are sending back the valid user, we want to remove the password first. So what we do here, we can just destructure the password and the rest. We can do it here. We can just say uh, we want to destructure the password and the other user information. But as we are using the password here at the top as a constant, we, can yet, we cannot use the password, the name as password. We can just change it and change its name to pass, for example. And then we get the rest. So we separate the password and the rest of the information. So we can just call this one rest, for example. And then we, this is going to be equal to valid user. But if we do it like valid user, let me show you the error first. And then here we need to just say rest. So we don't want to return the valid user. We want to return this rest. All the things except the password. So if you try now again, as you can see, we are still getting this password. Because we don't, we, we, we should destructure this one, underline doc, instead of the valid user. So we need to just add this underline doc at the end. So if you try again, this time, we just got the username, email, and we didn't get the password. So, and also we got the cookie. So the problem is solved. So we, we are not worried about the password to be leaked to the user. So that was it for creating the sign-in API route. Let's add this one to the GitHub repository. So we add everything and then we create a message called create sign-in API route. And we can just commit and push to GitHub. What we want to do here, we want to go to our repository. We refresh the page. Now we see the last commit is create sign-in API route. and I just want to explain you again. So inside the off.route.js, we have created a new router with the post method, which is going to uh, be for sign in and which is going to call this sign in function, which we are going to create inside the off.controller.js. Here, first thing first, we destructure the email and password, and then we, we test the email first. We just say if the email exists, get the email otherwise if the email is not available just return an error with the status code of 404 and with the message user not found and if the valid user exists we want to check the password if the password is correct uh, we want to return true otherwise we want to return false and then the way we do that is to use the bcrypt.js package and its method called compare sync and if the password is not valid, we're going to return an error with the, with this one, with the, with the status code of 401 and the message run credentials. And if everything is all right, we're going to sign a token using JWT package, which we need to install. And then we're going to pass something unique about the user, which is a, an ID. And also we pass the JWT secret key here. And based on this token, we're going to save this token inside the cookie using res.cookie. We just say access token for the name of the cookie. We pass the token and also we set this option to make our cookie safer. And we're going to return the rest, it, which means that we're going to separate the password and the rest of the information from the valid user. And then we're going to return the rest. And also we have used the try and catch a statement to catch the error and send the error to the user using our middleware. All right, that was it for creating the sign-in API route. In the next section, we're going to complete the sign-in page functionality. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the sign-in API route. In this section, we're going to work on the functionality and create the UI and connect it to the database. And we're going to have interactivity between the front end and the back end. 
The page is very similar actually to the sign up page. So we can get help from the, our previously built sign up page. So let me bring this one to the right side and we have our Visual Studio code on the left side. We can just go to the client section. We go to uh, sign up page and we can just copy everything and we come back to the sign in page and we paste all of them. So once we do that and we refresh the page, we see the sign up page in the sign in URL. We can modify this one real quick. So let me close this one and then just cha change the function name to sign in. And then we're going to have this fetching instead of sign up. We just have to fetch from sign in. What else we need to do? We need to navigate to the home page when the sign in is completed. Okay. And then the title is going to be sign in. You should see the change here. We don't need the username. We can just delete this input, the first input. We just have the email and password. The button is going to say sign in instead of sign up. And then we just say, instead of saying have an account, we just say don't have an account. And don't forget, uh, don't do add the apostrophe here because it's going to make problem in the production here. We just uh, say don't have an account without apostrophe. And here this text is going to be sign up. And then this is going to redirect the person to the sign up page. I think everything is fine now. We should try now. Let's create an account. I just create an account with this email. For example, user3 at gmail.com. Let's use the same email for the username and password and sign up the user. So now we are redirected to the sign in page. We can just test this one. If it works, it's going to be redirected to the home page. And then what we need to see is the cookie inside our browser. We need to go to the application. And here inside the cookie, we can see we have a cookie with the name access token, which is a session. And then uh, with the domain localhost, the value is this one, which is which includes the ID of the user. And if you re refresh the page, we still see this cookie here. All right, so everything is working perfectly. Let's try to get an error. For example, I just changed this email to 33. Let's click on logging. We get an error, user not found. So let's uh, test it with the wrong password. You can see we get the wrong credentials. So everything is working as we expected. So that was it for creating, actually completing the sign-in page functionality as we have copied everything from the sign-up page. Everything was very easy and simple. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So we just add this and then we create a message, complete sign in page functionality and we can commit and push. So in the next section, we're going to work on adding the Redux toolkit. So we want to, uh, when we sign in and we have the user back, so as you can see from the ins inspect, when we put the correct email and password and we go to the network and if you click on sign in, as you can see, we get a response with the user ID, username, email. So we want to keep this information and use it in places like the header, the profile page, and different ways. So instead of using a local state, we're going to have a global state using Redux Toolkit. So in this way, we can have access to this user information everywhere, like the one in the final version. The final version, when you sign in, we see the user in the profile, the information of the user in the profile, and also uh, in the in the header and the profile together. So in, in instead of passing the data in different components and pages, we're gonna save this information in the Redux using Redux toolkit. So see in the next section for adding Redux toolkit to our application. All right, in the last section, we have completed the signing page of our application. 
In this section, we're going to add the Redux toolkit so we can have access to the user data in different places in our application. So let's uh, go to Google and search for Redux toolkit. And in the search results, you need to go to redux-toolkit.js.org. And in this website, you can just click on get started and we go to quick start. If you scroll down a little bit, you can see in order to use this one, we need to install two packages, redux.js forward slash toolkit and re react redux. So let's copy this one and we go back to Visual Studio Code. And in, we need to install it in the client side, not in the backend. So we need to just, uh, let me clear this terminal. And I want to go inside the client side. And then I want to paste this code that I have copied. And after the installation, we need to create the store. So we need to create a file called store.js and add this configuration to the application. So inside our application, in the SRC folder, I'm going to create another folder called Redux. And then inside this folder, I'm going to create a file called store.js. And here, we're going to just create the store. I'm going to copy this one and paste it here, which is going to configure a store, which we don't have a reducer yet. We need to create the reducer. And what else <clears throat> I want to add is to get the serializable check false. So we need to add this one. Otherwise, we're going to get an error later. So I'm going to add a middleware here. So this middleware, so let me press tab to accept this. So we get a middleware like this and get us give us the default middleware. And then we're going to set the serial, serializable check to false. In this way, we're not going to get an error for not serializing our uh, variables here. So just be sure to add this one to prevent any error in your browser. After creating the store, the next step is to provide the Redux store to React. What we need to do is to cover our application with the store using a provider here. So what we need to do is to go to main.jsx and here we need to import two things to be able to add this one to our application. So the first one is the store that we have created, which is coming from forward slash, uh, it's, it's inside the Redux folder, and then we have a store.js. So we have to go inside the folder because the main.jsx is inside the SRC, and then we want to go inside this Redux folder and then store.js. So we have the store, and also we want to add the provider. So we're going to add the import the provider from Redux Toolkit, uh, React Redux. And then we want to cover everything. We just need, we can just delete this React strict mode, and then we just add the provider, and then we pass the store. And we just say store equals to store. So that was the next step. The next one is to create the Redux state slice, which in our case is user slice. In the example provided by the website, they create a slice for a counter, but we want to create that for the user. So we need to create, uh, inside the Redux folder, we're going to create another folder called user. And then here we're going to create the user slice.js. And here, we're going to import create a slice method from a Redux JS forward slash toolkit. And using this one, the first step is actually to create an initial state for us because we want to have the initial state like loading false and error false. And then after that, we want to add uh, everything else. If you remember, for example, in sign in.jsx, we have two things like error and loading. And the error at the beginning was null and loading was false. So here is similar. So we need to create the initial state. We just create a constant called initial state. And first we set the current user null. And then when the sign in is successful, we want to set that one to the user that we get from the database. So set the current user to null, error to null, and loading to false. This is the initial state. Then using this one, we can create the 
user slice. We just say const user slice equal to create a slice. The first step is to set a name for that. We just set this name to user and then we pass the initial state. After that, we're going to create the functions, which here we call reducers. The first function we want to create is sign in success or sign in a start. Sorry, sign in a start. We get the state here and we set the loading to true. So that's the first state. A state that loading is true. Similar to the one we did here in the signing page. Here, before, a start is here. Set the loading to true. And then we fetch the data. After the fetching the data, we're going to set the loading to false. And uh, we want to set the uh, navigate the user and also to get the data here. So we're doing the same things, but we want to make this one global. The status is global, not uh, local. After that, we're going to have signing success. This one is going to give us two things, like a state and action. Action is the data we get from the date when we receive the data from the database. We want to, uh, we get that data, we set, set it to here, and here we just say, uh, first we just say a state that current user to action.payload. So this is the data we get. And also we set the loading to false and also set the error to null because maybe we had an error for the previous attempt. So this time we want to set the error to null. After that, we're going to have the signing failure. So signing failure, we get a start, a state action. We set the error to pay action that payload and also we state that loading to false. So these are our reducers. Okay. And then what we want to do is to export these uh, functions as the action. And also we want to export this user reducer. So here we're going to export a constant and we're going to export the signing a start, signing success, signing failure. And this is coming from user slice.actions. So we can use this function in other places like signing.jsx. And then also we want to export the user uh, reducer as a default, and then we can get it from this user slice.reducer. So now we have added this one, the user slice. In the next step, when we create this slice, we want to add this a slice to our store. Remember, our store was empty. Now we want to add it to there. So we need to go to store.js, and here the, inside the reducer, we want to add the that reducer. We, just, we can just say user equals to user reducer and we need to import it at the top. So we need to import it from this URL for slash user for slash user slice. And here, if you remember, we export it as a default so we can change its name here to user reducer. So uh, what else we need to do in the next step? So now everything is finished so we can use the these things, for example, we can use the, we can dispatch these functions that we have. So we want to use it inside this signing.jsx. So inside the signing.jsx, first we need to import these uh, use dispatch from React Redux because of using this hook, we can dispatch the function that we have. So here I'm going to initialize it first. We just say const dispatch, use dispatch. And also we need to import all the functions that we have created which includes, if you remember here, we have created signing a star, signing success and failure. So I'm going to copy one of them, put it here. And this is coming from the Redux user. Uh, let me correctly put that one. So what we want to add here is to, first thing first, we want to import it from the correct position, which is Redux forward slash user forward slash user slice. And also we need to import sign in success and sign in failure. So here, instead of setting the loading to true in the first step, we can just dispatch sign in a stop. And also uh, we can just, uh, when an error happened, instead of setting the error to this one and loading, we don't need to do both of them. We can just, just dispatch sign in failure and we pass this data, the message, which is data.message. And here at the end, instead of setting both of the loading and error, we can just dispatch success and pass the 
data that we have. And uh, what else we need to do is to here, when there is an error, we can just dispatch sign in failure and we pass this error dot message. So everything is okay here. And instead of uh, having two hooks here, error and uh, loading, we can import the error and loading. We just create a constant called loading and uh, we just destructure the loading and error. And using use selector hook, we can import these two. And this is coming from the our global state and the state name was user. If you remember inside the user slice, the name was user here. And also we need to import use selector from React Redux. So I think everything is ready to be tested. So inside the signing page, in order to test it, we can you can install a Chrome extension called a Redux Dev Tool. I don't know if I have it or not. Uh, you have it here. And if you inspect, you just go to Redux and uh, you can just bring this one to the right side. Let me bring it out. Just, uh, okay. So we bring it to the right side so we can see the changes. So I'm gonna just uh, sign it firstly correctly. If you remember, we had the email user3 at gmail.com. That's a correct username. And uh, we had the same password. And if everything is okay, we're gonna re be redirected and we wanna see this one. The first thing first, the user, the initial state was null, error is null, and also loading is false. And if you click on signing, you can see now we had the signing start first and then signing success. And when the signing success happened, the current user is the, the user that we have, like the, with the email and username, error is null and loading is false, okay? And also we can use this one anywhere else in our application, anywhere in uh, like a header and everything else. So let's uh, try to get an error. For example, I create a wrong email, like 33. So we got the message user not found. And here the current user is still the current user is the previous user because we don't want to lose the previous one. And the, uh, we have an error. We have an error user not found and loading is false. So it, everything is working. Let's add a wrong password. So you see the changes here because you can see even the changes. Uh, you can have the reply of your changes here. So here we were this part, the loading, loading was false. The loading became true and then the error became wrong credentials. And if you do it with the correct password, we can see that the error became null and loading is false. And also the current user is here as well. So that was it for creating the, adding the Redux toolkit in our application. Let's add this one to the GitHub first. So I'm gonna add everything and then create a message called add Redux toolkit. And we can commit and push. So in the, in the next section, actually we wanna fix a problem here. Uh, I'm gonna show you what's the problem here. So now the current user is this one, but if I refresh the page, we can see that the current user is null. So actually this is just uh, once uh, like a uh, before refreshing is working. But if you refresh the page, you're gonna lose the data. We don't wanna be like that because each time the user refresh the page, they need to sign in again. So that's a bit annoying and so in order to fix that, we, we need to uh, store this data in places like a uh, local storage of the browser. So we don't need it to do it ourselves. There is a package called uh, Redux Persist that which is going to help us to be able to add this information in the local storage. So in the next section, we're going to work on adding the Redux Persist to our application. So see you in the next. All right, in the last section, we have completed adding Redux Toolkit into our application. In this section, we're going to work on adding Redux Persist, which helps us to store the user data inside the local storage. So what we need to do is to add, firstly, the Redux Persist by installing it. We just say npm install Redux 
dash persist. And once you install it, you need to go to, let me show you, let me close this one. So we need to go to a store.js and here, instead of having the user reducer, we're gonna combine the reducers first and then we're gonna persist this reducer using persist reducer function. So here, I wanna create the combine reducer or we can call it root reducer. So root, root re reducer is going to be equal to combine reducer method, which is coming from the Redux JS4 slash toolkit, as you can see from the top. And then here, we're gonna add the reducers we have. But for now, we just have the user reducer. But later, if you wanna add more reducers, you can add it here as well. We just say user reducer. Once we have the root reducer, we can just create the persisted reducer. We just say persisted reducer equals to the persist reducer method, which is coming. We need to import it actually. We need to import persist reducer from Redux persist. And then here we need to add two things. First is the persist gate. We need to import persist gate as well. Uh, Actually, we need to create it. We don't need to import it. So we just say persist gate or sorry, persist config. That is for next section. So persist config, and then we're going to pass this root reducer. But we need to create this persist config. So persist config is setting the name of the key in the local storage, the version, and the store, the storage. So we're going to have a key. For example, we can name the key root. We're going to pass the storage, and also we want to set the version for example, to one. And we can just close this. And a storage is coming from the, we need to import a storage as well, which is coming from Redux persist for slash lib for slash a storage. So now that we have created this persistent reducer, we can, instead of just passing here the user reducer, we can just delete this and add the persistent reducer. So what we did here, we just add the persistent reducer, and also we need to export something called persistor. So we need to export a constant called persistor, and this persistor is going to make the store persist. So, and then we need to import the store persist a store as well, which is coming from Redux persist, and we need to import it at the top. So we have exported the persistor, and also where we have created, we have added the persistent reducer to the store. Now we need to go to main.jsx and we wrap everything with the, this persistor. So the way we do that is to, we can just come here and then we just say persist gate. We need to cover it with persist gate, which is coming from Redux persist for slash integration for slash react. And we need to pass loading null and persistor where which has which we have created here persistor so we need to import this persistor from forward slash redux forward slash store.js and once we do that we can just close this persist gate so now it's time to test our application with the persisted uh, reducer and also with the redux persist so now we have if you refresh now our page, you can see the user is, the current user is still available because it's stored in the storage. So let me uh, delete this one. And, and I want to show you where is, it is located. So uh, this is, if you go to application and you go to local storage and go to our URL, you can see we have a key of root we, we, uh, as we defined here in the store, the key of root. And also we have all the information of the current user inside the local storage. And if we delete this one, for example, and now we go to Redux Toolkit, and we refresh the page, we can see the, the user became null. So the storage actually was helping us to keep the current user. Let me sign in again uh, at gmail.com and with the same password, I'm gonna copy this. So once we sign in, we can see that the current user is available here. And if you refresh the page, we can see that the user is still there. And we go to the application, we can see the user is saved inside the local storage. 
and you can see the information here. And this is not actually a crucial information. And in, 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 because we are not storing any password or anything like that, and this is related to the current user. So it's not the someone else information. All right, that was it for adding the Redux process. Let's add this one to the GitHub repository here. We can just say add Redux process and we can commit and push. So that was it for creating this part. In the next section, we're gonna add, so if you sign out here, let me refresh the, this page. We want to add this continue with Google button in both the sign in and sign up pages. And we, we want to be able to continue with Google. We want to see this pop up window and choose one of our Gmail account to be signed in. And we get the information as well, including the image of the user. So see in the next section for adding the OAuth component. All right, in the last section, we have added the Redux process in our application. In this section, we're going to add the Google OAuth functionality. If you look at the final version, you can see inside the sign in and sign up page, we have a button called continue with Google. And if we click on it, this is going to pop up a window, which is going to ask us to choose one of our Gmail accounts. For example, if I choose this one, we can see that we are redirected to the home page, and also inside the header, we have an avatar of that user. We get the image and other things from the Google account, and also you can see the data from the user here. So we wanna add this button first. So let me bring this one to the right side, and here we bring this one to the left side to see the everything in real time. What we wanna do is inside the components, I want to create another component called OAuth.jsx. And then here we can use RFC to create a React functional component. And we want to add this one to both sign in and sign up pages. So I could click on signing. So where uh, the place I want to add this button is after this uh, sign in button. So I want to add the OAuth here. So we just say OAuth. We can auto import it by clicking on this and then we can just close it. So once we do that, we can see the OAuth inside the sign in page. We can do the same thing for the sign up page. So we go to sign up page and after the button, I want to add this OAuth. I'm going to import it as well. So if you test the sign up page as well, we can see the OAuth here. So now we can focus on the OAuth.jsx component. So what we need to do here is to change this step to a button. Once we do the button, the OAuth is going to be in the center. And let's add some style to it. For example, I want to change the background color to red and then 700. We can just change the text to white. We can add a padding to it, padding three, and we can make it rounded in the corner. We just say rounded large, and we can just make it uppercase. So on the text, I want to change the text to continue with Google. And also, when we hover over it, I want to change its opacity to 95%, like this. So that's it for the styling. And also, when we, sub uh, when we click on this button, this is going to submit this form as well, because it is inside the form. If you look at the sign in the JSX, the this component is inside the form. So in order to prevent the submission, we can just change the type of this button to submit. And sorry, it's, it is submit by default. We want to change it to button. So when you change the button, this is not going to submit the form. And after that, we're going to have an onclick event listener, which is going to call a function called handle Google click. So let's create this function at the top. So we're going to create a function called handle Google click, which is in synchronous because we need to wait for the Google to respond to us. We need to use a synchronous function and then we use a try and catch a statement. Let's close this one first so we don't get an error. For the error, uh, I don't want to show any error to the user for the Google authentication. I just console log it. Uh, we can just console log could not 
sign in with Google, and then we can pass this error here. So we have handled the try and catch statement. Now the, the next step is to connect uh, our, we need to go to the Google console and create our Google authentication account. So we need to go to Google and search for Firebase Google. And in the search result, we can click on firebase.google.com. So here, uh, it's free to create an account. And if you have an account, this is going to open it here. So I'm going to choose the Gmail account that my Firebase is associated with. So make sure you're connected to the proper Gmail account. And after that, click on Go to Console. Here you can click on Add Project and make a name for your project. For example, I just call it Mern Estate. And you can click on Continue. You need to remove the uh, Google Analytics. You can add it later to your project. And then here we click on Create Project. So as you can see, the, our project is ready. And then we can click here on Continue. So once you are inside this page, you can just click on Web because you want to create a web application. So you click on Web and create a nickname for your project. I just can call it the same one, Marin Estate. And you just click here on Register App. So after that, we need to install Firebase and add this SDK to our project. So we can just go to our project. Let me open this. So you need to install it in the client side. And then you just say npm install Firebase. So once you do that, you can just come back here and just copy this code, your API key and etc. And then you just need to paste it in a file inside the SRC folder. You can create a file called firebase.js and you can paste the code here. So you have the code here. This is just uh, initializing your app, passing your API key and also exporting uh, creating an app by initializing this application. We just need to export this constant to be, to be able to use it in other places in our application. And also we need to hide this API key. So to make our application more secure, if you want to share it with others in public places like GitHub, you need to do it. But uh, we have an environmental variable outside in, in the root directory. For the client side, you need to make it inside the client side, another file. So here we create another file called .env inside the client folder. And then here we just, because we are using vite, you, not, you need to write down vite at the beginning and then underline, and then you just say fire base, underline, for example, API, underline key. And then you just go to firebase.js, and then you can just cut this using co command X and then we paste it here. So the way we use it inside the read is to just say import. Uh, we just need to say import dot meta dot env dot read and then the name of our variable which we have created here. Read underline Firebase underline API key. And then we just add the comma here. So now we are ready to use our application. So we go back to the here and then we just click on continue to console. Once you're here, you just need to click on this authentication or here inside the build, you can click on authentication. And you can just click here to get started with authentication. And then here you can just choose the provider you need. In our case, we need to use Google. So we click on Google, we click on enable. And then here we just choose a name for our uh, project. I just call it a state app. You can just choose your Gmail account here and then click on save. So once you do that and this is ready, as you can see, it is enabled. You can use Google authentication in your project. So we can go back to OAuth.jsx and here inside the try, we can just create a constant. First, we create the provider. We just say provider new, and then we just say Google, uh, Google of provider. 
we need to call this and also we need to import it at the top. So we just say import Google Auth provider from Firebase forward slash auth. So after getting the Google Auth provider, here we need to get the auth as well. So we just say const auth equals to get auth. And get auth is actually, we need to import it too, which is coming from Firebase forward slash auth as well. And we need to pass the app here. If you remember now, uh, inside the firebase.js, we have exported here the application that includes all the information we, uh, for our Firebase config. So we need to pass this one here. So the Firebase is going to recognize which application is creating the request. So we just say app, and then we're gonna import it here at the top. So once we have both of the provider and off, we're gonna create the, a pop-up request. We need to create the sign up with pop-up. So this one is going to give us the result from Google. And as you can see, we, we need to uh, wait because it takes time to the pop-up comes and then we're gonna pass this off and the provider. So let me console log first the result. So let's try our application. Let's go to Chrome and here we click on, first we refresh the page and then we click on continue with Google. So nothing is happening now. Let's check the console for possible errors. Could not sign in with Google. Sign in with pop-up is not defined. So we need to actually import the sign in with pop-up as well. I forgot to do it. After that, I'm gonna click on continue with Google. This is going to show us the pop-up window. So two things I have to mention here. One is you need to have at least two Gmail accounts to see this window. Otherwise, if you only have one Gmail account, if you choose a, an account, next time uh, Google is going to remember that and doesn't show you this pop-up window anymore. anymore. So, so some people think they are getting an error, but actually they only have one Gmail account. So make sure to add at least two Gmail accounts so you always see this pop-up window. The next things I have to mention is this error, cross origin uh, opener policy error. This is not the error for our application. This is a error for Firebase. And uh, it is only happening inside the Google Chrome and other in other browsers, you don't see this error. And this is not for us. And also maybe they're gonna fix it in the next version of Firebase. So don't worry about this error as well. So once you choose one of your Gmail account, you should get the result from Google. So we click on this account, for example. When we do it, we get the information and there are a lot of information, but the things we need is inside this user. So we open the user. Here we see the display name. The name is coming from Google, email, and also we get the photo URL here. So this URL, if we copy this URL and paste it inside a new tab, so we need to remove these quotes. And then if you press enter, you get the email, or you get the image. So, so three important information we need to get is the display name, which, is, which we need to create the username. We need the email and also we need the photo URL. Okay, and then we can send this data to the backend to create the, uh, create the user. So we, got, we have the result here. Instead of console logging, I wanna send the necessary information to the backend. So we're gonna create a response and we're gonna wait, uh, uh, create a fetch request to forward slash API, forward slash off, forward slash Google. I wanna call it Google, that endpoint. And then we wanna pass the information. The information, uh, first we need to set the method to be post, for example, the headers, we wanna set the content type to application JSON. And after that, we wanna send the data. The data I wanna send is three things. I wanna send the name, which is the display name. So result.user.display name. Then we want, I wanna send the email, which is result.user.email. And then I wanna add, uh, pass the photo URL. I just wanna call this one, for example, photo. And then this is going to be result.user.photo URL. 
So we want to send these three information. And also we haven't created this endpoint yet. So first we create the front end and then we can just go to backend and create this endpoint. Because we cannot test the endpoint with the Insomnia for Google, we're going to create it in front end first. So once we get the result, we can actually, first, we, first thing first, we're going to convert it to JSON and save it inside data. And then we can, uh, as you remember, inside the sign in, after the request, after the response, we created a dispatch of failure and success. I don't want to do the failure. I just want to do the success one. So we're going to do the same things here. I want to, uh, first thing first, we need to actually import use dispatch from React Router. Actually, it's coming, uh, yeah, it's coming from React Redux. We need to initialize it here and we need to also import sign in success from Redux forward slash user forward slash user slice. So when we get the information here, we want to dispatch signing success and we pass this data. So this is for front end. So we have completed the front end section. So what we want to do next is to create the back end. So for the back end, we need to go to the API folder. We go to routes first, off.route.js. We're going to create the Google route. So it's going to be a post request. And then the endpoint is going to be for slash Google. And then we just need to create a function inside the controllers, auth.controllers.js for the Google one. So we're going to export a constant called Google. And this is a synchronous request. We get the request respond and next. So first thing first, we I'm just going to close this one so we don't get an error. And then here we try, we use try and catch. And instead the error, we just use the next error to send the error. And then inside the try, first we want to check if the user existed or not. If the user exists, we need to sign in the user. Otherwise, we need to create the user. So first we, uh, first we need to check if the user exists or not. So we just say const user equals to await. And we use the user model that we have created. And we're going to search for this one using find one method and we're going to pass the email and if you remember we are passing the email inside the front end as well so we have the email so i think i i close the unnecessary things so inside the here i'm gonna pass the email which is coming from request.body.email and if the if the user exists if this one is true we want to uh, register the user otherwise we want to create a new user so for registering the user if you remember we just need to create a token and then save this token inside the cookie so what we can do here as you can see from the suggestion we create a token using jwt.sign we pass something unique which is the id of the user we are getting from here and then we pass the jwt secret key then we want to separate the password. So we don't want to save the password. We don't want to send the password. So we're going to separate the password and the rest, uh, which is inside the user that underline doc. And then we want to create a response. We, and we're going to save the cookie with the name access token. And we pass this token that we have created here. And we set the HTTP only to make it more secure. We send back the status of 200 and also we send back the user data which is we are getting here, REST. So this is for the first part. If the user exists, we just want to authenticate the user and make uh, signing the user. Otherwise, we want to create the user. But if you remember, inside the model, user.model.js, the password is actually required. But for signing up with Google, we don't actually get any password from Google. So. If we do that, if we sign in the user, we get an error because the password is required. So we need to actually create a password. We need to generate a password, like a random password. And later, if the user wants, they can update their password uh, themselves. So first we need to create the password. So here I'm just want to create a constant called generated password. 
And then we can just use this method, math.random, we create a random number, and then we're gonna convert this number to string and based on 36. 36 means uh, numbers from zero to nine and also letters from A to Z. So this is going to be a random letter and numbers together. And also we wanna get the last eight digits. So this is going to be like this. So we're gonna create a random number and letters and because it has a zero and dot we want to just get the last eight digits okay and then uh, if you want to make like a 16 digits you can just add another one next to it so we just say the same thing so this is going to be a 16 character password which is very secure once we do that we need to actually hash the password because we don't want to just store the password as it is inside the database. So we need to hash the, the password. We can use bcrypt.js.hash sync method to hash this password, which is generated password with 10 round of salt for creating the uh, combining with the password. And once we do that, we can save the, uh, save the user. So we just say new user and we use our model that we have created. So we have we're gonna save the username email and password but username is for example i get my username is like this for example sahan video so username actually should be connected not separated so in order to convert this one to the username we need to firstly uh, make them lowercase and then connect them together and also I'll, i want to add some random numbers and letters at the end so to, to make them to make it unique so in order to convert this one to this we can use this method i'm going to show you now so we get the name first thing first we want to uh, split the name so we split it by the space we just say uh, split it and then we're going to join them together without a space and then we want to make them lowercase so we just say two lower case okay and also we want to add some random number and letters at the end so we can just do the same things we can just copy this one just the eight digits we can add at the end or we can just say four digits it's enough so oh, actually this plus should be here okay so now we converted the name to username with the random uh, letter and numbers at the end. We pass the email and also the password. And also we need to pass the photo URL. So what I want to add, we just put a name here. For example, I just say, you can say avatar or anything, something like that. Uh, yeah, we can call it avatar. And this is coming from here, author JSX. The name was photo. So this one should be re request.body.photo. And also inside the model, we don't have the photo here. We don't have this avatar. So we need to add the avatar here. Otherwise we get an error. So the type is a string. And also I wanna add a default value for that. So if the user doesn't have any image, we wanna have a, an image for that. For adding the default one, you can just upload an image yourself to your database. But uh, because we don't have the data, uh, the, that ability now, we can just for now, we just search for a profile image on the internet and just get one of these images. For example, this one, we can just right click and get the copy image address and we can pass the address here. So we need to close this and add a comma here. So we have the avatar now. So let's test our application. Uh, let, let's complete this one first. So we have just uh, created a new user. We need to save this new user using new user.save. And then we want to create a token like before. We just create a token using jwt.sign. We pass something unique about this new user, which is uh, its ID. We pass the JWT secret key. We separate the password and the rest. And also we want to create the response with a cookie and uh, with the name access token. We pass this token 
that we have created with the HTTP only true to make it secure. And also we have a, a status of 200 and we send back this JSON. So exactly what we did here. So you could copy it easily. So this is for the backend. So we have completed the backend part. We have saved it. So I think now it's time to test our front end. So let's open the console. So we are aware of, so these are the actually uh, when we were building, we got these errors. That's not important. We, let's refresh the page. And then we just click on continue with Google. And we just choose one of our accounts. For example, I choose this one. But we are getting an er error. Could not sign in with Google. Okay. Oh, I, I, I forgot to add this function from the controller inside the route. So I'm going to add this route, Google and import it at the top. So let's try again. Okay, we are not getting an error. Let's check the network and let's clean this one and request again. Okay, so we get a 200 response uh, status and also in the response, we get the information of the user, including the, the username, which is randomly created at the end. We got the email and also the avatar is the Google uh, address so the avatar of the user we are adding it here so that was actually successful for us so what we want to do here actually so when we do that we want to add this uh, to the so what happened here actually we didn't uh, have the user here yet because we haven't updated the header section yet but we have the information and also if we check the redox now the current user is the user from Google. So we have the username, we have the email, and also we have the avatar. So we have all the information necessary to add, uh, to complete the, now the header section to get the image and also the profile section. So, and also when we, the sign in is successful, I want to navigate the user to the home page as well. So we can add this one easily too inside the OAuth.jsx after if the, uh, everything is successful and we dispatch the user, we can navigate the user to the home page. So we can just import use navigate from React Router DOM. We need to initialize it here. We just say const navigate equals to use navigate. And then when everything is fine, we can just navigate to the home page or slash. So let's try again. We just click on continue with Google. I just choose this account this time. So now we are redirected to the home page and there was no problem. All right, so that was it for creating the Google uh, functionality. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So we have the reference. So as you can see, so everything is secure and the, there's no .env here because we already have the .ignore uh, for the .env that we have added this section inside the client. So we can add everything to GitHub by clicking on this plus icon. And then I just want to create a message. We just say create and add OAuth component. And we just click on commit and push. So in the next section, we're going to update the header section and show the, the user that is signing the avatar of the user in this here. And then once we click it, we can see the profile page. And also we want to make the profile page private. So if the person is not signed in, they are not allowed to see the profile page. So see in the next section for this part of the All right, in the last section, we have completed the OAuth Google functionality. In this section, we're going to add the user information inside the header of the project. So if you look at the final version, you can see that when you sign in with the Google account, you see the avatar of the user in the header and also inside the profile page. And also this profile page is kind of uh, protected. For example, if you sign out here, and if you try to go to profile page, for example, forward slash profile, we are redirected again to the signing page and the profile page is protected. But if you sign in again, we should see that we can have access to the profile page. We can go to the forward slash 
profile. So we want to do the same things in our project. So we can go back to Visual Studio Code. So what we want to do is to go to header component. Let's let me close everything. So we go to client folder. We go to components and we choose header.jsx. And then here we have this sign in at the end of the unordered list. So we want to create a condition, show this sign in if the person is not authenticated and show the avatar of the user if the person is authenticated. So we need to actually, first thing first, we need to import use uh, selector, which is coming from React Redux. And then we can just uh, initialize the user. We can get the user here or the current user. We have the current user. So we, we can get the current user and which is, we can use the use selector and we, we just choose the uh, state user because the name of our uh, state is user. If you remember, we have saved the name user for the uh, user slice. So we have the current user and then we want to check here. We create a condition. We just say if the current user exists, we want to show an image. Otherwise, we want to see this li here. So I'm going to cut this one and put it here. And also we want to uh, cover the current user with the link here. So I'm going to put this link inside this condition. So let me complete it first so we don't get an error. So here we just add an image and then so uh, this condition and uh, this one should be outside. Sorry. Okay. Now for the source, if you remember, we have saved the name of the image inside the current user avatar in the last section. So we have the avatar for alternative, we just say profile. And now if we check our website, we see here the word profile. Uh, I think the image is not showing. So let me check the Redux now. So the current user actually has the avatar. So let me check avatar. Uh, avatar, I write the avatar. Okay. So now we see the image of the user. Let's bring this one to the right side so we can uh, style it real quick. So we add a class name to the image. I want to make it rounded. So we just say rounded full. And then let's make it a smaller. We just say hit, uh, set the height to be seven and then width to be seven as well. And also we want to set the uh, cover. We want to set the object to cover. So to keep the aspect ratio of the image, if you have a different aspect ratio. And also when we click on this image, I don't want to go to the sign in page. I want to go to the profile page. So I want to change this one to profile. So this one brings us to the profile, but if the person is not authenticated, we want to protect this profile actually page. So the way we can do that is to create a component here. We call it private route.jsx. We can just create a React functional component for now. And then we want to cover our, if inside the app.jsx, we want to cover this profile with this private route. So we create another route. And then for the path, uh, actually we don't need path for this one, but the element we want to use is this private route. We have the, the component that we have created. And then we want to cover this route with that route. So this is not a self-closing. This one should be uh, like that. And then we want to close it like this. So each time, so now we see the private route instead of profile actually. So inside the private route, we want to create a condition. So here as well, we want to import the current user. So we want to use that uh, use selector to do that. We just say use selector, which is coming from React Redux. And then we want to get the current user. We just say current user e equals to this. And then here, instead of just saying private route, I want to say if the current user, there is a current user, show the children, show this one, so show this profile page. So in order to show the children, we can use a hook called an uh, outlet or a component called outlet. They call it a component. So we just say out 
left, which is coming from React router down. So we're gonna, if there is a current user, we wanna show the outlet. Otherwise, we wanna see the, uh, what we wanna see here is to see the, uh, we wanna navigate the user to the sign-in page. So we wanna import navigate here as well. So navigate is a component too. So the difference between the use navigate and navigate is use navigate is a hook, but navigate is a component. So we can use it as a component here. We just say navigate, and then we wanna navigate the user to the sign in page like this. So as you can see now, we are inside the profile page, but if the person is not authenticated, for example, if I uh, go to inspect and then I go to the application and inside the local storage, if I delete the user, so if I refresh the page, we shouldn't see, we shouldn't have any user because the now the current user is null. So if we now try to go to the profile page, we are redirected again to the signing page because this page, the profile page is authenticated. But if you sign in again, for example, if I sign in with a different person, we see the person in the, in the header. And also if you click on it, we go to the profile page and it's not for tech. Uh, we have access to the profile page because the person is authenticated. And then if we sign out again, we cannot go to this page. So that was it for creating the, uh, updating the header section. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So this one is update the header and make the profile page private. And then we can just commit and push it to the GitHub. And in the next section, what we want to do is to complete the profile page UI. So we want to create it similar to the final version. So we want to have a title, we want to have the profile image, and also we have the ability to uh, we have to, to add this kind of form to let the user to uh, update their profile. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have updated the header component and also we made the profile page private. In this section, we're going to complete the profile page UI. So we bring the website on the right side and then the Visual Co Studio Code on the left side. So we go to the profile.j6 and here what I wanna do is to add, firstly, I wanna add an H1 tag saying profile, but I wanna bring them to the center. So I add a class name here. First thing first, we wanna increase the size of the text to 3XL and then Let's make the font semi bold. And then we can just bring it to the center using text center. And finally, we can add some margin at the top and bottom using margin Y7. And then what else I want to do is to add a form. And if you look at the final version, we have a form with three inputs and an image here. So so we can put the image inside the form and have a gap between these image and the buttons and also the inputs. So we can easily style them if you put them inside the form. So after this H1 tag, I wanna add a form, but uh, I, we don't need any action for that. And inside the form, I wanna add the image and the source of the image is going to be the same as we did for the header component. So here we need to import use selector. And this is coming from React Redux. After importing use selector, we can get the current user. And the source would be current user dot, if you remember, it was avatar, avatar. So we can see the image now. For the alternative, we just say profile and we can just style it a little bit. We can just make it fully rounded by saying rounded full, we can set the height to, for example, 24 and width to 24. In order to keep the aspect ratio, we can add the object cover. And also we can add it when we hover over it, we don't see any pointing hand. We can just change the cursor to be pointer to add that effect. 
And also, we want to bring it to the center, but before bringing it to the center, we need to add, change the, the display to flex in the form, and also we make the flex direction color. After that, we can here add the self center to bring it to the center. So for the text or the H1 tag, we use text center, but for the image, we use self center to bring it to the center. Okay. And also we can add some margin at the top of two, so we add more space here. After the image, we're going to have the inputs. So we have the first input, which is having the type of text. And also we, we can add a placeholder of, for example, saying username. And then we can add a border for that. Sorry, border should be inside the class name. So let's add a border. And then we can add a padding of three. So I think that's enough for this section. Or we can just add a rounded large two to keep the consistency between the forms in our website. So what we, I want to do, I, I want to add some space around it. So in, inside this div, we can add a padding of three. So we add this padding to everything inside our application. And also we can set the maximum width to be large. So inside in the largest screen, we, we limit the size of the input to be large. And also we can bring it to the center using MX Auto like this. And after that, we're going to add more inputs. So we can just copy this input two more times using Alt Shift arrow done. And then we can just change the second one. So I forgot actually to add the ID here. So we need to add the ID here as well and then copy it. So it would be easier. So the ID for this one is going to be his username. We need this ID later to actually uh, target these inputs and uh, get the information from them. So we can just copy them now. And then we can just use Ctrl D to select both of these. And then we change them to, for example, email. The type here would be email as well. And then finally, we're going to have the last one, is, which is password. So we use Ctrl D to choose both of them. And then we just say password. And then we can add a space between them by simply going to the form. And then we just add gap four. So that's it for the input. So let's add a button two here. So we create a button saying update. And then let's add some styling to it. We change the back background to a slate 700 and we can change the text color to white. We can create a rounded corner by just saying rounded large. We add a padding of three and we can make it uppercase. And then we can have a offer, hover effect of opacity of 95%. And when it's disabled, we want to make it with the opacity of 80%. So now we have the hover effect and everything else. So after that, after this button, and uh, the button is okay. Now we want to add this delete account and sign out. I want to create this button later when we want to create the listing page and also this show listing later. So we we'll just focus on this delete account and sign out for now. So outside the form, we want to have a div and inside the div, we're going to have a span saying delete account and then this delete account i think account has two c and then here we add a class name we just make it with the text of red for example 700 and then we can set the cursor to be pointer so when we hover over it we see a pointing hand and also we can copy this one and add our sign out button sign out or sign out yeah i think uh, yeah we just keep it lowercase it's more beautiful and then we can bring them next to each other using flex and then we can add a space between them using justify between and we can add a margin at the top of five to bring it a little bit down so that was it for creating the profile page ui let's add this one to the github so here we just say complete profile page ui and then we can just add this file and also commit and push to GitHub. So that was it for this section. In the next section, 
we're going to complete the image upload functionality. So we want to add an image upload functionality so we can change this image. And also we want to connect this application to Firebase storage to be able to add our files to that platform. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the profile page UI. In this section, we're going to add the image upload functionality. If you look at the final version, if when we click on the image, we can see that the, we see a pop-up window asking us to choose the image. For example, I can choose this image from my desktop. And once you choose it, this is going to upload the image automatically to the database and shows you image uploaded successfully and shows you the image here. And once you click on update, you can see it inside the header as well. So let's bring our website here. The first thing and the, st the first step is to add an input with the type of a uh, file here. So before the image, I want to add an input with the type of file. So as you can see, we, we have this one. When we click on it, we can choose a file. But actually, I don't want to see this input. I want to click on the image and choose a file. So in order to do that, we can add simply and add a reference to this input. So we can use use ref from React to do that. So we just say import use ref from React. And then we can just create a reference. For example, I call it file ref. And we set the initial value to be null. And once we do that, we can just go to this input and refer to that reference. So we just say ref, and then here we just choose the file ref. And then now, if, if you want to click on this using this image, we need to go to the image, to this image, and add an unclick event listener. And then here, so we create a callback function. And then here, we're going to just say file ref dot click or dot current dot click. We just say the, and then we need to call this click. So if you do that, and now if we click on this image, we're gonna open the, we're gonna click on actually in this input. So they are connected together. And also I wanna remove this one. I don't wanna see this input. So we can just create, make it hidden. We just say hidden. And what else I wanna do is to, uh, only accept images. So we just say accept. So we, here we just say image and then forward slash a star. So in this case, this is going to accept only images. So we need to click on it. Uh, let's see. So only we can accept the images, nothing else. So if I go somewhere else, we cannot choose them. But actually, as you can see, the format is image files, but you can choose the all files here and accept and uh, choose all files. In Windows, you can do it too. So in order to protect our database, we need to add some rules inside the Firebase. So now it's time to create our Firebase storage and make it ready so we can connect it to our client side. So we go to the Firebase. If you remember, we created the authentication. Now we wanna add the storage. So we go to a storage here and we click on get started. Here we choose the production mode because we want to add our rules. But as you can see, the default rules are not allowing reading or writing. So we can just change the rules later. So let's click on next. And then here you choose the location of your storage. It can be anywhere near you. And then we just click on done. So everything is ready now. As you can see, we can upload a file here. For example, I choose the same image. I can upload it to the Firebase, but we want to actually upload it from our website, not from here. The first thing is, uh, the first step is to add rules here. So the default rules are actually not allowing everyone to read and write, but we want to change this one so everybody can read it. So let me zoom this a little bit. So we're going to allow read, but we're going to allow write only for people so we're going to add a condition. We just say if request dot resource. And also uh, this is not JavaScript. So, and uh, this, we can just say size 
less than two megabytes, for example, we, just, we can just say two multiplied to 1024, which is one kilobyte. And again, 1024, which is another one kilobyte. So this is totally two, two megabytes. And also we want to add request dot resource dot content type. This one, I want it to be matches. So this is, should be plural to all images. So we just say image forward slash dot star. And if you click on publish, so this rule is going to be applied to your application, but actually it takes a few minutes to be applied. So if you see an error, just uh, wait for you another few minutes to uh, allow these rules to be applied to your application. And as you don't have access to my Firebase, so I wanna just copy these rules and put it inside the Visual Studio code somewhere. So later you can have access to it inside the GitHub repository. We just say, let me create, okay, Firebase, a storage. And then let me paste this one here. And also we can just comment this one, okay. So you can have access to this one if you want to copy it from the GitHub repository. So now we can have access and upload our file. So in, before doing that, we need to actually add a piece of state that uh, saved the file. So here we just create a piece of state. We call it file. And the initial value for this one, we, call, we just set it to be undefined because we don't have any file yet. And then now inside this input, we want to add an unchanged event listener, which is going to get the event and then set this file, set the change this file to e.target.files. And as we are uploading only one file, we need to get the first one if they, someone choose the view file. So we just say zero here. In this case, we're going to any changes happened, we can see it inside this file. So if you now console log the file here, and also we need to import this user state at the top. So we, once we do that, we can just go to our application. Let me refresh the page. And if you choose, uh, let me open the console first. We go to console. If you choose an image, we can see the file name and the file. So we want to use this one actually to upload this file to our Firebase. So we can now add a use effect react hook to see the changes. If there is a file, we want to actually upload it. So what we need to do here is to import firstly use effect. And then here at the bottom, we can just say use effect. And if there is a, an image, there is a file, we want to call a function, for example, handle file upload and then let's close this and also we want to add some condition we want to say if there is a file call this function and then we want to create this function here so first we create it so we don't get an error and let me see the error first i don't think we have an error so because this is we, we are building at the same time we see the errors so once we and also we want to pass this file so we want to pass this file and get it here so we get the file here as the input. And also now we can do the stuff. For example, I can create a storage and the storage is going to be equal to get a storage. And let's get a storage. And get a storage is actually coming from, uh, we don't get a suggestion here. We can import it from Firebase. So uh, we're gonna import get a storage from Firebase forward slash storage. And also we want to pass the app. If you remember, we have created an app inside the Firebase.js here and exported the app. So based on this one, the Firebase is going to recognize us and knows which storage we want to store the file. So we create a storage by get storage. And after that, we're going to create a storage reference. Before doing that, we want to set the file name. So we just say file name. And this is going to, be, we can just set it file.name, but as we, if we, someone uploads two times one file, so this is going to uh, create the same file with uh, two names that we cannot upload, we get an error actually. 
So in order to prevent that, we want to make this one unique. So we add the current date for here. So we just say new date dot get time. So this is going to get the current time uh, time of the computer, your computer, and add it to this file name. So you, you're going to have always a unique file name. So after the file name, we're going to create a, a storage reference, which is uh, showing the which place to save the storage. But actually, I don't want to create any folder to it. So I just set the file name. So I'm going to remove these things. And then we have this storage and also we have this file name. And also we need to import ref from Firebase forward slash storage. After this, we're going to create the upload task. So we're going to uh, say this one is a method upload bytes resumable from Firebase forward slash storage because we want to actually see the percentage of the upload. So we're going to use this upload task which is going to get this storage ref and the file that we got from the input. After doing that, we can just uh, use this upload task to get the actually the percentage and also the error and etc. So after that, we're going to say upload task.on. We want to actually track the changes like this, a state change. So we need to add a state change. And then here, let me close this first. And then here, we're going to get a few things. For example, we get the snapshot which is a uh, piece of information from each state change. And then we can just uh, record the progress, which is the percentage of upload by just saying a snapshot that by bytes transport, for example, from two megabyte, already 10 kilobytes passed. So this is that one, bytes transport and over the total bytes, which is, for example, two megabytes. And then you need to multiply to 100 to get the percentage because that is something between zero and one. And also, uh, for now, let's console log the upload is progress done. Let me show you here. So let's open the console. Let's clear this. And then we upload an image. The image should be a little bit big so you can see the percentage. If you choose a very small image, like uh, less than one megabyte, you don't see the percentage. So, so you just uh, choose an image between one and two megabytes. When you choose that, Okay, we are getting an error. App is not defined. So we need to import this app from Firebase. That's the file that we have created, that file firebase.js. So let's try again. So as you can see, upload is 0% all the way to 100%. So it's, this is working actually, but I don't want to show a console log. I want to show it here to the user. So what I want to do is to add a piece of state here. And for the piece of state, we just say percentage or image or file percentage and set file percentage and the initial value would be zero. But here, instead of console logging, we want to set that file to this progress. But this progress, actually, if you remember, the value was like uh, with, with decimals. So we want to make it rounded here as well. So we can use math.round to round this progress. So now if we console log the file percentage, and if we uh, paste it again, if you open the inspect, let me refresh the page. And if we choose the image, we can see, okay, what happened? So the percentage was okay. Ch child path that split. I think something happened. I have uh, maybe added something that unnecessary things. I think it's okay. So let's check our code again. Uh, this is file percentage and set file percentage. Uh, okay, here we just said set file. It should be set file percentage. Okay. So now if we try again, yeah, we see that we are getting the uh, rounded percentage from zero to hundred percent. All right. So that was it for this one. And also we can uh, get the error here as well. So after this a snapshot. So this one is here. Okay, after this one, we're gonna get the error as well. Let me, uh, let, I have to close this one. And then I wanna get the error, we just say error. And then we can just uh, create another piece of state for handling the error. So we just say cons file error or fire upload error. 
and then we just set the initial value to null or we can just set it to true and false we just say false and then uh, we can just here we can just set the file upload error to true so if an error happens we want to see it as well so finally after the error we want to get the file so we want to just create a callback function here and then we just use a method called get download url and then we need to get download url and then we want to actually get this upload task that is snapshot that ref the file and then in if it if the upload is successful we want to get the download url and then we want to set the download url to a file to a form data because uh here, uh, let me complete it. So uh, here you can see. So we're going to have the image and also we want to have the ability to upload, update the username, email, and password. So we want to create a form data so that it, that con uh, includes all these things. So let me just delete this console log. And also here we want to create another piece of state called form data. And then the initial value would be an empty string sorry an empty object and also here we want to set that form data we want to uh, actually get the previous form data for example any changes here like username and email we want to keep the tra track of changes of that and also we want to set the avatar to download url so which is we are getting from here so let's see i think we put some uh, extra parentheses here so here we close this one oh, okay we need to actually i think we need to close the parentheses here so this is this parentheses and also we have here so this uh, function we have okay we actually we we need to actually change this one to a parentheses and then here we change this one to a parentheses no actually that was okay this here but I think this one we we can just directly return it because we don't need to do these things and then we can just delete this as well and then this one is for here and then we don't need this I think now it's fine okay let's see let me close this so you can see the error set file upload error to true so this one has a problem I think we missed a parenthesis here. This one should be... This parenthesis is missing here, I feel. Okay, now it's working. So let's see again the file. I'm going to show you the file in full size. Okay, so we have a file called handle file upload, which is going to have these things. And then once we create the upload task, we're going to set the uh, upload task dot on and this one is going to track the changes and gives us a, a snapshot first, which is we are going to use to create the progress, set the percentage, and then we get the error. And finally, we get the download URL. So now uh, we should check the, we need to console log the form data to understand if it's working or not. Okay, so let me open this, inspect it. We go to console, we refresh the page. First, the form data is an empty object, but if you upload an image after the percentage is completed, we should see the change here. That's still empty. So let's console log the error and other things so we know that uh, it's working or not. So, uh, so let's console log file percentage. And also we want to console log the file upload error. All right, so let's try it again. So now the percentage is working and finally is uploaded and there is no error, but we don't get the file URL here. So it should be a problem here. So we get it. I think uh, get download URL, we didn't import it actually at the top. Get the, oh, we have imported it. That's fine. Oh, what is this one? So I'm going to delete this. So upload bytes resumable ref and get download url so so get download url upload test that a snapshot that ref and then we want to get the download url and we set it to form data 
we get the previous form data and set the avatar uh, download URL. So form data, set form data, use a state. Out here, we don't get the change here after that when it's 100%. So we need to add the console log here. Maybe, oh yeah, we, we just created this file, but we didn't do any export for this one. So we don't get that one. Uh, I think I find the error here. So actually everything here should be inside upload task. And we put this error everything outside actually. So this parenthesis is for this one. So this parenthesis should be outside here. Uh, no, outside. Okay, let me check. So, and then we have a comma here and also comma here and remove this one. So everything now is inside upload task. So if we check now, we can see even uh, when we upload an image, we can see that uh, after the 100%, we get the avatar here, the avatar image. And then if we just copy this one and then go to ins inside another tab and paste it. So let's see. Okay, now we are getting the just the, I think we didn't completely copy it. So we need to go here, actually. Copy it here, paste it here, and then we remove the quote. And if we press enter, we see the image here. So we have the URL now, and the URL is actually saved inside the form data. And then later we want to add other information like username, email, and password. And once we click on update, we want to update it inside the database. Now we want to show the percentage here to the user under this profile uh, picture. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And here, instead of console logging, I want to delete this console log. And then uh, after that, after this image, we want to have a paragraph. And inside the paragraph, we want to add a condition. So we just say, if there is an error, so file upload error, we want to see Let's open this and then, uh, so if there is an error, we want to just create a spam here. Let's... So in this spam, we want to say error image upload. And then we want to just style this one real quick. For example, I want to just set the text to be red 700. So if the error happens, we want to see this one. And then if the image percentage happened, so we want to add another question mark. We just say if the image percentage or file, I think it was file percentage. Let me check. So we have file pers. So let me copy this. So if the file pers is more than zero and less than 100, let me accept this one. More than zero and file percentage is less than 100, we want to see another span, but with the color green, 700. And then here we want to say, we create a backtick. Here we just say uploading. Uh, actually make this one a slate. So this, this is going to be black. Uploading percentage. And then if this is with, if the file is storage, if the file percentage, actually, if the file percentage is equal to 100, we want to show Another spam with the color green this time. And then we just say successfully uploaded or image successfully uploaded. And then otherwise, we just want to show an empty string. So nothing basically. And then let's see. So in order to fix this uh, error, we can just add a parenthesis here and then here. And here as well. I'm oh, sorry, not. Yeah, it should be here. Okay, now. And this empty string. And then we close it. That is fine. Uh, I think we don't need this parenthesis here. Oh, this one should be a clone here, yeah, actually. Uh, not this one here. So if this one is happening, and then. So first we create the condition. And then. And then add the or one here. And then if there is this condition, this one happened. And then we add the or here. Okay, we don't need the parentheses here, actually, and here. And then, okay, now everything is working now. 
So if the, there is an error, we're going to show the error image upload with the text red. If the file percentage is more than zero or less than 100 and less than 100, we're going to say uploading file percentage. Otherwise, if the file percentage is equal to 100, we want to set it uh, saying image successfully uploaded with the text green. And finally, if there's no condition, we just say empty string. Let's test this one. So it's already working, image successfully uploaded from the previous image. So let's upload another time. So uploading percentage and image successfully uploaded. And if I choose a wrong image, for example, if I choose this MP4 file by just saying all files, and then I choose this MP4. So this is going to upload it, but finally we're going to get an error from Firebase. So, okay, we got the error here, error image upload. So, uh, so we have to set the, actually the successfully, uh, this one shows only hundred, but we need to add a condition here. If there is no error, we have to see that one, but uh, actually it's good. This is going to happen, uh, each time. So hundred, that's fine. It just shows the one second and then it's going to fix it. So we don't need to worry about that. Also, also we want to bring this one to the center. So here, I just want to add some uh, styling to it. We just say text is uh, small. And also I want to bring it to the center. We just say self center like this. Uh, so let's create this uh, image upload uh, more specific. For example, here, I want to add another thing. We just say image must be less than two megabytes. Okay. And then also, when we upload the image, I want to see the new image here. So when we upload it like this, and we want to see the new image here, so the preview the image. So what I want to do here inside the image, I want to create a condition. If a form data dot avatar exists, I want to show that one. Otherwise, I want to see this current user dot avatar. So let's try it again. So when we upload it, I think after a few seconds, we're going to see this new image. So that was it for image uploading functionality. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So here we want to add this file and create a message for that. I just want to say complete image upload functionality. And we can just commit and push it to GitHub. All right. So that was it for image upload functionality. In the next section, we're going to create the user update user API route so we can uh, create it in the backend and update the user there. So see you in the next. All right. In the last section, we have completed the image upload functionality. In this section, we're going to work on creating the user API route, the update user API route. So we need to go to Visual Studio Code and we go to the API folder. We can just go to routes and to user.route.js. Remember, we have created a test API route. Now it's time to create the update API route. So here we just say router.host. And then we want to add that uh, URL, which is forward slash update and the endpoint. We need to add the ID as well, because we need to know which user you want to uh, update. So we add the ID and then we want to uh, just call a function called update user inside the controller folder. So we need to import this one from the user.controller.js. So we need to just create it here. So after that, we're going to export another function called update user, which is going to have a request response and next to handle the errors. And just, we just close it for now. And then we can just import it here by using contour space. So we just created the function, but for updating the user, it's not like signing up or signing in. We have an extra uh, checking. Uh, what we need to check is to check if the person is authenticated or not. So when we sign in the user, we create 
a token inside the cookie. And now we can use that token to verify the user. So we know which user we are updating. So if we are updating a wrong user and we are not uh, authenticated, we should get an error. And so we're going to create another function called verify token. And then before going to update the user, we want to check the person uh, to be verified or not. So uh, let's inside the utils, remember we had error.js, we can create another file called verify user.js. And then here we're going to export a function, we just call it verify user or verify token. And this is going to take their request, response, and next as well. Let's close this. And then here we want to check first the token. We want to get the token from the cookie. But in order to get any data from the cookie, we need to install another package. We need to install another package in the backend called cookie parcel. So inside, you need to go to the root directory because we are working for the backend. So we need to go back here using cd dot dot. And then here we're going to install that package, which is cookie parcel. So once uh, you just install it, you just press enter to install it. And then you need to initialize this package. You need to go to index.js. And at the top, we're going to import cookie parcel. So we need to import it at the top. So we just say cookie parcel like this from cookie parcel. And then after we have created our app that use somewhere here, you can just add that one. You just say app that use cookie parcel. Now you can get the information from the cookie. So here inside the verify token, we just say const token equals to request.cookie.token. But actually it's not token. Uh, if you remember inside the cookie, we have put the name of the token access token, not just only token. So we need to just change its name to access token to be able to use it. It was access underline token. So once we get the token, we can verify it. First, we want to just say, if there is a no token, we want to just uh, create an error. If you remember, we have just uh, we can just do it like that. We can just say return. Uh, we, we can use the middleware that we have created using this next. And then we can use that error.js. We have created a function called handle uh, a error handler. We can use this function. And then we just pass the, for example, we just say 401 a status code. And we just say unauthorized or you are not authorized, something like that. And then after that, if there is a token, we want to check if the token is correct or not. We just say JWT. We can use JWT. We need to import it at the top. So we're going to import JWT from JSON Web Token. And then here we just say JWT.verify. And then we're going to verify this token that we get from here. We need to pass the JWT secret key, which is inside the process that env dot uh we should just check okay we just save it with this name jwt underline secret and then this is going to give us two things like error and also we can get the user as well so once we get these two information first we can check if there is an error we can return a new error for example with a status code of 403 and then we can just say forbidden or token is not valid. We can just say forbidden. That's fine. And then if there is no error, we want to uh, send this user to the next things. For example, if you remember after this verify token, so we need to actually import it here, verify token from this function. After that, we want to update the user. So we want to send it to the next, uh, uh, next function. So here inside the verify user, so we want to send the information. So we want to send it inside the request. So we just say request that user is equal to this user that uh, we are getting from the uh, cookie. So we get the user data and then send it from this uh, section. 
So actually, it's not a user data. It's just an ID. We have saved the ID of the user, but we just call it user. And then we're going to use this ID to uh, verify the user. And then when we uh, just record this one, we're going to go to the next, which is here, next, update user. So first we check. If we reach to this point and everything is okay, we're going to save the user to the request and then go to the next section, which is update user. And also we need to close this so we don't get an error. So I think it's ready now to work on the user.controller section. So here inside the user.controller.js, we're going to check if the we get the request, remember, inside the verify token, we have the request that user, which is this user. So if this request that user dot ID is not equal, is not to equal to the ID we get from here, this ID, which is actually, uh, we can get it from request dot params dot ID, because that's a parameter of the endpoint. So here we just say if this one is not equal to this request that params that ID, and then we can return an error uh, with the a status code of, for example, 401, and then we just say you are not you are not authenticated, or you 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 can only no, but you should say you can only update your own account. So if uh, otherwise, if the user is correct. We want to just uh, update the user. So we just create a try and catch it statement first. And then here we're going to cache the error. We just say next. And then we pass this error to handle the error. And then here, first thing first, if there is a, uh, if the user is trying to change its password, we need to hash the password. So we just say if there is a request that body that password, then we want to, what we want to do is to encrypt the password. We just, and then we just say request that dot dot password is equal to, remember, bcrypt dot bcrypt js dot hash sync. But uh, we need to import the bcrypt js as well. We just say import bcrypt js from bcrypt js. And then here we just say bcrypt js dot, uh, I think hash sync. You can use hash sync and then we can just uh, pass this request that password and then the number of uh, salt, the number of round for the salt here. So this is going to be a hash password. And then after that, we're going to uh, update the user. We just say const update hit user. We create a constant is equal to await. And we want to use the model that we have created. So we're going to import the model as well for the user. And then we want to use a method called find by ID and update to update the user. So this is going to take a few things. First things first, we want to pass the ID. So we want to know which user we want to uh, update. We just say request. It's inside the params. So we just say request.params.id. Okay. And then we want to pass the data. But we, as some data are available and some data are not available. For example, the user might change its image, username, but doesn't want to change its email and password. So it's not always the data is completed. So we need to actually use a method called set to do it. So set is going to check if the data is, is being changed, is going to change. Otherwise, it's going to ignore that data. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here, we're going to use the set method. So some people actually use the set and then just uh, send the request that body. That is wrong because uh, people can send another information that is not in the form. For example, in this form, we don't have is admin. But in Insomnia, for example, if you want to update the user, you can add the is admin true. So the person can cr make himself admin by just sending the uh, body. So you need to uh, specify all of them to not be able to uh, get an error or, or person can uh, hack your database because admin has more authority than they can do more things so they can change themselves to admin. So as you can see, it's very common 
and even the GitHub Copilot is suggesting me request that body, but that is actually a mistake. So here we just say they can have a username, they can update their username, they can update their email, that's fine. They can update their password, and also they can update their uh, image, which is avatar, okay? So we're gonna have these things, and then as we are using await, we need to change this one to a synchronous. So now we have just set everything here. The, the another things we need to add here after set and uh, after here, we need to add something called new true. So new true is going to actually return and save this updated user for the, with the new information, not the previous one. Otherwise, if you don't add this one, you're gonna get the previous information for your response. So when you add the new, now, now after that, we can firstly, first we wanna separate the password and the rest. So we can do that by just separating the password and others or rest. And then we can return with the response with the status of, for example, 200. And then we're gonna return a JSON. We can just send back the, all the, this rest like this. So now our uh, API route is ready to be tested. So what we can do, we can test it with Insomnia. So in Insomnia, if you remember, we have created an off folder. So we can create another folder for a user. And then inside this folder, I'm gonna create a new request. Let's call this request, let's uh, change this name to update user. And then this is going to be a post request. And then the URL uh, is going to be local. If you wait a little bit, they're gonna suggest you your previous one. This is going to be from forward slash API forward slash user and then update. And also we need to, if you remember, we need to pass the ID of the user. So we, we need to sign in first, for example, this user, I'm gonna sign in with this user. Okay, it is saying they couldn't connect to the server. Let's check. Maybe there is an error. Okay, we have an error here. So let's check. So cannot find the module user that model. Okay, I think uh, we didn't add the JS here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, now it's working. Let's try again. So let's sign in. As you can see, I'm getting the data. So I need to just copy this ID to be able to update this user. So I go to the update user and add this ID at the end. And then inside the body, I'm going to send a JSON. For example, inside the JSON, I'm going to uh, update the user name. For example, I just say uh, Sahant, my name. And then if the Sahant uh, exists, we're going to get an error. Otherwise, we're gonna, it's going to be OK. OK, so the username is now Sahant. OK. Uh, and then the status code is 200. We can update anything. You can just update only email. For example, email is going to be sahand at gmail.com. So when you send, you see that email is updated. So everything else is the same. Let's try to get an error. For example, I just uh, changed this ID. For example, I changed the one to two and we sent. We are getting an error. Server return nothing. Let's see the error here. Uh, error handler is not defined. So actually, we didn't import this error handler. Okay, so this one should fix the problem. And then let's try again. Okay, now we are getting an error with the status code of 401 and saying you can only update your own account. So the error is actually working as well. So if I return this one to one, this one should work. Okay, everything is working fine. Okay, that was it for up the, creating the update user API. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So we add all the files and create a message, uh, create user update API, and we can just commit and push to GitHub, or we just say API route here, or create update user API, or user update API, doesn't matter, it can be the same. API route, okay, we can commit and push to GitHub, in the next section, we're going to actually uh, connect the front end and the back end. So we're gonna uh, add the, the event listener for these inputs. We are gonna complete the 
front end and we're gonna connect it to the API and really we can update the user from uh, this section from the from the uh, client side. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have created the update user API route. In this section, we're going to complete the update user functionality. So let's uh, go to our Visual Studio code. We go to client side, and then here we go to pages and profile.jsx. Let's bring it to the left side. We can just close this one for now and bring this one to the right side. The, the things I forgot to do here is to show the username, the current user, which is authenticated. We see the image, but we don't see the username and email. So it's very simple to do that. We can just go to the input and just add a default value. And this is going to be, we can get it from the current user, for example, that username, as you can see, now it's appeared. Uh, okay, and then for the email, we can do the same thing, current user dot email. And then we want to add an unchanged event listener. So we do some changes here. We want to save it to the this uh, piece of state called form data. So we want we need to add it to the all the input. So I'm going to use the alt to use the like a dual cursor in the input. I'm going to add the unchanged event listener to all of them. And then this is going to call a function called handle change. And then we need to create this function at the top before the return, which is a const handle change. And then we can simply set the form data. Well, let's see uh, what's the error now. Okay. So the error says form data is not defined. So where is it? Okay. So let me complete this one first. So we set the form data, we get the previous form data, whatever we have, and then we just say e.target.id and is equal to e.target.value. So based on the ID of the input, we're going to track the changes and put it inside the form data. So what is this error for? And then, so which line? 70. Ah, okay, so here, because we don't... Uh, we are not authorized or we have the form data here at the top. So we can just protect this one, maybe. Form data is not defined, but actually I defined it at the top. Oh, oh what is this one? What happened here? I guess I think autocorrect just created some mess here. I'm uh, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, why this one is changed. So now if you refresh this page, we don't see an error. And then if we console log the form data, if we console log the form data and then we see it here, and then if, if you do some changes, for example, I choose, if I want to change only the username, for example, I delete this one, you see that only the username is changed. And if I, for example, if I upload an image and then the image is going to be added to this form data as well. So the form data is going to have the username and also the image. So whatever change we want to do, now we have inside the form data. But if you don't want to change our password, that's fine. Uh, we don't need to add it. But if we add it here, you can see that the, also the password is going to be changed as well. So we have the avatar, password, and the username. So all the changes is going to be tracked. So we have the form data now. We want to actually now send the form data to the backend to be able to update the user. So let's delete this console log for now. And then we want to uh, add inside the form, we want to add an unsubmit event listener, uh, which is going to call a function called handle submit. And now we want to add this function here. We just say const handle submit. Uh, first, we want to actually prevent the default behavior of the submission, which is refreshing the page by using e.prevent.preventDefault. And then what we want to do here is to use, for example, first we want to use a try and catch a statement. And then inside the error, we want to dispatch an error. If you remember, we were using dispatch in signing pages, but in the profile, we don't have any 
uh, reducers. So we need to go to uh, Redux folder. Let me close this. We go to Redux folder. We go to user, user slice. And here we're going to add three more uh, reducers for our update user. So this is going to be, for example, update user uh, start to track the loading effect, which is going to set the loading to true. And then we're going to have the update user success, which is going to have a state and action. And then the current user is going to be action dot payload, which we get uh, from the backend as a response. And also we set the loading to false. And also we set the error to null. If we have an error previously, we're going to set it to null. And finally, we're going to create the failure, which is going to have the state and action and a state that error is going to be action that payload. And also we want to set the loading to false as well. So we can use these three. We need to export them first. So we're going to export the update user failure, update user success, and update user start. So once we export them, we can use them inside the profile.jsx. So I'm going to close this. And then here at the top, I want to import them. So I'm going to import uh, these three update user and etc. We just say update user uh, start, which is coming from the Redux user user slice. And then we're going to have update user success and also update user failure. So once we, we have these things, and also we need to dispatch them, so we need to actually import another package, uh, another hook called use dispatch from React Redux. So I'm going to import that one too. So we just say import use dispatch from React Redux, and then we're going to initialize it. Always you need to initialize use dispatch. We just say dispatch equals to use dispatch. And then now inside the error, we can just dispatch the failure. We just say dispatch user update user failure and then we want to pass this error. So actually we need to pass the message. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but let me check this in the sign in, but we did. All right, we, we have just passed the error that message. So we just passed the error that message and instead of null, the error is going to be the error we get from the this error. So and then inside the try, we can do the request. First thing first, we want to dispatch the user a start. So the loading effect is going to start. And then we're going to create a response. We use a wait and fetch method. And the endpoint is going to be API post slash user post slash uh, update. And also, if you remember, we had an ID. We need to pass the ID too. So we can just use the back tick here. And then we just add the ID here at the end. So we just say post slash a dollar sign and uh, we just pass the current user that un underline the ID. So we have this one, uh, the current user and the ID is available there as well. So this current user actually we got from uh, using use selector. So this is the from the React uh, Redux, uh, Redux toolkit, we got this one. So once we have this one, we're gonna, first thing first, we wanna say the the method is going to be post method and then we're going to pass the header content type to be json because we are sending a json and then we're going to send the body and the body is going to be that form data if you remember there uh, we just save everything inside the form data so we can just send the form data so let's close this one so we don't get an error and also if we use a wait we need to change this to asynchronous okay and then after that we're going to check uh, first, we want to get the data by converting it to using the JSON. And then we just say if the data that success is false, we're going to dispatch the user failure. We're going to pass this uh, data. That's not data that message. Let me check in the sign in. Uh, yes, it's data that message. Okay. So data that message is going to be our error message. And we're going to return. So we're not going to go to the next line. And then if everything is okay, we're going to dispatch the user success and then we're going to pass this data okay now uh, i think it's time to test our application for example i want to change this one to uh, for example i change the end 
to this number. Let's click on update. And if you refresh the page, you can see that actually it is updated in the database. And also we can test it in the network. We can do it again. For example, I changed it to 333. And if you do the request, you can see we get the response with the new username. Let's test the check changing the email. For example, I just add a number one here and click update. Uh, we got another response with a different email. Let's change the password. For example, I choose something here. Uh, actually, the password is, uh, you can see the password. So the type is not, not correct here. So in the profile, the type for the password, it should be password here. I forgot to change this one, password. Okay, so we shouldn't see the password. And then when we click on update, we can see that now we got the same result because we don't have the password, but actually the response was okay. If you check here, yeah, it's okay. Uh, so that was successful. And also let's change the image. For example, I change it to this image. And then once we do update, we can see the new image. And if you refresh the page, we should see this image. And also in the avatar, here inside the header, we see the new image. So that is working as well. The other things I want to add is the loading effect. So when we click on update, I want to make it disable and also show loading, similar to the one we did for the signing page. So here, uh, if you remember, if we, did, we got the current user. We can get the loading as well, loading and error. And then inside the button, inside the, this button, we're gonna, instead of saying just update, I wanna create a condition. If the loading is true, we wanna see loading. Otherwise we wanna see updates. So now if you click, we can see the loading. And also we wanna make it disabled. So we can just say disabled and we pass this loading. So when it's loading, this is going to be disabled. So we cannot click on it. So that was it for the button. We wanna see the error as well. So we want to add some message at the end here inside the span. After this div, we want to see the uh, error. So we're going to have a paragraph. Uh, we want to show if there is an error, if there is an error, we want to see the error that I think we just want to see the error because it's already a message. And if there is no error, we want to just ignore. We just say empty string. And then we just add a class name for that. We just make the text to be red, 700, for example. And then we can add a just margin top of five for that. So let's try to get an error. Um, how, what we can do to get an error here. Uh, for example, if I remove the cookie, we should get an error. So uh, we go to application and inside the cookie, if you delete this cookie, we should get an error because we are not authorized. So let's try to update. As you can see, oh, we are still getting error handle is not defined. Why? Actually, I fixed this error. Maybe the error is still there. Let me, uh, let me sign out first again by deleting the local storage. And let's sign in again with my, one of my Gmail accounts. For example, this one. And here, uh, let's first update something. We can see that the username is updated. Now, if try to delete the cookie, and then we get the, we click on update. Okay, that seems like a, there's something wrong with the API still. So inside the controller, uh, user.jsx, our error handler is uh, imported at the top. So, so let's try it in Insomnia. Let's sign in again with a user. So the, this user, the email is changed to Sahan. Okay. And then uh, we can use this ID to update the user. So let's update its username. Okay. It's working. And then if we don't have the cookie, uh, so let's create an error here. For example, I change this number to three and send. So the error functionality is working actually here. That's fine. Inside the 
here, we, let's uh, change this inside the client side in the profile. Uh, let's, for example, I I just add a number at the end of the ID. So we have a uh, wrong ID here. And then let's uh, sign in again. Let's sign in again. And then what we do there is to try to update because the ID is wrong. We should get an error. Okay, the error here is fine. We just get, you can only update your own account. But when we don't have a cookie, we should get a different error actually. Okay, now I understand where we made a mistake. Okay, sorry about that. So inside the API, inside the utils in the verify user here, I didn't import the error handler. Okay, now I understand. So error handler from uh, error.js. That's fine. So now let's try again to delete the cookie. Where is the cookie here? Let's refresh the page. Okay, we delete this cookie now, and then we try again to update. Okay, now this time we are getting the correct unauthorized error. Okay, it's good we fixed that one. So, and then uh, what else we can do here? And also if the update is successful, I wanna get the message update, uh, user is updated successfully as well. So what we can do here inside the profile, we can add another piece of the state. We just say update success. And then we set this one first to be, and we can just say false, but we can just set it to be, um, I think you can use a false, it's okay. And then once everything is uh, correct and after the dispatch we're gonna set the update success to true and then at the end here we're gonna create another paragraph like this we want to make it green and then if the update success is true we're gonna say user is updated successfully otherwise it's going to be an empty a string let's test this one so now if we try to update something, for example, but actually we didn't fix that uh, problem here. I have just added this number in unsubmit, uh, this number, we're gonna fix this first. And then also we don't have the user because I deleted the, uh, I deleted the cookie. So we're gonna go to application again. I wanna delete the user because we don't have sign out functionality. I'm using it like that. So we need to delete this user and then we can just sign in again. Okay, now let's update. For example, I, another number. When I click on update, now we get up, user is updated successfully. So that was it for this part. So now we can actually add this one to the GitHub. So we have created, uh, updated three files. And then this message for this one is going to be complete update user functionality and then we can just commit and push so in in the next section we're going to add the delete user functionality so if you look at the final version we have the delete accounts when we click on it we're gonna sign out and also delete the user inside the database so see in the next section All right, in the last section, we have completed the update user functionality. In this section, we're going to add the delete user functionality. The first thing we need to do is to create the delete user API route. So we need to go to Visual Studio Code and we go to the API folder. We go to routes and we want to create this route inside the user.route.js. And we can just copy this one. And this is going to be delete. And also, this is a delete method. So we just change this one to delete. And also, uh, this one should be delete user. Let's create this function inside the controller. So we just go to user.controller.js and we cre create this function, delete user. Let's close this and then we can add it here. We need to import it at the top. Okay, so inside this, we're gonna first thing first, we wanna check because we wanna check the 
token first. So, and then we just want to say if the request.user.id is not equal to request.prems.id. So, prems is here. This is the prem. And then this user ID we are getting from the verify user here from the JWT. So if this one happens, we want to return an error using our middleware and a function. We just say you can only delete your own account. Okay. And otherwise, we want to create a try and catch a statement. And we just create the error here. And then inside the try, we want to delete the user. So there is a method. We just uh, use our uh, model. And then we use a method called find by ID and delete. And then we're going to use the parameters to delete that user. And finally, we want to just respond with the status of 200. And then with the JSON, we can just create a message here. User has been deleted. We can test this one first inside Insomnia. So here inside the user, I'm going to add, uh, or we can duplicate this one. And this is going to be delete user. And this is going to be delete as well. Uh, we don't need to send anything actually. And then we just can send. So cannot post here. So we're getting an error because the, it's not recognizing this URL, user delete. Let me check. So that is the user and this is a delete, delete. And then the ID, so API user delete. So that is correct. And then Let's see, we are getting an, so there's no error here. Uh, okay, so actually we have to change this post to delete as well. So let's try again. So you can see, I just put, I don't know what's the this ID. You just say you can only delete your own account. So we need to sign in first with a, one account, for example, this account, and then we can just get the grab this uh, ID, and then we delete the other account. So I'm gonna paste the ID here. So if we try again, you can see the user has been deleted. And then if you try again to sign in, we should get an error because this user not found because we have deleted it already from the database. So we have created this API route. Now we need to go to the client side inside the profile.jsx, inside the pages. And then we want to add an unclick event listener to this span saying delete account. We just uh, use this on click and then we just call a function called handle delete user. And then we need to create it at the top. So handle delete user. And then uh, first, uh, first let's close this. And then we use a try and catch a statement. And inside the error, we want to dispatch the error. So we need to create actually the reducers. So we go to Redux user, user slice. And then here I'm going to add that delete user. We just say start. And then we're going to add the success, which is making the current user to null. So that's the only difference. And there is no action for the delete success. And finally, we're going to have the delete failure, which is going to set the error to action dot payload. And then we're going to add this three here, delete user, delete success and delete the start. So we can just now dispatch you uh, delete user. So I'm going to, we have to import that. So it's just say delete user failure. So we import it at the top. Let me see. Okay. It's imported here. And then we want to pass that message. Just say error that message. And inside a try first, we want to dispatch the start, which is a delete user start. You need to import it. And then we want to create the request. We create the response, a wait, and then the forward slash API forward slash user forward slash delete. And also we need to pass the ID of the user like this. The method is delete. And we don't need to actually set any header or anything like that or form data. And then we get the response. If the response, the data, the success is false, we're going to dispatch the delete user failure and pass this message and return. And then otherwise, we want to dispatch the success. Dispatch user delete, uh, delete user failure. Sorry, uh, success. Delete user success. 
we need to import it and pass this data. So let's see what's this error. Okay, I need to close this here. So we should try it now. And also I wanna, before to try, I wanna add the, uh, uh, okay, so here we need to add some message or instead of message, because this is going to log out the user, actually, we don't need to see a message because the person is going to be redirected to the signing page. But for the error, uh, we just set the error, uh, this delete user failure, and also we, we are showing this error too here, actually. So we don't need to do anything for the error. So now let's try it again. Uh, let's refresh the page. And if I click on delete account, you can see we are redirected to the signing page because the person is logged out. Uh, let's see this one in action in the network. So let's sign in again with someone like this. So we go here, refresh the page, we clean this one. And then if I click on delete, we get this user has been deleted and with the status code of 200. So, and also if we check the application, we can see that the current user is null inside the local storage. And uh, let's see the cookie. Okay, we still have the cookie for the user. We can delete the cookie as well. Uh, uh, we can do that one by uh, going to, let's go to the API, controller, user.controller. After this one, we can just delete the cookie as well. So here, after the JSON, we can just say clear cookie. And then the cookie we want to clear is access underline token. Actually, even we don't delete clear the cookie, it's still that cookie is not valid because that user is deleted. And if they make a new account, they get a new ID. So that cookie is actually not valid, but we can clear, delete it by this method. Too. So let's try again. So we can sign in with Google. We choose this account. Let me clear this by refreshing it. So now we have a token. Let's delete the account. And then we refresh the page. Okay, we still have the cookie. Access token, access on the line token. Let's see, we are getting uh, some error here. Cannot set the header after they, they are sent to the client. Uh, okay, so th I think this response, we need to make it separate. Let's delete the cookie first. We just create a response here. Let's try again. So we have this cookie. Let's try to delete the account. Okay, now the cookie is clear. So actually, you have to make it before they're sending back the JSON. So that's a rule here. Uh, it said you cannot set, send the header after the response. So first you need to clear the cookie and then create the response, okay? So that was it for the delete user functionality. Let's add it to the GitHub. So, and then we just create a message, add delete user functionality. And we can commit and push to GitHub. So in the next section, we're going to work on the sign out button. You're going to sign up the user. It's very similar to the delete account. So see you in the next section. All right. In the last section, we have completed the delete account functionality. In this section, we're going to add the sign out user functionality. So it's very simple to the previous one. We just need to go to the, first we want to create the backend. So we go to the API, we go in this time, we go, we want to create it in the authentication. So we create a new route in the auth.route.js. So I'm going to add another router. And as we are not sending any data, we can just create a get request. And this can be, we just call it sign out. And then we want to call the function called sign out. So let's create this function inside auth.controller.js. So here we're going to export a function called sign out. Uh, and then we're going to import it here. Okay, it's very simple to do that actually. Uh, we just need to clear the cookie. That's it. So we just say, uh, we can add a try and catch a statement and then show the error if an error happened. 
And inside a try, you can just say response. We just say clear cookie. We clear the access underlying token. And then we can just create the response, which is the user has been logged out like this. And then we can just go to the front end, to the client side. Again, we go to the pages, profile.jsx. And then this time, we want to add the onclick event listener to the sign out button. We just call it handle sign out. And then we can just cre create this function at the top. So, and this is very, very simple as well. You just need to, we can just add a try and catch a statement. And this one should be a wait to because we need to wait for the response. And then we add a try and catch a statement. And here we just, uh, we can just console log or uh, we can just, uh, yeah, we can just create a dispatch and error too. So let me fix this one. This one is uh, not correct. Uh, this one should be a sync. Okay. Inside the try, we're going to just say await or you just say const response equals to await. We're going to create a request to API pro slash off pro slash sign out. And we're not going to send anything or the method is get. So we don't need to mention the method get. So default is get request. And also we can convert the response to JSON and say if the data is data the success is false, we're going to just return now. But we want to create this uh, sign out Redux as well, the reducer. So this is exactly the same. We can just copy this one and then change this to log out or sign out. So this is exactly the same. And then we can just export it. So inside the profile.jsx, we first we want to start. We just say uh, sign out s. Let me see what. Okay, sign out user s start. Let me copy this. So sign out user start. We're gonna dispatch this one. So we need to import it at the top, and also close this. And if there is a, it's not successful, we're going to dispatch delete user failure and we pass the message. And also we want to do the same things in the try and catch as well. And if everything is okay, we're going to dispatch the success. And so everything would be similar. So let's try this. So let me sign in again. Let me open the console. Let's refresh the page. We sign in with a user. And then we're going to, sign out. So when we click on sign out, we are redirected to the signing page. So we are log out successfully. And if we check the application, we go and uh, refresh the page, you see there is no cookie now. So the cookie is cleared as well. We can also check the network to be sure. So let's sign in again with another account. Okay, let's refresh the page. Let's clear this. And if you click on sign out now, we can see uh, in the response, we just get the user has been logged out. All right, that's it for this one. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So I'll just create a message. You just say add sign out functionality. And we can commit to uh, push. In the next section, we're going to work on the create listing section. So we're going to work on the API of the creating a new listing and also the UI of the create listing. And also we want to connect them together in the following sections. So see you in the next section. All right. In the last section, we have completed the sign out user functionality. In this section, we're going to work on a starting uh, creating the listing API route. So we want to create a new listing in our application. So if you look at the final version, as you can see, we have a button here inside the profile. So when we click on it, we can just be redirected to a new page. And here we can create our listing. But before creating the client side, we want to create the backend for our project. We want to create the API route for the create a listing. 
So let's go to Visual Studio Code. And we, first thing first, we need to go to index.js inside the API folder. And here we want to add a new uh, route. Let me copy this. And the new one is going to be listing. And this is going to be listing router. So we need to create this route in our application and then import it at the top. So we go to routes folder. We create a new route. We call it listing.route.js. And here we need to import express. So we import the express from express. And using this express, we're going to create a router. And the router is going to be equal to express.router with uppercase R. And then here we just say router. And the first one we want to do is to create a route, a, a listing. So this is going to be a post request. And then we just say if we, where the request is forward slash create, we want to create it. And once we do that, we want to call a function called create. So this, uh, or we can just create listing. And this one is going to be, we need to create it inside the controller folder. So we just go to controller and then create a new file. We call it listing.controller.js. And then here we're going to create our function. So the first function is going to be called create listing. And this is going to be synchronous because we need to wait for the response from the MongoDB. And then we're going to use the next to uh, middleware. We're going to use our middleware to handle the errors. So here, First, we close this, and then we just can use try and catch a statement. And in the catch, we're going to use our middleware to handle the error. We just say next error. And here inside the try, we're going to, uh, first thing first, I want to add this function here inside the route before I forget. So I'm going to import it here at the top. And this one should be listing.controller.js. And also inside the index.js, I need to import that router. So here, I want to import the listing router from forward slash routes forward slash listing dot route dot js. So listing router and uh, I think we already imported. So listing router, listing router. It's uh, correct. If we get an error later, we're going to fix it. And we need to add a comma here for creating a listing. And also we want to check if the person is authenticated or not. So the person cannot create any new listing if they are not authenticated. So we're going to use our verify token function from our file utils uh, verify user.js. We have created a function to verify the token of the user. So we need to verify the token and then create the listing. And let's continue this. Inside the try, we're going to create the listing. We just say listing. Uh, we just say await. We want to uh, now we need to create a model for the listing. So similar to the one we did for the user, we need to create a model for the listing as well and add the rules for that in our application. So let's go to models and here. So let me delete or let me complete this one so we don't get an error. So we just use the listing and then and we're going to use a method called create inside the listing and we need to pass this request.body, which is uh, the information we get from the browser. And now it's time to create this listing. And inside the models, we're going to create a new model called listing.model.js. Inside the model, we need to, first thing first, we need to import mongoose from mongoose. And then we want to create the listing schema. So we just say listing schema, and this is going to be equal to new mongoose.schema. And then uh, what we want to add, actually, uh, some rules that we want to add. The first one, so this is an object of rules. And then first, we want to have a name for our listing. So for the name, I just want to keep it simple. Just the type is going to be string. And then we want to make it required. After that, we want to have the description. So the type is going to be a string and then required as well. Then we want to have the address which is going to be the same, a string, and then required. After that, we have, the, we have two prices, regular and the discounted price. So we just say regular price. And the type for that one is going to be number. 
And then also this is going to be required. After that, we want to have a discount price or discounted price. It's, it's the same. And then here the type would be number and required. After the discounted price, we're going to have the number of bedrooms or bathrooms. So we just say bathroom, for example, we just say bathrooms type would be number and required. And then we have, we're going to have bedrooms. So after the bedroom, we're going to check if it's furnished or not. So we're going to say furnished and the type is going to be Boolean. It can be true or false and it is required. And then we want to say if it has a parking or not. We just say parking and then it can be true or false and required. So after the parking, we're going to set the type. So the type of the place, it can be a rent or sale. So the type is going to be string and require. And then we want to add the, is it an offer or not? We just say if it's an offer and it can be, this one should be the type of Boolean. And also it, it should be required. After the offer, we're going to have the image URL. So we're going to uh, uh, just uh, save the images inside the database, the URL of them. So we just say image URLs. And this is going to be an array because it has more than one image and then required as well. And also we want to know which user created this listing. So we want to add the user data. So we just say user ref here. And then the type for this one, uh, we just set it to be a string and required. So this is going to be a string and then required and that's it. So these are for our listing. And then we want to save the time of the creation and update. So we're going to add uh, time stamps true to save these two datas. And then after creating the schema, we're going to create the model. We just say const listing. So we call the model listing. We use the mongoose.model to create the model. And then we just set the name of the uh, this uh, one to listing, but this one should be like a singular and uppercase. And I'll, here we're gonna pass the listing schema that we have created here at the top. So after that, we're gonna export it as a default so we can use it in other places in our application. For example, now we have created this one, we can import it here inside the controller. And don't forget to add the .js in the backend so we, got, we don't get an error. So after the creation of the listing, we're going to return this listing. We just say return with the response of 201, which means something is created. And then we can just send back this listing. We can just uh, pass this listing. Okay. So that's it. We're going to uh, create the listing and send it back to the user. Uh, let's try to test it inside Insomnia. And if you have a problem, we can fix it that time. So we're going to create a new folder inside Insomnia. And this folder is going to be called listing. So the process is, you can see it's very similar. So if you have learned the previous part, definitely you can create a new part because it's completely similar. And then here we're going to create a new request, HTTP request. We're going to set the name of this request uh, to create a listing and this is going to be a post request let's create the address so localhost 3000 so i'm going to uh, just change the uh, auth to listing to because it's in the api forward slash listing forward slash create and then we're going to pass the data so the data we want to add it includes the name and uh, for example i just say test and then if you remember, we had the description. This one, we just said test as well. Then we're going to have the address. I just say test. So let me copy this one. So we're going to do the others quickly. So name, address, description, after description, uh, we have address. Then we're going to have the regular price and this is going to be a number for example we just uh, said 500 and then we can just copy this paste it here this is going to be the discount price after that we're going to have the number of bathrooms 
So this is going to be bathroom. We just say five bathrooms. The next one is going to be bedroom. Be actually, it's bathrooms and be bedrooms. And then we're going to have the furnished, which is a Boolean. So it can be true or false. So we just save true. And then we're going to have parking. As they, they are required, we need to add them, all of them. Otherwise, you can just ignore some of them. And then we're going to have the type. We just set it to be, for example, rent. After that, we're going to have the offer. We set this one to true. And then we're going to have the image URLs. So let me check if we use it correctly. So image URLs, yeah, that's fine. And then we're going to have the user ref at the end. So this one has, is an array. And then each array, we just have a URL, for example, something like that. Okay. And then we're going to have the user ref. So who created this? So don't forget this code. Because this is a JSON, you need to add the code here. And then this is going to be a string. So it can be any digits and numbers. So let's try and test it. So we click on send. Okay, server is not running. Which, which error we are getting? Let me check. So, okay, the error is here. Import listing router from uh, listing.route.js. The requested module does not provide an export name default. Okay. So the model, uh, uh, the router, the listing the route, we need to export this router. So export default router. So this is going to fix it. Okay. Now our server is running. So let's try again. Okay. Now you can see that we got the 201, which means something is created. And then the listing is here. So we have the name, description, everything. And this is an array. And also we have the time of creation and update because we have added the timestamp true. We got this information. And also the unique ID is created for the listing as well. Okay, that was it for creating the uh, listing, create listing API route. Let's add this one to the GitHub. Okay, and then we just create a message, create listing, or we just, Add create listing API route, and we can commit and push to GitHub. So that was it for creation the API route. In the next section, we're going to work on the uh, UI part of the projects. We're gonna create this UI, and then after that, in the following sections, we're gonna add the functionality, for example, the upload image and uh, create the listing functionality. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have created the create listing API route. In this section, we are going to create the UI of this page, the create listing page. And if you look at the final version, we can see that inside the profile page, we have a button saying create listing. And when we click on it, we are redirected to this page with the title create a listing and URL create dash listing. And here we can have all our inputs like name, description, address, the checkbox, the check mark inputs, and also the number of bedrooms, regular price, and etc. And also we have the ability to upload image. And we have two columns here, but in the small screen, we have one column. So we're gonna make this one responsive as well. So let's start by creating a button inside the profile page. So let's sign in with an account inside the final version. And then we go to profile page. Let me bring this one to the right side. And then we, here we go to profile.jsx inside the client SRC pages and profile.jsx. So here we're gonna have a button after this update button. So here we have this button. Actually, we don't need to create a button because we just wanna go to a different page so we can use the link tag from React Router DOM. So we just use the link and this link, we need to import it at the top. So we're gonna import link from React rather down like this. And then we go back and this is going to be 
uh, going to forward slash create listing. So inside this link, we're going to say create listing. And then we're going to have some uh, styling. So we're going to have a class name. So we can see the click this thing here. And then we're going to change the background color to be green, 700. And then we want to make the text to be white. We can bring it, uh, we can just add a padding of three. And also we want to make it rounded, large. And then we want to make it uppercase. And for bring it in, in the, in the center, we can use text center. And for the hover effect, I just want to add the opacity 95. So that's it for creating this button. So now we have the hover effect. And also when we click on it, we go to forward slash create listing. But actually we didn't create this page yet. So we need to go to Visual Studio Code. We go to pages. And here we're going to add this page. So we just call it create listing dot JSX. We can use RFC to create a React functional component. And then we need to add this one to the app.jsx. But this is a private, uh, actually, page. So we don't want a, sh a person who is not authenticated to see this create a listing page. So we're going to add it inside the private route, like the one we did for the profile page. So I'm going to copy this one. And then this is going to be create dash listing. So the path for that one is going to be this. And then the element is going to be create listing from here, from the pages folder. So we're going to import it at the top as well. So now you can see inside this create listing, we get this create listing. So now we're going to focus on the create listing page. So let me close ev everywhere. And then we just go to create listing page. I'm going to close this explorer section so we have more space here. And this step is going to be main. I want to make it SEO friendly. So I'm going to change this to main. And then here after the main, we're going to have a H1 saying create a listing. And then here we're going to style this real quick. So the text is going to be 3XL. So we make it bigger. We set the font to be semi bold. And also we want to create the, and we're going to, we're going to bring it to the center using text center. And also we want to add a margin uh, in the Y axis of seven. So that's it for creating the head header of this page, the heading of the page. After that, we're going to have a form and we don't have any action for this form. We're going to have a on submit later. So inside the form, we're going to have, if you remember, I said, we're going to have uh, two columns and for the mobile size, we want to bring the columns on top of each other, but in the bigger screen, we want to just bring them next to each other. So for this form, before starting, we're just going to change the flex uh, display to flex. And then we're going to say, make the flex column in the, mo uh, in the mobile size. So they're going to be on top of each other. And then in the, after the mobile size, after the small size, we just change the flex to row. And then inside this form, we're going to have a div for the inputs, for these inputs. Input one, uh, sorry, not this page, this one. Name, description, and address. So we're going to put them inside a div because we want to just add some, uh, like a, bring them on top of each other. And also we want to make them uh, full size. So inside the, the form, we're going to have a div. The first input is going to be the name so the type is going to be text let's add a placeholder so we can see it so the placeholder is going to be name and then let's add some styling like we i want to add some border and then let's add some padding of three and then we want to make it rounded large okay so we're going to have uh, an id for this one as well so we're going to have an id of name so we're going to track the changes later using this id and also we want to have the maximum length. So maximum amount of character you can type is going to be 62. And then minimum length is going to be, for example, 10. Also, we want to make this one required. So 
without having a name, we are not allowed to submit the form. So we're going to say it, make it required. So that's it for now. Later, we're going to add the un, uh, unchanged event listener. But just let me copy this one two more times using Alt Shift down arrow. So the next one is going to be a text area. And then the placeholder is going to be description. The, the type is text. Also, we have the same styling. And then we're going to have the idea of description. I think I made a mistake here. Description. So minimum and maximum, we don't need it for the description. That's fine. We can just remove that one. And this is going to be required. And finally, we're going to have uh, for the address. So the placeholder is going to be address. The name is going to be address. And then we're going to set... Uh, we don't need to set actually min minimum and maximum. That's fine too. This is optional. You can just modify it later. Just for simplicity, I want to keep everything simple. But you can make it better styling on and anything like that. So we're going to bring them on top of each other. We just say flex. And we change the flex direction to column. So after that, we're going to have a space between them. We just say gap 4. So I have some space between them. And then we're going to have... Uh, that is fine for this one. So actually, this this uh, div is going to have not only these inputs. I want to add these things too. So we're going to have this. This is the div on the left. So they're not, now we are styling. So we are going to have name, description, address, and then these check marks, and also the number of bits, bath, and the prices. And then we're going to have another div on the right side. Okay. So, and also when you make this one, uh, so this is going to be flex one because we want to these columns to have the same length. We have to specify the amount of flex. We just say flex one. So we're going to give flex one to this one and then we're going to have flex one to the other div as well. So now we're going to, because we don't have the other div, we see it like that. But in the small screen is okay. And also we want to add some padding for the whole pick, whole size, or uh, sorry, whole site, the, this page. So we're going to have a class name for the main one. We want to set the padding of three. So we're going to have a space. And also we want to set the maximum width to be four XL. So in the bigger size, we're going to limit it to this one. But what I want to do is to bring it to the center using MX Auto. So now it's in the center. Okay, so let's continue for this part. So we have just added these three inputs. Now we're going to have these uh, check marks or we check box, we can call it. So all these check box is going to be inside a div, but inside this div because we want to bring it here. So we're going to have another div and this one is going to have some uh, input as well. So we're going to have a div here for all of them. And also we're going to have a div for each of them because we want to have the check mark and also the name. So another div for that one. So this is going to be an input with the type of check box. Let's check it here. So we're going to have the check box here. And also let's style this one real quick. Uh, so this is going to be an I, uh, it has an ID of sale because we want to say it's sale or rent. So it, it's going to have an ID of sale. We're going to later, we're going to uh, track the, its changes. And also we want to add a class name of, we want to set the width to be five. So we're going to make it bigger a little bit. Okay. So this input is completed and then. We want to have the one span here saying sell. And this span, we want to bring them, uh, we want to add a space between them. So I want to bring them to the next to each other. We just add a flex here and then we just add a gap of two. So once we add the flex, you can see it's got uh, this width five is going to work here. So now we have this cell here. So uh, let me zoom this one a little bit. You can see it better. Oh, I think it's big enough for seeing. That's enough. And then we're going to have other ones like for the rent and parking. 
and etc. So we're going to have rent, parking spot, furnish, and offer. So I'm going to copy this one, this div, a few more times. And let me see how many we have. So one, two, three, four. So we need to copy it four more times. So one, uh, let me check this. One, two, three, four. So this is going to be rent. ID is going to be rent. The next one is going to be parking, parking spot. Or I think, yeah, parking spot. The next one is going to be furnished and offer. So the ID is going to be just parking. And then here we're going to have, so after the parking, we're going to have this. Uh, so let's open this one. So I'm going to uh, check it here. So furnished, after furnished, we, uh, furnished, the ID is going to be furnished. And then finally, we're going to have the offer. The ID is going to be offer as well. So we have created like them. And then we want to bring them next to each other. So the div that is covering all of them, we want to make it flex. And then after creating the flex, we can just add a a space between them we just say gap for example six and then we're gonna have flex wrap so if the screen is a smaller we're gonna bring the some of them in the next line so only four can be a state here so we're gonna have like that so this is exactly like the final version so after this the check boxes we're going to have these inputs as you can see we have a div one is the input with the type of number and also where one is the span just saying the title it's so it's very simple similar so outside this div that is covering all the check boxes we're gonna have another div that is going to cover these things so we're gonna have another div and inside the div so we're going to have another div that is covering each of them like this okay so the first one is going to be an input of number the ID is going to be bedroom, bedrooms. We set the minimum to be one and maximum, for example, a bed, uh, a house with the 10 bedrooms. Okay. And then we want to make it required. So after that, we're going to have a span here, or uh, we can just add a span or a paragraph. It doesn't matter. We just create a span saying, or uh, let's create a paragraph. We just say bits. So now we should see something here like that. So let's add some styling. So for the class name, for the input, we're gonna have padding of three. And then we're gonna have, uh, what we can add here is we're gonna add a border. And then we set the border color to be gray, 300. And then we wanna make it rounded large. So this is going to be like that. And then we want to bring them next to each other. So we just add a flex here. And then we bring, uh, we just bring them vertically as uh, like aligned with each other. We just say item center. And then we can have, have a, a space between them by gap two. So now we can just copy this one two more times for the bath and the prices. And also if we have an offer, we're going to have a discounted price too. So we're going to consider that one as well. So it, I'm going to copy this one two more times. Sorry, three more times to be able to do that. So let me choose this again. And then, so one, two, three. So the next one is going to be bath. So, and then, so baths, minimum, maximum is fine. But ID is going to be bathrooms. Type is going to be a number. And then we're going to have the next one, which is regular price. So the ID is going to be regular price. And then here, the last one is going to be discount price. Or discounted price. The ID is going to be discount price. Also, we have this dollar per month if we are doing the rent. If we do sell, we don't see that one. So we're going to make it condition later. But let me add this dollar per month first. So instead of just putting the paragraph here, I want to put it inside a div. And then inside this div, we're going to have this uh, regular price. And also we're going to have another spam saying dollar per month in a parenthesis. 
we just say dollar per month so let's see we are getting okay and then we're gonna install this expand and this is going to be with the text of x small so let's add this one to the other one as well so we're gonna copy this we add a div here we bring them inside and then i want to paste that spam here too so let's uh, see our uh, so this is working as well so we're gonna install this one a little bit so we need to align them so we add a flex flex column to bring them on top of each other and also we want to make it item center so we're gonna they're gonna be centered like this so we're gonna copy this class name and add it to the other one here so that's it for here we're gonna bring them next to each other all of them so i'm gonna choose this and then make it flex we can use the same trick here we can use flex wrap when we have a bigger things so like uh, we can just say flex wrap so when we have a we don't have a space we're gonna be like that and then also we want to add a gap of six so we're gonna have a space between them so this is going to be like that and then in the bigger size we're gonna see it like this so that is actually nice after creating the left column we're gonna start with the right column which uh, includes this image input and also the button so if you remember, we had a div that is covering everything on the left side. So I'm going to close this one so we can have focus on the other div. So this div, first thing first, we want to uh, add a flex here, flex column, because the, the contents are on top of each other. And then we're going to have the flex one. So equal a space for the this div and this div, left and right. And then... We're gonna have a paragraph. This paragraph is going to say images equal, and then so after that we're gonna this is gonna this is going to have uh, we want to make it font semi bold, and then and also we're gonna have a span like this uh, final version. Let me bring the final version. So they have images, and then we have a span saying the first image will be the cover and max six so inside this paragraph after the images we're gonna have that uh, another span saying the first image will be the cover max six and then we're going to install this span in a different way we just uh, add font normal Okay, and then we're gonna set the color to be text gray, uh, for example, seven seven hundred or six hundred, and then we can add a margin left of two, for example, to add a space here. So that was it for this section, and then we're gonna have another div which is going to include this uh, input and also a button saying upload. So we're going to have a div. And inside the div, we're going to have the, an input with a type of file. And then the ID is going to be images. Then this one is going to accept only images. So we just say image for slash star. And then we want to accept multiple images. So it's going to be more than one up to six. And then let's, uh, and after this input, we're going to have a button saying submit or upload. So uh, let's install this button. So let's see it now in the final version. We have it here. So for the input, we're going to have a class name. And this is going to be padding3. And then we're going to have border. We set the border color to be gray. It's 300. And we make it rounded. And then we're going to have width of full. So we're going to make it full size. For, for the button, we're going to have a class name of padding 3. And then we're going to have text green 700. We're going to make you bring a border for that. 
So the border color is going to be green too. So we just say border green and then we set it to be 700. The same color. And what else we need to add here is to make it rounded. And also we make it uppercase. When we hover over it, we want to make a shadow effect. And we set the shadow to be large. And also when we disable it, we want to set the opacity to be 80%. So we can see now when we hover over it, we see a shadow effect. And now it's time to bring them next to each other. So in this step, we want to set, set it to be flex. And also we want to add a gap between them of four. So and also inside this div uh, with the, uh, that is covering everything, we're going to have a gap too. We want to have a gap of four. Okay. There are still two connected to each other here and there. So what we need to do is to actually to go to the top div uh, that is covering everything. And then we're going to fix so the, the form that is covering everything, I want to just add a gap here too. So we just say gap four. Okay, so now we have enough space and it's nice. In the bigger size, they are next to each other. You can see, we can choose the images here, file our image, and then we have this button. And finally, we want to add the, the other button, the create listing button. So we're going to have a button inside this form, but at the end. So at the end of the form, we're going to have a button. And we just say, uh, this is going to be update list or create list. So let's uh, install this real quick. So we have the button at the here. So let's add, let's add a class name to it. Uh, this is going to be with the padding of three. We are going to have a background color of slate 700. We're going to have a text of white. So, and then we want to make it rounded large. And then after that, we're going to have to make it uppercase. Uh, when we hover over it, we want to create the opacity of 95. And also when we disable it, we want to have the opacity of 80. Okay. So now, uh, as you can see, they're, they're like this. I think we didn't uh, actually, yeah. this button should be inside this div, not outside. So when we bring it one more uh, uh, line up inside this div, this is going to be under there. Okay, now it's okay. So let's see, it, it, it is exactly a, uh, similar to the final version. So that's okay, I think that's good enough. And then, so let's add this one to the GitHub. So this is going to be complete. Create listing page UI, and we can comment and push. So in the next section, we're going to work on this upload functionality. So we have to be able to upload any image up to six, and we're going to handle all the errors related to it. For example, we want to limit it to six images, and also we want to see the images after upload under this uh, input. So see in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the create listing page UI. In this section, we're going to work on the upload image functionality. So the first things we need to do is to add the and unchange event listeners. So when, when we choose some the files here, we're going to set them inside a piece of state and store these files. So we go to Visual Studio Code and we just need to go to that input with the type of file. And here we're going to add an event, unchanged event listener. And then we just get the event here. And then we want to set, uh, we want to create a piece of state first at the top. So here I want to create a piece of state. So sorry, no, it should be here. And then we just say files. And the initial value would be an empty uh, bracket because we need to have different images because this is a multiple image. So we're going to set the files to the images we have here, which is coming from either target.files. 
So now we have the files. Let's console log the files. We check. So let's, uh, I think uh, we didn't import the use state. Okay. Now, if I open the console, if you choose some files, for example, I think I have some files here. For example, I choose three images. As you can see, we get here three files, and then here we see the three files. We have saved it inside this piece of state. Okay, so that was the first step. Now we want to store these files inside the, our uh, storage sent platform, which is Firebase. So we need to have an unclink event listener to this button. So when we click on it, we want to submit these files that we stored. And this is going to call a function called handle image submit. So we need to create the function here at the top. So let's delete this console log. And then we create this uh, function with the name handle image submit. This is going to be, actually, we don't need it to be asynchronous because we need to call another function inside that. So here, first we want to prevent the default behavior. Actually, it's uh, inside a form. Uh, if you remember, there is another form, and then this is inside there. And if because it's inside a form, I just want to change its uh, type to be a button. So we, I, we don't want to submit the this form. We don't want to submit the overall form. We just want to upload these images. So I'm going to remove the type to be button. So now let's go back to the function. So we don't need this actually the prevent default one actually because we are not inside a form and we are not submitting it. And then what we want to do next is to create a condition. We just say if the file size is more than, is the file length is more than zero first, we want to be sure that if there is a file and then after that we want to upload them because otherwise we're going to have uh, more than zero. And also we want to actually the, this one be less than seven because we want to set the maximum uh, amount of images to six. Then what we want to do, we want to create a promises here. Promise. Okay. So what I mean by promise, because we are going to upload not only not only one image we want to upload more than one image so we're gonna actually uh we, we're gonna have more than one asynchronous behavior so we need to wait for all of them so one by one images should be uploaded to the uh, storage and then we're gonna get them here so first uh, so we're gonna return a promise more than one promise so we're gonna set it as an empty bracket and then Based on the length of the files, we want to call a function and do it. For example, we just say for, if we want to create a for loop, which is going to start from zero. And then this is going to be less than the number of uh, files. And then we're going to increment it one by one. We just say I plus plus. And then what we want to do, we just say promises that push. We want to add the new promise to this empty bracket. And then here we want to call a function which is going to be, for example, we can call it a store image. And then we're going to upload the first, uh, this I file. So because we're going to have, for example, three files, and this is going to be zero, one, and two, the index. So after that, uh, let's close this actually. So actually we, we need to create this function. So this function is actually is going to be asynchronous. So we just say cons a store image, which is asynchronous because we need to wait for the response from the storage. And we're going to pass this one, the each file, because here we're going to create a full loop, a for loop. And this is going to start from zero, one, two, depending on the number of files. And then once each, for each file, we want to send the file and store it. The rest is going to be similar to the one we did for the upload user functionality. So here we're just gonna upload it. So we're gonna close it. And then, so this is going to return. We wanna get the information here. So we're gonna return a new promise because we need to wait. And this is going to gives us result, which means the 
uh, we get the information back or reject for getting an error. And also, so we want to close this. And then here, we're going to do the same things we did for the uploading the images. For example, we want to create the storage, uh, which is going to be get a storage. And then we need to pass the app, which is from the firebase.js file. We need to import get storage too. So we're going to import get the storage from Firebase forward slash storage. And also we need to import app from Firebase JS file. And then once we create the storage, we need to create the file name, which is going to be equal to this file, that name. And also we want to make it unique. So we just say new date and then we get the time. Just say get time. We add a plus here. So this is a unique name. And then we're going to create the a storage ref which is going to be cons a storage ref equals to ref, which is coming from Firebase forward slash storage. We're going to pass the storage that we have created and also the file name. After that, we're going to create the upload task. So this is going to be equal to, if you remember, we, we were using upload bytes resumable from Firebase storage. I'm going to pass the storage ref and file. Now we're going to get that upload task that on. We don't want to track the percentages actually, so we don't want to do the, that part we did before. But here we're going to pass the a stage change. So let's close this one so we don't get an error later. So this is going to give us the snapshot for storing the actually the progress, but we don't need it to actually add it here because we are not uh, getting the progress. Okay, because it's not only one file, it's more than one file. You can do it for yourself and make the, your application more nice. But I feel this is already a great application. And if you look at the final version, you can see that if you choose the images and then upload them, so we see the loading effect there. And also you see all the images after that. So the progress is not needed because we are adding a loading effect to the button. Okay, so let's continue. So we're going to is skip the, the progress, checking the progress. We just want to check the, get the error. If there is an error, we want to, uh, what we want to do is to reject with error because we have reject the gap re resolve. And after that, if there is no error, we want to get the URL. So here we're going to have, we're going to use the get URL method. So here we just say get download URL which is coming from Firebase forward slash storage. And then this is going to take the upload task dot snapshot dot ref. And then we, this is going to give us the download URL. And then here, we just want to resolve. We return this URL. Okay. So let's uh, close this parenthesis too. I think it's fine now. So we get the download URL. Now, so all the download URL are going to be stored in this promises. Now we want to save these download URLs inside a piece of state. And as we have more than one piece of state, more than one variable inside of our application, like name, description, and etc., we want to create a form data. So here I'm going to create a constant. We just call it form data. So this is going to be a user state the React hook, and then we need to add some initial values for that. So for the images, image URLs, we just create image URLs, and then the initial value would be an empty bracket or an empty array. So here after that, after the pushing all, everything in the promise, as we are waiting for the response, so after this four, we just, we have to, we just say promise, dot all because we need to wait for all of them actually and then this is going to wait for everything like uh, we have uh, all of them all the files inside the promises which uh, we, we got it from the store image and then we get the url for each of them and then we want to set the form data keep the previous information like the username email password sorry username name description 
and other things about the listing. And also we want to save the image URLs, which is going to be each of these URL. Actually, we get all of them because this promise finally bring us the, all the information. So we need to test it and see it in practice. Otherwise, it's very hard to understand. But I want to wait until we are able to do it. And then I don't want to add replace everything. I want to keep the previous images inside the form data. And then I want to add the new one that is added. So here... Uh, we keep the previous form data and then we just say image URLs equals to form data. And then we just say form data. Uh, what happens? Form data and then image URLs. And then we want to add the new URLs to the previous one. And we are using a con concat method to add the new one to the previous one. So it's a kind of uh, array. And then we add a new member to that array. So finally, let's uh, close this one and uh, make it. So here we need to close this parenthesis. I think it's ready to be tested. So I'm going to console log the form data. So let's go to our application. So let's refresh the page. As you can see now, uh, we just have image URLs, but an empty because this initial value is an empty array. So let's choose some images. For example, I choose two images. And then once we click on upload, okay, we are getting an error. Uh, this is asynchronous. All right. So it turns out that we need to actually add that snapshot, even we don't want to add the prompts. So here we just uh, get the progress and then we just console log the progress and then we close this one. So without this one, actually, it doesn't work. I thought it's going to work, but it's fine. So let's try again. And then we just choose two images. And then if you click on upload, as you can see, the first image is uploaded and the second one too. And also our form data. Now we have image URLs with two array and we have two images here, which is uploaded to Firebase. So we can just copy this one and then paste it here and see the images here. So that's working actually, but we want to see the loading effect. And if an error happens, we want to see the error as well. So we're going to create a new piece of state here at the top. And then we just call it image, image upload error. And then this is going to be, uh, we can set it to be null at the beginning, or we can just set it to be false and then make the message later. And then we're going to have, after we get all the premises here, we got the URL. At the end, we want to get the, Error. We can cache the error. So after uh, after this image, actually, we're gonna set the error, image error to false because uh, if there is an error previously, we wanna remove that error, and then we wanna get uh, cache the error, and then we set the image error to true, or we wanna set the image. We can just create a message here instead. We can just say uh, image upload failed and then we can just say uh, two megabyte max per image so we can just write down this error we need to close this also if someone uploaded more than uh, choose more than six images here so this one should be files uh, files that length and also we want to add that form data we just say form data dot image URLs dot length together should be less than seven. And if this one uh, doesn't happen, we want to warn them as well. So we just say, otherwise we have to say, set the image upload. You can only upload six images per listing. We create this error. Okay. So now we should test if we, we can handle the error. So let's delete this. And also we want to show the error here. I forgot to do it. So after the button, and also outside this div, we're going to create a paragraph and we just say if there is an error or uh, the, uh, the file, uh, the piece of state was image. If there is an up image upload error, then show that error, image upload error. And then also we can make that a red color. So we just say text red, for example, 700. Let's see. 
For example, I don't choose any file and then upload. We should get an error. Okay, we are seeing the error outside. So I think I put it in the wrong place. Okay, this is outside this div. I mean the div after this here, before the button. Okay, so you can see that we are getting an error. You can only upload six images per list, per listing. Uh, let's make this one a smaller, just a text as small. So, and also if I choose more than six images, so this is, a, I think, eight files. If I click on upload, you can see we are getting an error. You can only upload six images per listing, listing. and nothing is uploaded. Let's delete. So we, we let's test it again because the error was there before. I want to be sure that it's working. Okay, now we are getting that error. So let's test uh, again. For example, I just choose uh, three images and then I upload. So it's uploading and then the error is gone. Okay, now we have the three images. So we want to show these images here so the person knows that it is already uploaded or not. So after this uh, error, after this error, we're going to have say if uh, form data dot image urls is more than zero then we want to show uh, we want to map through it so we just say form data that image urls that map we get each url and then we're going to create an image tag with this url and then alternative is going to be a listing image so this is kind of styling we get let's see if it's working or not i'm going to change the styling in a minute so we're going to upload them and then we see the upload here, the images. But I don't want to see it like this. I want to see the image actually name. Uh, the, and also I want to create a button to be able to delete the image. So here, instead of this image, I want to add, first thing first, I want to add, let's add a div. And inside the div, we're going to have the image. The source is going to be the URL we get. So the alternative is going to be listing image. And then we're going to have a style for that. We set the width to be 20, height, sorry, 20, height to be 20. And then we want to uh, change the object to be contained. So we're going to keep the step aspect ratio. And also we want to make it rounded large. And then after this image, we're going to have a button, which is going to say delete. Okay, I think that is enough. We don't need to add the name of this one. And also for this div, let's bring this one to the left side so we can see the changes. So let's style this real quick. So we want to bring them next to each other. So here we should say flex. And then we want to use justify between to add a space between them. And then we can use padding treat to add some padding around them. And also I want to add some border for this. And then we can just use item center to align them centrally. Uh, and then for the button, we can just say padding tree. We want to make the text to be red 700 and also I want to make it rounded large uppercase we have a hover effect of opacity 95 so I think that's enough for this or we can increase this hover effect to for example 75 okay that's better I think that's enough to see the image we don't need to see the image name and Let's test it again. So if we refresh this page, we shouldn't see any image. And then if we try to upload, for example, two images, and then we see two images. And also if I want, if I try to add, for example, now five images, I, I'm not able to do it because we already have two images inside the form data. So as you can see, we are getting an error. You can only upload six images per listing. Now we can add the functionality of deleting. If I click delete, I want to delete this one from the form data. So when we click on this button, the delete button. So first I want to actually type, uh, change its type to button. And also we want to add an unclick event listener, which is going to 
uh, just we just say handle remove image and then we want to pass the index of the image so and how we get the index we can get the index in this map so we get the url and also we can get the index and also we need a key for this one because we are using map you need always to have a key so we add a key and the key is going to be that url which is unique so we just we just need to create this function the delete function i'm gonna add it at the end i just say handle remove image we get the index as the input actually we don't need uh, any event here and then once we get the input we want to set the form data and then let's close this first what we want to do we want to at first thing first i want to keep everything inside first and then i want to just filter it what i want to do i want to remove the one that has this index so the filter method is going to give us the urls again but we want to just keep the urls that does not match this index so we want to remove them like this and also if we we don't need to keep the url here we can just add underline because we don't we are not adding that so we just focusing on i if we are changing the url we need to add it but we don't need it we just add underline which means never okay so now let's try again i upload three images <coughs> it seems like we are getting an error okay let's try again i'll just upload two images okay it's working and then we should see the images now okay it seems like it's deleting itself without even i click on the button so let's check again so on the delete button uh okay i think we we just need to add here we we need to create a callback function because otherwise gonna call this function even without clicking so let's try again i choose two images upload them okay now we see the images i want to delete for example this one i just click on delete and this is deleted so only we have one image now if i want to add another image another two image for example this is going to be added at the end like this you can delete for example this one so it's working fine but we don't have any loading effects so we are not we don't know that actually it's uh, uploading or not so we're going to add another piece of a state at the end at the top let's delete this uh, okay i'm gonna create another piece of state for loading effect we just say upload let me just we can call it uploading and this is going to be false and then what we want to do we want to add it to the button the, this button which is going to say upload and here we just say when it's uploading just say uploading and otherwise just say upload and then we want to disable it as well when while it's uploading okay now let's try it again so if i choose three images and i click on open and then i click upload uh, i didn't add the set uh, loading true so we need to go to this function that is uploading here so here at the promise when we just create the this before the creating this promise here at the top we can set the loading to true uploading to true and also we want to set the uh, an error to false too so if an if we have an error previously we can remove that and also when the an error happened we want to set the loading to false too and also we want to here too there is an error we want to set the loading to false oh sorry here uh, we don't need to do it actually we need to wait everything if there is an error in one image it's fine we want to keep continue but if there is a, an error for all the images we want to set it so we set it loading uploading to false here as well so let's try it again so i'm going to upload two more images so we see the uploading effect and then this is disabled okay now we have more images but still we are seeing the uploading we need to when the uploading is done we need to create this one to false so uh, okay here when the uploading is completed we need to say set loading false but for each 
image, I don't want to set the loading too fast. This is the way uh, we don't need to do the loading too fast. Okay, we can leave it here as well. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it's actually, we can test it later. So let me choose two images, upload. Okay, now we don't have a loading effect. So let's try to get an error. For example, I choose a video to upload a video and also an image together. So when we upload, okay, we get an error for this one, but okay. So it seems like when, when we do two files uploaded, even one file is uh, has a broken, we get an error. So that's fine. So, uh, so th that's it for the image upload functionality. In the next section, we're going to work on getting all these form datas added to the form data and submit finally the all information in the database. So let's add this one to the GitHub as well. So this message would be complete. Uh, upload listing images functionality. So we can commit and push to GitHub. So see you in the next section for completing this page and uh, complete this create listing page. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the image upload functionality for the listings. In this section, we're going to complete the form data. We want to get the information and submit it to our database. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And here in the top, first, we want to complete the form data. We just have the image URLs. We want to add the other inputs as well. We want to create the initial value, for example, for the name. I want to set it to be a string for the description as well. And then we have the address for the sale. I want to set the initial value to uh, not sale. We don't have sale actually. We have type. For the type, the initial value must be rent. And then bedroom, just one bedroom. Bathroom, we have regular price. We set it to be zero. Discount price to be zero. And then we want to have that uh, offer and we set it to be false by default. We set the uh, parking to be false and also furnish to be false as well. And I think that's it for the our variables. Now we need to actually add the event listener to each input, like the name, uh, description, address, and etc. So, I want to create a function here at the uh, bottom before the return. I'm going to create a function. I'm going to call the function handle change. And then this is going to be equal to here. And then uh, let's close this. I just want to create the function so we don't get an error. After creating the function, we want to add the, this function for each input. For example, for this, let's open this div so we can see all the inputs. For example, for the name, we change, we add an unchange event listener, which is going to call that handle change function. And also we want to set the value to be the form data dot name. So now if we check our application, the name is an empty string, but if the initial value, let's delete this first. If the initial value was, for example, sand, we, we could see the sand. So we want to change its uh, value of everywhere. And then now we cannot change the value of this one because the value is set, but we want to change it using that unchanged event listener. So let's bring this one back to that empty string and we keep continue completing our inputs. So we have the ID of name, we have the value of form data that name, and also we have unchanged event listener, which is calling this function. For the text area, we do the same things, unchanged. And also we set the value to form data that description. And also we have for the address, let's add it. We can do it for a sale and rent, but this is a little bit different. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here we just add the unchanged event listener, which is going to call the handle change function. But we want to say this one must be checked, must be checked if 
if the type a form data dot type is equal to cell or sale okay so if inside our form data the type is cell we're gonna check this one so what i mean by check is uh, when we click on it it's gonna check it okay but now i cannot check this one because the form data the initial value is rent so for the rent we do the same thing so let me bring this one down and then we're gonna add an unchanged events listener and then we set the check to form data the type equals to rent. Now, if you check our website, you can see the rent is already checked because the initial value is rent. So for the parking, we add an unchanged event listener. And also we want to check it if the form data that parking is true. For the furnish, it's similar. So handle uh, which we're going to check, uh, check mark that if the form data that furnish is true. For the offer is exactly the same. So we just do the unchange. And if it's offer is true, we're gonna check this one. So now uh, we have done with these inputs. The next input is the bedrooms. So this one is going to be similar, the unchange. And also the value is going to be form data dot bedrooms. So now if you check our website, you can see the bedroom is one because the initial value was one. And also we're going to have the, for the bathroom. So the value is form data that bathrooms. The next one is regular price. So we're going to have an unchanged here. And also we're going to have the value, which is form data that regular price, which the initial value is zero now. So it's set it to be zero. Uh, we need to change actually it's minimum and maximum price. So the minimum for the regular price, we set it to be for example, $50 and the maximum, we just make it, uh, for example, $1 million, something like that. Okay. So, and also if we set the minimum to 50, we can change the initial value to 50. That is fine too. So both of the regular and discount, I just put it 50 for the min, uh, initial value. So here we should see 50. Okay. So what is the next input? So here after the regular price, we have the discount price. So we have unchanged and also the value is going to be form data that discount price. And then uh, for the images is fine. We don't need to do any initial value, but for the, you know, also we are tracking the changes in image. So image is completely independent. And also after the image, I think it's fine. We already, we have completed everything. So. Now we have name, description, address, the checkboxes, and also the number of bedrooms and bathroom, a regular price and discounted price. So what else we want to do? Uh, now we want to track the changes. We want to complete this unchanged event, uh, this function. But we're going to have some condition because we have different types of inputs here. Some inputs are Boolean. Some people, some inputs are values. Some people are some inputs are numbers and some of them are text. So we need to create some condition. We just say if e dot target target dot id is equal to sale or is equal to rent. So there's so the type uh, you know the the inputs we have for the type it has a sale or rent. So if this one happened, any of them we do, we set the form data, we keep the previous information, and then we just set the type. And what is the type? So type can be, sorry, the type variable we have as an input, it can be sale or rent. So for example, if I now test our application, when I click on sale and rent, we're gonna change this one. So uh, if you check the console, let me refresh the page, and also we need to console log the form data. I can, yeah, we already have the console log for form data. So if we change the cell, we have to see that now type is cell. And if you click on rent, the type is rent. Okay, so that was for the first part. So we have done for the first part. Let's go back to our unchange, handle change function. So after this condition, we want to create another condition. We just say 
if e dot target is equal to parking. So we're gonna because the parkings are true or false. Furnish is true or false, and offer is true or false. Too. So we're gonna uh, do the, that one. So we're gonna say if the e dot target is parking, furnish or offer. We want to set the form data, keep the previous information inside the form data, and then we want to set the e dot target dot id, which can be parking, furnish, or offer to be equal to e dot target dot check. So e dot target dot check can be true or false. So in this case, parking is going to be true or false, furnish or offer. So we're going to track these three options, and then we're going to close this as well. So let's test that one too. So let me clear this. For the parking spot, when I click it, now we should see the parking is true. When we uncheck it, now the parking is false. We can do it for furnish. So furnish now is true. And offer, we can see the offer is true. So we are tracking now. We check boxes are uh, finished. So the only difference was because uh, we had three check boxes with true and false values. So we did it like that. And these two were not true and false. They add the value. So we need to track it in a different way. After that, we're going to cover all, everything else. So instead of doing this one, we just say bedroom, bathroom, and regular. We just say if e.target.type. So the type of this e.target can be number or text or uh, text area. We just say if it's number, if this one is number, or if it's text, or this one is text area, we want to set the form data, keep the previous information, and we set the e.target.id, which can be, for example, name, or description, or uh, text area. We're going to set it to e.target.value, the value of that. And the reason we are adding the bracket here is we just want the name of this e.target.id. So this one, instead of, uh, if we don't do the bracket, this one is going to be, for example, uh, name like this. But when you do the add the bracket, this one, instead of this one, is going to be name. Okay. So the reason we are adding bracket is to get the variable instead of the value. Okay. So let's test now. Let's clear this. And then I'll, I just want to change the name. For example, I just say Sahan. Actually, the name doesn't make sense. You should just say title, but it's fine. Uh, the listing. So the name is uh, Sahan. Okay. The description, we can add something here. And you can see the description and also the address. So, and then when we Clear, we see that everything is the initial value. So we are tracking everything. Uh, let's see the regular price. So the regular price is okay, 65. And this one, we just change it to 500, for example, 505. Okay, everything is working. And as you can see, the, sometimes this one shows as a string and sometimes is a number, okay? So this is going to make a conflict in our, actually the MongoDB is going to automatically get the information for us as the number. So we are not worried about that one, but if you want to fix that one, uh, you can add more like a condition and convert the number to the, convert the string to number for the inputs. Now that we have all the information inside the form data, we can submit the form form to the, our database. So what we can do is to add an unsubmit event listener to this form. And then we're going to call a function called handle submit. And then we're going to create the function here at the top. We just say handle submit. First, we just set the e that target it, the e that prevent default. So we're going to prevent refreshing the page. And then we're going to have, uh, we're going to request for the database to add this form data. So after here, we're going to have a try and catch a statement. And in, inside the error, we're going to create a piece of state for tracking the errors. So let me create, create this one. So this is going to be, uh, we just call it error. 
and we set the initial value to false. And also we want to add some loading effect as well. So we just want to have loading. And also we can just change its name to make it uh, more specific. For example, we can just say error. Oh, it's fine. Error and loading. So we're going to know that meaning here. So let's go back to the function. So before here, we're going to set the error to set the error to error that message. And also we set the loading to false. And inside the try, we're going to create, uh, first we want to set the loading to true. And then set the error to false. So we're going to uh, remove the previous error. And then we want to create the information. We want to get the response. We used the fetch uh, method. We just say API forward slash listing forward slash create. And then we're going to, first we want to set the method to post. Uh, we set the headers to content type application JSON. And then we want to send the body, which is JSON, the screen, a stringify form data. So we're going to send the form data like this. And also if we are using await, we should use a synchronous function. And then after that, we're going to convert this one to JSON, our response. And then we set the loading to false. And also if the data that success is equal to false, a success is true. No, sorry. If it's false, we want to make an error. We just set the error to data.message. So everything, I think it's fine. And also we want to show this error and loading effect as well. So for the button, for the main button, instead of saying create listing all the time, we just say lo if it's loading, we just say creating. And then otherwise we just say create listing. Okay. And then if there is an error, we want to show it here. Uh, so we, if there is an error, we want us to create a paragraph and show the error here with the text 700 red and also the small value. So let's try this. Uh, so we have the form data. We need to, if we now submit the form, we get an error because we need to fill the name, description, and address. So we, here we just say new listing. And now let, let me copy this one for description and address. So we're going to have a parking furnish. Let me just test this. Oh, we cannot change the discount price. Okay. What's happened? It doesn't go more than 10. So the, uh, we didn't change the discount price minimum and maximum. So the minimum is going to be 50 and the maximum is going to be $1 million. Okay. Or make it 10 million because there are a lot of homes more than 1 million. Okay, that makes more sense. So the discount value should be less than the regular value. And then we need to upload an image. So let's upload them first. So let's click on create listing. So we're getting an error. Use ref is required. So actually when we are uh, sending, we need to... Uh, send the user ref to because we want to know which person is creating that. So we need to come back to the function uh, here. Instead of sending only form data, I want to send the form data and also I want to send the user ref, which is going to be equal to that current user we have. And then we want to get this ID of the current user, which is underline ID. Let's see if we have the current user at the top. Okay, we don't have a current user, so we need to bring the use selector first. Selector, which is coming from React Redux. Uh, oh, sorry, this one should be import. And then we're going to initialize it here. We just get the current date, uh, current user, which is uh, we can get it from the user state. So Okay, so we sent the data. Where is the handle submit? Okay, so user ref, we have the user ref now. Let's try again. Okay, we just leave it like that. We just upload an image. So we just create 
a listing. So it's creating now. And if we check the network, we can see that we got the listing back from the database. So they are stored in the database. So that's a good sign. So we did a good job, but there are some problem here we need to tackle. For example, if the, we have an offer, we should see the discount price. And also the, the value of the discount price must be less than the regular price. So it cannot be more than that. Otherwise, we have a negative discount. And uh, what else we need to do? For example, if there is no image, we don't want to create listing. So we're going to make an error for that one as well. So we can fix that one easily. For example, in other things is uh, when we have a sale, we don't want to see that dollar per month as well. So everything we need to create some condition. So uh, one by one, we can tackle them. For example, if there is no image, we don't want to submit the form. So here, we want to create a condition. We just say if the form data, that image URLs, the length of it is less than one, we're going to return an error. We want it to return, and also we want to set an error too. So we set the error to you must upload at least one image. So let's try again. So now, if we refresh the page, we just put the name. So be, because these are mandatory. And then if you click on create listing, you see we get an error. You must upload at least one image. So that's uh, one thing we, we, uh, we tackled the problem. Another one is if the uh, form data dot re uh, regular price. So if the regular price I, uh, if the regular price is less than discounted price, we're going to return an error saying discount price must be lower than regular price. And also, if I mentioned, so this one sometimes is a string, sometimes is number. So in order to prevent any error here, we can convert them to number by just adding a plus at the beginning of them. So what is this error? I think we have imported something unnecessary. Let's see the error. Uh, okay. Ah, okay. We didn't close the parentheses yet. Okay. So let's try now. I'm going to paste this one. And I want to choose the regular price, 50 and uh, 51, and then discounted price to 50. <clears throat> also, we need to uh, upload at least one image. Okay. Now we try. Okay. What happened? Okay, it's it's still working. Regular price. Oh, actually, regular price should be less than that. So 52 for discounted price. And now we should get an error. Okay, discount price must be lower than regular price. Okay, this is working too. So what else we need to do? Uh, we want to create a condition for the... As, uh, for the If there is an offer, we don't want to see that discount price if there is no offer. So we have the regular price here. For the discounted price which starts from here to here, we need to create a condition. We just say, if form data, sorry, form, I, it doesn't allow me to accept. So form data, if there is a form data, if it's true, we want to see that one. So we're going to accept this one and then bring everything inside that one. Okay, until here. So if this one is true, we want to see that. Uh, they should be inside the parentheses too. Okay. So now if I click on offer, I should see the discounted price. Otherwise, we shouldn't see it. Let's see if we make an error here. Okay. Let me fix this. Uh, let me upload this one first. Okay. This is created. But as you can see, we are actually sending the regular discounted price. Uh, as well inside the database. But that is actually okay because the discounted price is required as well. But uh, we just need, when we are showing the, this, uh, the listing, we want to, if there is no offer, we don't want to show any discount price. So that that's time we're going to fix that problem. So that is fine too. And then uh, I want to set the discount price to zero for the minimum and maximum. So this is going to make more sense if there is nothing there. So discount price is going to be zero. And also we want to 
set the initial value. So let me search for discount. So here I'm going to set the minimum to zero. Okay. So in this case, if we submit the form without discount price, we're going to see discount price zero. And also if we add an offer, you see the discount price is zero as well. So it's fine. So what else we need to do? Uh, I think when we are seeing the loading effect, I want to disable this button too. I forgot to do it. So inside the button, you can add the disabled. And this is going to, when it's loading, this is going to disable the button. And also, if also the, uh, when we are uploading the image, we want to disable this button too. So if you remember for the image, the loading was... What was the name of it? Yeah, image upload error or image up. So uploading and also uploading. So I'm gonna say if loading is true or uh, or uploading is true, we wanna make it disabled. So now if we click something here and then upload, we should see that the, this button is disabled too until the upload is completed. So this is going to actually protect uh, just unnecessary uh, clicks. The last things I want to do is to when everything is completed, when the listing is created, I want to redirect the person to that listing uh, page. If you remember, we, each listing is going to have an ID. So based on this ID, we want to create a page for the listing. And then we want to redirect the person to that page. So we want to go to, we want to import the use navigate. So we're going to import use navigate from React Router DOM. You can initialize it somewhere here. And then after everything is okay, everything uh, is created after here, if everything is successful, we want to navigate the user to forward slash. We need to create a backtick actually forward slash listing forward slash if you remember, we get the data back and data includes the ID of the user. And uh, we just have to say data dot list. Uh, let me check to be sure. So here we have this data back and this one has an ID. Okay, so we should be data dot underline ID, but we need to test it. I'm not sure about that. Okay, so let's create something. I just write down something here. We don't get an error. And then the regular price, just 51. Let's upload an image. And then when we click on upload, we're going to upload the image. And after that, we're going to, uh, let me clear this. We're going to create the listing. And then we are redirected to forward slash listing and the ID of the listing, which starts from 65. And then if you check here, we can see the ID of this is 65. So that is correct. We're going to create this page later when uh, com we, we complete the profile page. So we have completed the create listing page functionality. We have created some listing. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So this is going to be complete create listing page functionality. And then we just commit and push. So see you in the next section for the next uh, functionality of the website. All right, in the last section, we have completed the create a listing page functionalities. In this section, we're going to work on the show listing. If you look at the final version and we go to the profile, we can see we have a button saying show listings. And when we click on it, we see the listings of the user. So first thing first, in this section, we're going to create the API route for this uh, endpoint so we can uh, get the information. And then in the next section, we're going to complete this functionality. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and we need to create the API route. This is related to the user. So we go to the API folder routes and then user.route.js. And here we're going to create a new router. We just say router.get. This is a get request. We just want to get the information and then uh, we just say forward slash listings. So we get all the listings and then we're going to pass the ID of the user. So we just say 
uh, ID, and then we want only the verified people who are authenticated to be able to get the listing of a, a specific person. And then we want to uh, just call it, for example, get user listing. So we need to actually import it at the top. We haven't created, but we can import it now. And then we're going to create it after this. So we're going to go to the controllers and then user.controller.js. And here we can create the function. So we export a function called get user listing, which is asynchronous because we need to wait for the data. It gets a request and response and also next for handling the errors. So what we do here is to, we can add a try and catch a statement. Now, first thing first, we want to check if the person is trying to get is the real person, is the person who is the owner of that. For example, if someone is authenticated, must only get his own listing. They cannot get the listing of other people. So we're going to check if the request.user.id, which we get from the cookie, we get the JW from the JWC is equal to the request that params that ID, which we get from here, this parameter. If these are equal, then we want to return the data. Otherwise, we want to send an error. So here we just say uh, return an error using the next that we have and also the error handler. We set the status code to 401 and also we create a message. You can only view your own listings. So let's see what uh, we need to close in that parenthesis too. And here we're going to create another try and catch a statement. In the cache, we're going to just uh, use our middleware to handle the error. And inside the try, we're going to get the listings. Just say listings, which is going to be equal to await. We use our model, the listing model. We need to import it at the top. So we just open this file here. And now if you use control space, we get the suggestion to import it at the top. And then we want to use a method called find. And we just say find the listing that has the user ref of this uh, request parameters, this ID. So just find the only the listing that has this user ref. And also if you uh, we get the listings and also we can create the response with the status of 200. And then we're going to return these listings. So that was it for uh, creating this function. Let's test this one by Insomnia. So inside the listing, we're gonna, or inside the user, we create a request, which is a get request. And then the address is going to be localhost 3000 for the user. And then we're gonna say listings. I think it was a listing. Uh, we check again. So forward slash listings with the S. So we just say listings, and then we need to pass the ID of the person who is authenticated. So we need to authenticate with one person. For example, I sign in. So where is the JSON here? Uh, I bring it down so we can see. So I'm going to sign in with this user. Okay, user not found. We need to, I just, let's uh, sign. Uh, we sign up with this user. I want to, I think I update it somewhere. Update user. Or maybe we delete that user. So we're going to sign up with a new user. For example, test2 at gmail.com with this password. Let me copy this one. And let's make it test3 because uh, maybe we have test2. Let's send. Okay, user is created successfully. Let's copy this email. And let's sign in. Okay, we got the information. And also, we need to create some listing for the, with this user. So I'm going to just create a, a new listing with this like a name test and description and etc so let's send it so we create one this one we, let's create another one two test two okay so this person now has two listings now we can just paste the id of the user and get all his listings so we go here we paste the link and we just do the request okay uh, it's telling me that you can only view your own listing it didn't recognize this person so let's uh, check again. So we have signed in with this user. Let's sign in again. So this is the ID of the user. And then when we create a new listing, the user ref, oh, user ref is something random. We need to create the listing with that user ref. 
with this the person's user ref. Okay, so I create again two more listings. So now we can try to get the listings. We are still getting the same error. Let's check again our routes. So we have created this route listings and then we pass this ID. We verified the token. So we get the request that user that ID and then we call this function which we have created here. Oh, okay, I, I made a mistake here. This one should be equal. If this person is equal, so the ID is equal, we should do this one. Otherwise, we should get do that. So sorry about that. I didn't see that one. Sometimes the auto uh, suggestion, you have to check it double time. So let's try again. Now we get the listings. So as you can see, it's an array and it has one and two uh, listings. So we have two listings created by this user. So we are getting them. All right, so that was it for creating the API route for the listing. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So the message for this one is going to be create get user listings API route. So we're gonna commit and push. So in the next section, we are going to use this API route and complete our show listings functionality inside the profile page. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the show listings API route for the user. In this section, we're going to show it inside the uh, client side and connect this one to the backend, connect, connect the client to the backend and get the information of the user. So as you can see, now we have created in the final version, we have a button. When we click on it, we see the our listing. So what we want to do is to add let me bring this one to the right side. We want to add a button here and let's bring this one to the left side. So we go to profile.jsx inside the client side, inside the source folder, we go to pages and profile.jsx. And then we want to add this one after this message, the success message. So here we're going to create a button, which is going to say show listings. And then let's just style it a little uh, real quick. We just say hex green, okay. hex green 700. And then we're going to have the, we set the width to be full. So this is going to be in the center. And then we're going to uh, add a, an unclick event listener. So which is going to call a function called handle, for example, show listings. Okay. And then we're going to create this function at the top. Just before the return, I'm going to create this function. And this is a synchronous because we need to do some requests. And then what we want to do here, it's very simple actually. We just create a try and a cache a statement. For the error, uh, we just, if you remember, we add some error showing here. Uh, we can create the error for this one as well. It's very similar. So we just say, uh, we had an error here before. Oh, we didn't have any error. So we just create a constant called show listings error. And then we set it to be false at the beginning. And then here we just do, we set this show listing error to true. And then uh, here at the after this show listing, we can create a paragraph. We create a paragraph and then if there is an error, we just want to say error showing listings. Otherwise, and it would be an empty string. Uh, let's see. Now we are not getting an error, but I think it's okay now. It should be nice. And then after that, after handling the error, we can just, we don't need any actually loading effect or something like that. We can just say, we can add the loading effect, but you can do it with, for your practice. Just for simplicity, I'm going to skip that loading effect. It's very similar to the one we did before. So we're going to fetch to the forward slash API, forward slash user, forward slash listings. And then we want to pass the ID of the user, which is we can get from current user dot underline ID. And then we create the data by converting it to the JSON. And then if the data success is false, we're going to return an 
return and also we want to set the error to true again and then also before the request we want to set the error to false so you're gonna clean the previous error so this is going to give us the data let's check so uh, let's open the inspect we go to network we refresh the page we clean the screen and then if you click on show screen show listings as you can see we got the all the listings of this user okay so that's working nice so now we want to show these listings under this button so uh, it's very simple as well so under this error we want to create a condition we want to create a condition if we say if the listing exists and also the length is more than zero we want to show the listings so if the uh, there's no current user here oh we actually we didn't save this listing that we got so let's we save them in a piece of state so at the top we're going to create another piece of state we just say uh, user for example listings okay and then set the user listing and, and this is going to be an empty object, an empty array. Okay. So, and then we want to set this user listings after we got the data. If everything is okay, uh, let's do it here. So if everything is okay, we want to uh, set the user listing to data. Now we have this user listings. After this paragraph, we want to say if the user listings length is more than zero. First, we want to check if it actually existed or not. So we just said li user listings and user listings is more than zero. Then we want to show the listings. So we want to say here, we want to create a, uh, actually, we don't need the parentheses here because I want to map to the user listing. We just say user listings dot map. And this is going to give us each listing. And then we're going to uh, return a diff. So let me close this first. Here. So we're going to have one, two, three parentheses. So you need to close the another parenthesis. I think it's fine now. So we're going to have a diff. So inside the div, we're going to return. If you look at the final version, let me show you the final version. We're going to have the image of the user. This is the div, this container. Actually, uh, this is the div of the one listing. And then we have the image. We have the name of the listing or title of the listing. But what I mean by name is the title. And then we're going to have two buttons, delete and edit. So we're going to add them here. So let's first see why we are getting an error. So first we fix the error. So we get an, a listing here and then we return this one. Okay, I think... Yeah, we don't need in this part. That's fine. So inside this div, we're going to, first thing first, we want to add actually a key for this div because we are using map. We should use a key. The key is going to be listing dot underline ID. And then inside this div, we're going to have, as I mentioned, we're going to have the image and etc. Uh, so here we're going to have an image first and uh, Actually, let's uh, put everything inside the link. So when we click on the image, we're going to go to that listing. So we create a link tag. And this is going to go to the uh, forward slash. If you remember, we have created the listing in this URL. So the listing that under uh, underline ID is the ID. And also this one is going to be listing. And then instead of the title, we're going to have that image. The source is going to be the first image of that listing, which is listing dot uh, image URLs, and then we want to get the only show the first image as the cover. The alternative is going to be listing image or listing cover, and then let me see that we are getting anything here. So we are getting an error. Let me check. So the error is const is not defined. So I made a mistake somewhere. So line 30 in profile.jsx, line 30, okay, here, I made a mistake here, const, and then, oh, okay, this, this parenthesis is wrong too, we need to remove the parenthesis, 
Okay, this one should be fine. So let's refresh the page. Now we are not getting an error. So let's click on show listings. So, okay, now we are getting the image of the here. So let's bring this one to the right side. We're going to style the image. So I'm going to add a class name here. And then what we want to do for the image, we're going to set the height to be 16. We want to set the width to be, for example, and we can set it to be 18 as well, 16 as well. We set the object to be contained to keep the aspect ratio of the image. And also, look, we want to contain the image inside that uh, place. And also, we want to make it rounded large. Okay, is it? It's not working. The rounded large is not working. Let me see. Here. Okay, the, we don't need to add actually rounded large. That's fine. And then after the image, we're going to have the uh, title of the page, the name of the page, the listing. So we're going to have the, another link that is going to go to the same place. And then we just add, we can add a, uh, we can add a paragraph or we just don't need to add anything actually here. Let's close this link tag and then, okay, let's accept this and see the listing that name. So we see the new listing. That's fine. And then we want to bring them next to each other. So in this, uh, the div that is covering everything, we want to change it. We want to add first, we want to add a border. And then we want to set the, we make it rounded large. And also we want to make a padding of three. And we want to bring them next to each other. So we use flex. And then we can use justify between to add a space between them. And finally, we can just add item center to align them in the center vertically, like this. Okay, that is fine. And then here, for the image, I want to add some styling here too. For example, I want to make the font to be semi-bold. And also, I want to make it to, you know, I want to cover it from here to the end. Okay, so this is going, if you want to do that, we can just change the flex to 1. Just a flex one. And then we're going to have, after that, we're going to have a hover effect. When we hover over it, I want to add the underline. So when we hover over it, we see the underline. And also, I want to truncate it. Truncate means when uh, the title is too long, it's going to show dot, dot, dot at the end. So we're going to test it later. So after this link, which is showing the name, we're going to have the two buttons. Delete and edit. So we're going to have a div here. And then inside the div, we're going to have two buttons. So this flex one is actually is not working. I think we need to add this flex one to this link. So let me delete this one and add it to this link. Okay, now it's working. Actually, let's add all these classes to the link. And then we add a flex one. We, can, we, we don't need to have any classes here for the paragraph. So after that, we have another div, and this is going, and this uh, space actually, we can just add the space very simple by adding some uh, gap here. So inside this div, we're going to have some gap of four, for example. So that is fine. And then for this one, we're going to have the two button. So the first button is going to say delete, and then let's just style it real quick. So for the delete button, we just want to make the text red. I want to keep it simple. So red 700. And also, let's make it uppercase. And let's copy this one. So we're going to have another button for edit. So let's see. Yeah, we just uh, change this one to edit. And then the color is going to be green for the edit. And then we're going to have, uh, we're going to bring them on top of each other. We just say flex, flex column. Okay, and then we can just, I think we can use item center to center them. They are already centered, but maybe some places we get. And also we see that we, they are actually connected to each other, uh, these tips. So what I want to do, I want to show something like this one. I want to have a title, your listings. And then here under it, we're going to have another div that is covering everything. And then we're going to make a gap between them. So we can easily do that by covering 
this user listing with a div. So I'm going to close this one. Let me, okay, yeah, we cannot close this, but we can close that one. So here we can cover this one with a div. Let's bring this one inside. Oh, okay. We just have to cut this and uh, put it at the end. And then we need to add another bracket for the user. Okay. So in this div at the top, I want to add an H1 tag saying your listings. And then I'm going to bring them to the center. We just say text center. You're going to add some space at the top and bottom using margin Y. And then we can just make it bigger. We just say text three XL or two XL would be fine. I think that is too big. So let's, I think two XL is should be okay. And then we can change the font weights to be semi bold. Okay. And now in this div, we can change the flex, flex to flex column. And then we can space, add a space between them by just saying gap four, for example. And if you add a gap four, I think we don't need this margin Y. We just say margin top seven. That's fine. Oh, so we can we can just remove it. Uh, okay, margin top seven. That's fine. So we have now the listings here. In the next section, we're going to work on the delete functionality for this one. Uh, so first, we add this one to the GitHub. We just say complete. Uh, we just say add show listing, or we just say complete. That should be better. Complete show user listings functionality okay we just commit and push so see in the next section for adding the delete a listing of the user all right in the last section we have completed showing the listings of the user in this section we're going to add the delete functionality so when we click on the delete button we want to delete the listing so if you look at the final version, I'm going to uh, restart the page. So we can click on show listing. Actually, I don't want to delete these listings. Let's create quickly one listings. So I just want to write down something here to for description and address. I just make the regular price. I upload an image real quick. And then we can click on create listing to create the listing. And if you go again to the profile page and show the listing, we see the listing here at the bottom. Actually, you can sort it with, with the latest one. I'm going to show you how to sort in the search section so you can learn it there. But for now, we're just for simplicity, we, add, we leave it like this. And then if you click here on delete, we're going to delete it both from here and also the database. So we're going to refresh the page and you see that the listing is completely gone. So what we want to do here in our application, we want to add an event listener to this delete, which is going to request from the API route. So first we need to create the API route for the delete functionality. So we can go, go to API. We just go to routes, listing, and then we're going to here, we're going to create a listing. Uh, but this time we want to create the delete functionality. We just say router dot delete. And then we're going to delete, uh, you, we're going to say forward slash delete. And also we want to pass the ID. Also, we want to verify the user if it's authenticated and also the owner of this, uh, listing. And then we're going to call a function called delete listing. Let me add this one at the top. And also we need to go to listing.controller.js. And here we're going to create that function, delete listing. So it, this is going to take, take it like this request, respond, and next, and this is asynchronous. And here, first we want to check if the listing exists or not. So we just say const listing, and we just want to check if for from our listing model, we use find, find by ID and, and we just uh, request, we use the parameters in the route. And uh, where was it? Here. So this ID to find that listing, if the listing does not, exist we want to return an error we just say if there is no listing we just say 404 listing not found but if the listing exists we want to check if the user is the owner of the listing 
So we're going to check if the request that ID that the person who's authenticated is equal. If it's not equal to listing that user ref, we just need to uh, convert it to a string, the user ref. I don't think we need to convert it because it's, it's already a string. Uh, let's delete it. If you get an error, we're going to fix that one. So, and then we're going to return an error. For one, you can only delete your own listing. But if everything is okay, we want to use the try and catch a statement. First, we want to handle the error here by saying next error. And then inside the try, we just want to delete the user. We just say await listing dot find by ID and delete. And then we're going to pass the ID of the listing. So now we have created this uh, API route. We can firstly test it with a, a insomnia. So inside the listing, I'm going to add another request. Actually, this one, is, we need to rename it. So I forgot to rename this one. This is going to be get user listings. And here we're going to create a request. We first we rename it before we forget. So here we just say uh, delete a, a user's a listing. We just say delete a listing. And then this is going to be a delete request. And then the address is going to be listing forward slash delete. And then we need to pass the ID of the listing. So I want to just get the, see the listing of this user, which is here. I want to uh, get this ID. For example, I want to delete this one, test two. So let's copy this one and then uh, paste it here. And also when we do this await, we want to respond with the, we just respond with the status of 200. And then we're going to pass, uh, we're going to return a uh, listing has been deleted. Okay. Now let's try it. So if you press on send, we can see that we are getting the listing has been deleted. And then if you try to get again, the listings of this same user, we can see that the test two is deleted. Okay. So it's working. The API route is working. Now we, it's time to create the client side section. So in this client side, inside the profile.jsx, we have created these two buttons, the delete and the edit. So here I'm going to just add an on click event listener, which is going to call a function called handle listing delete. And then we can just click, uh, we need to actually pass the ID of this listing. So we can create it like a callback function like this. And then we're going to pass the ID of this listing, which is inside this. Uh, remember we got this listing from the map. So we just say listing dot underline ID. We're going to pass this ID and then we're going to get it inside the function that we're going to create here. So we're going to create a function called handle listing delete and we got the listing ID as the input. And in this function, what we want to do here is to first thing first, we can just add a try and catch. For the uh, error, I don't want to add the, any, uh, just to spend time to do the error. You can do it. It's very similar. You can just create an error for that and then show it under it. But for now, I just want to console log the error, that message, if there is an error. Otherwise, we want to just get the response. We just want to have a response. We just say await, fetch a request, forward slash API, forward slash listing, and then delete. And then we pass the ID of this listing, which we are getting as the input of this function. And then for the method, is going to be delete. And then we can convert it to JSON. And if uh, the data is success is false, we're going to console log it and return. Otherwise, uh, we're going we're gonna to see, see it because we want to actually uh, update the listing uh, piece of state. Remember, we have created a piece of state here called user listings. We want to update this one. So what we do here after the delete, if the delete is successful, we're going to set the user listing. We're going to get the previous data and then filter out the, the one with the ID of this listing ID. So, so we're going to filter out. We want to get everything except the one with the ID of this ID. So we're going to delete and update it. Okay. So let's try it. So here inside the profile, I'm going to refresh the page, click on show listing. We get the listings. And if you click here, we can see that the list is updated and the listing is gone. And if you refresh the page again, 
we can see that the listing is actually removed from the database as well. We can just check it, double check it inside the network. So let's delete this one or this one. As you can see, we get listing has been deleted. And also, okay, so if you refresh the page, we still can see only two listings. So that was it for adding the delete user functionality. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So we create a message, just say complete user listing, uh, or we just say complete delete user listing functionality. We can commit and push. In the next section, we're going to work on the edit functionality. So we wanna, if you can look at the final version, if you press on edit, we're going to be redirected to the edit listing page with the ID of that listing. And also we get all the information like the title, description, address, and etc. So we can update the information and click on edit listing and update it. So in the next section, first thing first, we wanna uh, work on the API route of this, and then we're gonna complete the functionality. So see in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the delete functionality for the user listings. In this section, we're going to work on the edit functionality. First, we need to create the API route for that, and then we're gonna connect it to the client side. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code, and here we go, let's close everything first, so we can do everything from scratch. So we can go to API, First, we go to routes and listing.route.js. We're gonna add another router for editing, which is going to be a post request. So this is going to be exactly like this. We're gonna go to the forward slash update and we're gonna pass the params of ID. We're gonna verify the token. So we know that the person is authenticated or not. And then we're gonna call a function called update listing. We can add it here inside the controllers. But now we need to go to the controllers folder to create that. So we go to listing.controller.js and then here we're gonna create that edit update listing. So we just say update listing. This is going to be synchronous with request response and next, let's close this. The first things we need to do is to check if the listing exists or not. So we just say listing is going to be equal to await. We use the listing model. We use the find by ID method and we're gonna pass that params that we get. And once we are, uh, we need to just create a condition. We just say, if there is no listing, then return an error with the status code of 404. And we just say listing not found. And then we wanna check if the listing belongs to that person. So we just say request.user.id, which we get from the JWT, from the cookie. And if it's not equal to listing that user ref, we're gonna return an error saying with the status code of 401, and then we just say you can only update your own listing. Otherwise, we wanna update the listing. So we're gonna add a try and catch a statement. Here, we're gonna just handle the error using our middleware. And inside a try, we just wanna say await, or we just create a constant first because we need to return it as well. We just say updated listing is going to be equal to a weight. We use the listing model that we have created, and then we're gonna use a method called find by ID and update. And after that, we're gonna pass firstly the ID. So we're gonna pass the ID, and then we wanna uh, we wanna to say the request. Uh, updated with the requested body, whatever we sent from the requested body. And then we're gonna return the new true because we wanna get the new updated listing. But if you don't do that one, you're gonna get the previous one, not updated one in the return. And then, so here, I think this parenthesis is not necessary. And then we can just respond with a status of 200, which is a okay response. And then we're gonna send back the updated listing. So let's uh, test this one using the insomnia. So we're gonna create, inside the listing folder, we're gonna create a new request, and then we can just uh, rename it to update listing. And then this is going to be a post request. 
the address is going to be localhost 3000 forward slash API forward slash listing. And this is going to be, let me check what I added. So inside the listing, the route, I have added the update. Okay, so this one should be update. And then we need to pass the ID of that. So we need to actually sign in again. For example, with this person, I'm going to sign in. And then we want to see if the person have any listing. For example, get the user listings. We can uh, pass the ID of the user we, we get here. So we need to copy this ID. We go to get user listing, paste it here. And then we send, we get all the listings of that user. And then we want to update, for example, this listing. So I'm just going to copy this. And then we want to just go to the update listing and paste it here. Let's uh, just try to get an error. For example, I just add a number at the end, three, and then we send. We can see the servers return nothing. Let's see. It check we are having an error actually here okay let's check the error uh, okay let's go to listing.controller we see that there's nothing to import here so that's not an error for that so let's go from the beginning of the error it's a long error let's see what what we get okay even we cannot reach to the beginning of the error let's uh, Save the file again. Okay, now it's actually working. Uh, probably I didn't save it correctly. Or if you try again, maybe the, the error is from this one. So let's send again. Okay, this is causing an error because, but if we do it like this, we should actually return an error. So we didn't actually, let's check the try and catch again. So first we check the listing. If there's, there's no listing, we're going to return the error. Okay. So let's actually make this one, delete this C and then add that. Okay. I found actually the error. That's error handler is not uh, came in. So it's not. So we need to import the error handler. So that was a problem. I thought that is already imported. So let's try again. So now it's a wrong, uh, actually, ID. So if you do it, we just see listing not found. We get an error with this message. But if you do the correct one, for example, from the listing, I just copied it again. And then we want to update this one. For example, inside the body, JSON, I just want to change, for example, its name. We just say name. I just say updated. And then when we send, as you can see, everything is the same as before, but the name is updated. We can update everything like image. We can update all the things. And also you can see the user ref is here and already checked and there is no error. So that one is okay too. So, and if you do again, get the listing of the user, we can see this is actually updated in the database. So that was it for creating the API route for editing of the listing. Let's add this one to the GitHub and we're going to continue to do other, we're going to connect this API route to the client side in the next section. So here we're going to say create update listing API route. You can comment and push. So see you in the next section for adding this API route to our client side. All right, in the last section, we have completed the edit listing API route. In this section, we're going to work on the client side and connect the client side to this API route. So if you look at the final version and we go to the profile page and then we go to show listings and we click on edit, look at this uh, title, this name in Enchanted Cottage, and this is going to show us this listing with the same title and description and everything and also the image so we can update the image we can update all this data so as the edit a listing page and also the create listing is exactly the same the ui we can just copy that one and then we just need to get the initial value and change them here so we can go to visual studio code and then we can just go to the client side 
pages inside the SRC. So here we can create a new page and we call it update listing.jsx. And then we can use RFC to create a React functional component. And also we need to add it to the app.jsx. So here, as this is the protected page too, so we need to add it just below this create listing. And then we just call it update listing. And this should be update listing as well. We need to import it at the top too. So we have imported it here. So if you go back to our website and then we just go to, uh, let's actually add this on click. So when we click on this one, we're gonna be redirected to this page. So we can go to profile.jsx. Let me close the backend side so we don't need it now. So we, if we go to the edit button, after the here, we can just add a link tag around it. And we're gonna close the link tag here. So we, we need to import it at the top. Let's see if we have link here. Okay, we already have the link. So what we wanna do is to just uh, add the address to it. So we're gonna go to update dash listing post slash the ID of the listing. So now if we try again in our website, for example, this listing, new listing, when we click on edit, we go to update dash listing or slash the IP of this, ID of this listing. But actually we cannot see the text that we have created, update listing. So let's see what we, so this is create listing. Oh, what happened here? Uh, so create listing and update listing is just saying, update listing and this inside the app.jsx. So the address is update dash listing. And then we're gonna call that update listing. So this is update dash listing. Let's just go to this one. Okay, now we can see the update listing, but we need to get the parameter at the end. Here, this, this one. So how we get this ID and we can fetch the data. So first thing first, let me just copy everything from the create listing and put it inside the update listing. So we should see this page now like the, this one. Let's edit some necessary parts. For example, the title we have is update a listing. So let's bring this one to the left side so we can see the changes. Update a listing and also here the button should say update listing. Okay, that's the only change we, we need to do. Now we want to fetch uh, the listing data based on that parameters that we see there. And the reason we are getting an error when we put the data, for example, if I go to profile and then we just show the listing and then we click on edit, we go to update listing and then the ID of the user, but we are not seeing the update listing page. So what we need to do is actually to go to app.jsx and we just say, this is not only this URL, we need to add the ID as well. We just add the, for example, we just say listing ID. I like this. So if you refresh now, you can see now we are still seeing this page, even though we have this ID at the end. So now we want to actually fetch the listing based on this ID and then show the listing information and fill this form ourselves. So we can just go to the update listing here and then we need to add a use effect react hook. So once the page is loaded, we want to uh, actually get the information. So after here, uh, we are console logging the form data. Actually, we don't need it to do that one. We can just here add a use effect react hook. We need to import it from react. So we click here and we want to check, we want to call a function. So we want to, uh, because this is an asynchronous behavior, we cannot actually create the asynchronous inside the use effect. We get an error. So we need to actually create a asynchronous function here and then call it inside. So we just say cons and then uh, we want to create the function and then we just call it fetch, fetch listing. And this is asynchronous. And then once we have this function, we can call the function here. So this way we can have an asynchronous behavior. And also we want to have that ID inside the browser, inside the URL of the browser. 
In order to get that, we can use a method from React Router DOM, a hook called use params. And then we need to initialize it. For example, here under the navigate, I just initialize the params. We just say param or params equals to use params. And then if you want to get it, for example, so for example, inside this use effect, for example, I just put it inside this function. I just say const uh, user uh, listing ID. Okay, this is going to be equal to params dot listing ID because uh, what we did here inside the after JSX, we call it listing ID. So now let's console log and check it. So let's close this one so we don't get confused here. We just say console log listing ID. So now if I open the console here, let's uh, refresh the page. Each time you come to the page, we can get the ID, which is inside the URL. So we have the ID now. And based on this ID, we want to fetch the information about this listing. So we need to create another API route for this getting a listing. That is very simple, actually. We need to just go to API folder. We just go to routes, listing. And then here, I just want to create a get request. And then we just, based on the ID, we want to get the information of the listing. Actually, we don't need to, we just say, uh, yeah, we just can say get or get listing. Well, it's okay. We just say get and then we pass the ID. We don't need to verify the user because later we want to use this API route to get the information of a listing. So what I mean by that is, for example, inside the final version, we have, we get the listing here and also we get the listing publicly as well. So each person can get a listings information that, so this is not a secure things. So we don't need to verify the user to get the listing. So th here is fine. We don't need to verify the user. And then this is going to be get listing. And then we need to import it at the top and then we can create it inside the controller listing that controller and at the end i just say export const get listing and then we can just add some uh, try and catch a statement we catch the error using our middleware and then inside the try we want to just get the listing we just say listing equals to listing that find by id but based on the parameter the id that we sent here we're going to get it. And then we're going to return. So if there is no listing, we're going to just say listing not found. Otherwise, we just want to re respond with the status of 200 and we just say JSON and we return the listing. So we can test this one inside Insomnia as well. For example, in the listing, we can add uh, a new HTTP request with the name get listing. And then this is a get request. And then we just go to localhost 3000 API listing. And this is going to be get. And then forward slash, we want to just get the IP. And if you just, if you remember, we get the, all the listing of the user. We can just get this one, this ID. We go to get listing. And as we don't need any authentication, each time we do, we get it. So we get the information like this. Okay. And now, we want to do inside the update listing here, we want to fetch it. So instead of console logging the ID, we want to create a response with the await with the fetch method, which is going to be equal to API for slash listing and then the ID of the listing that we get here from the URL of the page. And we can just convert it to JSON. And then if you remember, we have here a form data. Okay, we have the form data but it has an initial value. And we want to change the uh, change it and we just say data. We spread all the data there. Actually, we don't need to spread it. We just change everything. We just say set form data. We just say data. That's it. And if the response has an error, we just say if data that success is false, uh, we can just actually console log the error because we don't want to create a message for that. We just console log data that message and return. So let's see our website now. Let's refresh the page. So we're getting an error not found. So let's check the 
network, we see the response. So I'm going to clean it. When we refresh the page, this response actually is coming. Uh, okay, this address is not found. So let me check. So the route, uh, the address is uh, forward slash get, actually. We need to add the forward slash get to. So here inside the update, this is forward slash API, forward slash listing, forward slash get, and then we add this one. So as you can see now, the information is updated inside the listing. So each time we refresh, we can see the data we are getting. And also this is the request, I think is this one. And then we get all the information of the user. So now you can update the listing. So what we want to do here is to, instead of create a listing, now we want to click here and then we use the API route we created for the uh, up update of the listing instead of creation. So we need to actually modify this page. So instead of uh, here, we should go to handle, yeah, handle submit. So here we are requ we are requesting to the post slash API post slash listing post slash create, but we want to actually update it. So this create, if you remember inside the listing dot route, this one should be update. So we have used the create, this one is update, and also we need to pass the ID of that uh, listing as well. So here, this one should be update, and we need to add the ID. So we need to create a backtick here, and then here we're gonna create a variable, and then this is going to be the ID of that that we are getting from uh, prem. So remember the prem, the URL of the, we just, uh, and then, uh, so we don't have it here. We just say params dot listing ID. So let's try now. So everything else would be similar. And also we're going to navigate again to the uh, listing forward slash that ID. So now, for example, I changed this one to listing uh, updated. We don't want to change anything else. We just click on update listing. Okay, now we are getting an error. So let's open the inspect and check the error. So we just say response, the server response with the profile not found, the listing not found. Let's try again. I want to go back to the profile page, refresh the page, and then I just go to this listing, click on edit. And then here, let's up, uh, check this, change this one to update and click here. So we're getting the same error. Let's go to network. So we, uh, we are not getting any response actually. So it seems like that, uh, okay. I didn't add the forward slash here. So here we should add a forward slash. Okay, that was the problem. Let's try again. I'm gonna refresh the page and then here I just say update it. Let's click on update and we check the console if we get an error. Okay, there's no error. And then we are redirected to this page. And this error is not a problem because we haven't created this page yet. So we're gonna fix it later. So let's uh, check the profile. And now if you check on the listings, you can see that this listing is updated inside the database as well. So let's try to edit this one. And then for example, I add another image, two images, for example. Okay, updating, and we have three more images. Let's change its name to, for example, updated two. And then we change this rent to sale, furnished, offer, we're gonna, have an offer for this one. Regular price is going to be 790 and this one 500. And then we just change the bedrooms. So I wanted to see that everything is working perfect. So, and then if you click on create listing, okay, this one, the minimum is 10 character. So I'm gonna add this one like this. Okay, it's created. And then if you go to profile, show listing, we can see that this updated. And if we edit it again, we should see the data, new data that we have updated. So this, everything is working fine. So, and that was it for create and update a listing page. So let's add this one to the GitHub for our reference. So let's add everything. And then we just say complete. Uh, what we want to call, for example, we just say complete update listing functionality. Complete update listing functionality. That's fine. And then we can just commit and push. So we have done with the, actually the profile page now. 
So we have done with the, all the parts of the profile page. We can create, we can update, we can delete. So what we want to do now is if we want, we want to create these pages related to that a specific page. We want to have this a slider at the top and then we're going to design it like this. So see you in the next section for this part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the update a listing functionality. In this section, we're going to work on the listing page. So if you remember when we updated, we're gonna go to that listing page here. First thing first, we need to create this page. So we just need to go to Visual Studio Code and let's close everything. We go to client side, SRC pages. And then here we're gonna cre uh, create a new page and we call it listing. JSX. We can use RFC to create a React functional component. And then inside the app.jsx, we need to add this page. And this page is not private, so we can just put it outside this private route. And then let's copy this one first. So this is going to be a listing, forward slash listing. And this one is going to be listing. And then we need to import it at the top. And then also we need to add the ID. So forward slash listing ID, because based on this ID, we want to fetch the data. So now if you go to our website, we can see the listing here. So the page is actually is created. So what we want to do is to like the final version, we want to get the listings information. And based on the images, we want to create an image slider using a package called Swiper. And then we want to have this here button, when we click on it, we're gonna copy the link of this page. So, and then for example, I can paste it like with Ctrl V so we can copy the link. And we're gonna have the title with the price. We're gonna have the address. We're gonna get this icons from the React icons package. We're gonna show if it's sale or rent or it, it has an offer or not. And then we're gonna have the description and finally the number of beds, bath, parking spot, and etc. So the first thing we need to do is to get the information of this listing. So I'll bring it to the right side and this one to the left side. Let's go to the listing.jss page. And here we're going to have a use effect, React hook. So we need to import it from React at the top. We can delete this one, actually. We don't need it. And then what we want to do is to create a function here. Uh, I forgot to add another parenthesis here, actually. So what we want to do is, is to create a asynchronous function. We're going to fetch the listing data. We can call it fetch listing, and this is asynchronous. And then we need to call this function. So, and then uh, we can just, we can create a response because we have already created this uh, get listing here, the API route. So we can use that one. We can just create a response which is going to be equal to await page forward slash API forward slash listing forward slash get, and then we're going to pass the ID. So we're going to create the back tick here so we can have a, some variable. So I'm going to create a variable, and then this is going to be the listing ID, which we need to get using the params, uh, use params hook from React router DOM. Oh, sorry, this one should be import. That's why I'm getting a wrong suggestion from react router dom we need to initialize it not like this params equals to use params and then here this one is going to be params dot listing id as we defined here in app.jsx listing id okay after this request because this is a get request we don't need to work on it more and then we're going to convert it to JSON. And if the data, the success is false, we want to return. And otherwise, we want to uh, get the data. And then I want to create a piece of state called listing. Listing. And then the initial value for this one is going to be null. So let's see. OK, uh, I made a mistake here. So listing. And then once we are successful, we want to set the listing to data. And also we can add some loading effect as well, loading an error. Or we can just add this one easily. 
we just set the loading to uh, false or we just set the loading to true at the beginning and when the information is completely gone we can set the loading to false and also we want to have the error and this is going to be false so before fetching the data here uh, what we can do is to add a try and catch a statement and we can just put everything we did here inside a try and inside the cache we want to set the error to true and here too we want to set the error to true and also before fetching the data I want to set the loading to true as well and when the error happens I want to set the loading to false and here as well we're going to set the loading to false so now uh, when we come to this page, uh, let's see what we get. I want to see the data. So let's inside here, we just uh, show the data dot name, for example. So if there is a, sorry, if not data, the, we set the, where is it? They set the listing to data. So we just say listing dot name if there is a listing. Otherwise we get an error here. So if there is a listing, show the listing that name. But let's see what error we are getting. Uh, I think I've, I forgot to import use of state too. So I fixed that one. Okay, now we are getting the name here, updated 245. So we change this return to main. And then inside the main, so as you can see here, we made it like this, name. Uh, you can add the loading effect and other things. Uh, I just want to firstly create the loading effect. So here inside the main, I'm going to say if there is a loading, we just say loading like this. And then let's style this. We set it and we bring it to the center, X center. We add some margin at the top, margin in the Y axis of like this. And then we can uh, create uh, like a, make it bigger to Excel. Okay, that's enough loading. And if there is an error, but why is it showing only loading here? So we set the loading to false here. Also, also when we get the data, we need to set the loading to false as well here. So let me fix this one and refresh the page. Okay, loading false, loading false. Uh, let's uh, set the initial value to false as well. So we set the loading to true when we are fetching the data. And then when the fetching is not successful, we set it to false. And also here, we set the loading to false as well. Here, we set the loading to false. So let's console log the loading, we see the problem. So console log loading. And then here, we're going to inspect and go to console. If you refresh the page, we can see, okay, it's, it's going from true to false all the time because this use effect we didn't add any dependency here. So we just want to say run this one only one time or each time the params that listing ID change, you just change it. So now if we refresh the page. Okay, you know, I fix this one. Okay, now it's false. So first it's true and then it's false. Okay, now we see the loading. You can add some other things, for example, the spinner or other things. We just for simplicity, I just said loading, but you can replace this paragraph with a spinner, for example. So we see this better. But because this page is very fast to be loaded, we can we don't we barely see this loading even. And then if there is an error, we want to see the error as well. We just say error. And then we just say something went wrong. How uh, for example, how we get an error? For example, if I just if the ID doesn't exist, for example, I just add some random uh, letter at the end. Okay, you see something went wrong. So, and then for, can, for example, you can just add a link here to go back to the homepage or something like that, but you can do it yourself. I just want to keep it simple like this. Okay, it's still, we are getting an error here. So we need to set the er error to false if the everything is okay. We just say set loading, set error, set error to false. And uh, okay, it should be fine now. So this is for the loading effect and error. What if we have the listing? So we want to show the listing here. So what I want to do is uh, I want to show the image at the top. So we just say if there is a listing, also you can add more conditions. For example, if there is a listing and there is no, for example, loading 
and there's no error. So you can add more conditions like this. So you should be more specific. And then, so this, this is going to prevent any possible error. And then here, we want to, for now, for example, I want to just add an h1 tag showing the listing.name. You see that name here? So this is a logic. You just say if there is listing, but there is no loading or error like this, we see the listing.name. Otherwise, you get an error because if there is no listing, you get an error here. So now let's install a package called Swiper. So we can just add a swipe for our images, Swiper for our image. So here we need to install it inside the client side. So we need to, let me clear this so you can see it better. So we're going to install a package called Swiper. And then once you install it, you can import these things from the top. So make sure to follow these things correctly because if you make a, a different for example just be careful of the capital or the lower case so this one should be uppercase sorry the with the capital s swiper swiper a slide rom swiper for slash react and then we're going to import uh swiper core swiper core rom swiper and also we want to import because we want to add a navigation between different images. So we're going to import navigation from swiper forward slash module, modules with the S. And also we need to import its CSS. We just say import swiper forward slash swiper dash bundle dot CSS. So actually this is wrong. Actually, let me fix this one. This is not like this. We just say swiper for slash bundle. Okay, bundle. That's it. So let me check again if we don't make any problem here. Okay, that's fine. Swiper, swiper slide, swiper core, navigation, and this CSS bundle. And then we need to initialize one of its packages, which is, uh, let me see. So here uh, inside, uh, before the the listing, we just need to initialize the swiper code, uh, swiper code, and then we just say use navigation. Because you want to use the navigation, you need to add this one as well. Okay, let's see, we are getting an error somewhere, I think. Okay, seems like we are getting an error. Let me see. So, could not resolve react swiper for slash swiper dash react. Now, the problem is actually I haven't in, they didn't install the swiper in the client side. So I said we have to do it, but actually I I installed it in the backend. Okay, so we just clear this. We go to the client side, and then I just install it swiper. And then now if we refresh the page, let's see we have that swiper. Okay, we have swiper in the front end, and then here let's save it. Let's see the error. Yeah. The server responded with a status of 504. Uh, let's go to the other pages. You see that we are getting an error. Okay, let's uh, remove this one first. And refresh the page. Okay, the error is for the swiper. Uh, we are getting the data correctly, but I don't know why that swiper is making a problem here. Okay, non-existing module. It's like it didn't install it properly again. So this is a client I have installed. Uh, let's clear this. And let's check this package.json file. So we have actually Swiper version 10.2. Well, I think because I have installed it in the backend as well, so maybe it's making a problem. And let's delete this one from the backend. And then I just go to the back end and then I install all of them again. So if you check now and refresh the page, you can see there's no error. So let's go back to our listing.j6. So everything is actually was correct. That the problem was I have installed Swiper inside the back end ins instead of client. So if you didn't make that mistake, it's again, okay, it's uh, fine for you too. So here, instead of showing just the name, I want to add the Swiper. So I'm going to delete this one. 
or we just delete this actually h1 tag. So here, instead of h1, uh, let me just add a parenthesis here, and then we're gonna have this swiper. We can add an empty fragment actually. So let's add that one because I wanna put everything inside this. Oh, actually, it's already there because uh, the color is different. I you can see. So we have an empty fragment, and inside the empty fragment, we need to add the firstly, we want to add the swiper. So we want to uh, cover everything with swiper. And then as we want to use the navigation, we need to add the navigation here. We just say navigation. We don't need to say true. We close this. And then inside this swiper, we're going to loop through our images. We just say listing that uh, image, image URLs. If you remember, image was stored here. And then we're going to map through it. So this one, it, this is going to give us each URL. We just get the URL here. And again, we're going to return. Uh, we can return directly. So I'm going to add the parenthesis here. And then here, I just add the swiper slide. Let's close this swiper slide. And this one should be here at the top. And then inside the swiper, first we want to add a key because this is a map. We need to add a key. And the key is going to be URL as well because this is unique. We are getting an error here. Let's let's change this the empty fragment to div. So it seems like a... Okay, this seems like there is something missing here. Okay, I think we didn't close this uh, here. We didn't close this listing. So swiper is here. Where is the swiper's closing tag? Okay, we don't have it here. So we swiper, we close it here. Okay, now it's working. So inside the swiper slide, we're going to add another div. And inside the div, we're going to have to pass these things. So here inside the div, we're going to have a class name. We just set the height to be 500 pixels. And also we need to add some a style here to be able to see the images. The style is going to be inside uh, another curly braces because we want to add CSS here. So we just say background and the background is going to be that URL that we are getting. So we're going to have a back tick here and then we just say URL and then this URL is going to include this URL that we are getting. So here we should add a, a variable with the name URL. Okay, and then we're gonna uh, add other things like we wanna make it center and also we wanna make it uh, no repeat. Okay, let's see why we are not able to see it yet. Okay, this one, the map is going to give us this URL. Okay, now, now we are seeing it. So this is a, we get the URL and then here we just say swiper is fly and then we're gonna have a div and we set the height and also the style is going to be the background with this URL that we are getting from the map and we show it here. So we see it like this. And if you want to see it in a full size, we can just add another things here, uh, like uh, background size, background size, and then we set it to be cover. So background size, okay, we need to add a comma here. Okay, now it's okay. Now you can see it is a full size. And because we don't have two images for this listing, we see only one. Let's uh, go and add more images. For example, for this one, um, for this one, we have three images. Let's go to the page. And then now we have a slider here. We can click and go to the next images. So this is coming by the adding the navigation. So that's it for the adding the swiper. Let's add this one to the GitHub because I, I don't want to make the, this section too long. So here we want to add this one. We just say add image a slider to the listing page. And we can just commit and push it to GitHub. So in the next section, we're going to continue and complete this page. So see you in the next section. So after the, this text white, we can just bring it to the center using text center. And then we can add some padding, for example, padding one. 
And then we can make it rounded using rounded medium, for example. I think that's it. And for the other one, it's going to be very similar, but we need to add a condition. In other condition, just completely show it or don't show it. So we just uh, create one condition here. We just say if listing dot offer is true, then show this. So which is going to be a paragraph. And inside the paragraph, we're going to uh, just write down dollar. And then uh, we just say, not like this, we want to say dollar. Yeah, we just say, if the listing, yeah, we just want to convert the listing, we just say listing dot, we want to convert it to number. So listing dot regular price minus listing dot discount price. So because this is not an offer, we don't see it. Let's change this one to offer. So here, I'm going to change the this one to offer. So as you can see, this is 790. Let's make it 700 and 80, so $10 discount. So as you can see, we see $10 now. And then let's style this one similar to the one in the top. So I can just copy the style here and paste it here. But here, I wanna change its background color to be green instead of red, okay? And then we wanna bring them next to each other by changing its display to flex. And then we wanna add a space between them by just adding gap for example, four. I think that is fine. In the big screen is fine too. Okay, so that's it for the styling of that. So after this diff, what we want to add is the, we want to add the description. So we added paragraph here and inside the paragraph, we want to say listing dot description. So we should see the description here. Let's add more text to the description. For example, I can copy this text and then uh, I just edit this one so we have a more description so we can style it better so before the description just showing the description we want to say description with the capital D and then we want to add some dash here okay we can see it like that and what I want to do is to make this description uh, bold so instead of doing this one we can add a span here we just say span and inside the span i want to add this description and then we can style this a span we just change its font to be for example we set it to be semi bold and then we set the text to be black because i want to change the description in a lighter color so we change this description's color to black. Okay, this one, and then we can add another space here too. And we should add it like that. Okay, so it's fine. Description, and then we want to style the paragraph. We just want to add text a slate, for example, 800, which is a kind of lighter color. And I see a problem here because we don't have the padding. So this paragraph actually should be inside this this div. So this is the div at the top. We have another div that has some limit. So it should be inside the this div. Okay. So now we have this padding as well. So we don't have weird uh, styling. So after this paragraph, we want to add a UL unordered list. And inside the unordered unordered list, we want to have different things. Like we want to have this number of beds, bath, parking, and furnish. So the first one the, is going to be, for, uh, we just added the bedroom. So we need to add some icon. So here we add a, uh, an icon here. We just say F A bed, which is coming from react dash icons. Let's close this. We should see it here, this bed icon. So I just want to change its style to make it larger. We just say text LG. And then after that, we want to have a condition. We just say if the listing the bedrooms are the length of that, for example, the number of that is more than one, then 
we want to just uh, show the listing bedroom and then say bedrooms or beds like this. We want to say listing the bedrooms and then we just say beds. And then otherwise we just want to say bed or we can just say one bed because it's, it can be plural or singular. So now we have two beds and if we modify this one to one bed, you can see it's show, it's showing one bed instead of two uh, two beds. So and then also we want to bring them next to each other. We just want to add a class name here with the display flex, and then we want to use item center to bring them to the center vertically. We can add a space between them by just saying gap. For example, uh, gap just gap one is enough. I think one bed. And uh, the other things we need to add, I think that's fine. And then we can add white space, no wrap. So when we have a bigger screen, I don't want this one bed shows like one and bed go under that. So we just say white space, no wrap. The other things I want to do is I want to change the text color to be green, 900. And then we set the font to be semi bold and the size of the text to be a small. So it's going to be like this. Actually, we can add these three to the this unordered list to be able to apply it to all the lists. So we can just add it here so we don't need to add them separately. So we still see the color is red and every X color is green and text is a small. So let's add one more for the uh, bathrooms. So we just copy copy it one more time and this icon is going to be bath we need to import it at the top as you can see it's, a, uh, it's still showing bed so we just change this one to bath and then this one is going to be we can just change this one by control d and then we just say bathrooms so it's two bathrooms i feel they are not aligned this one are not aligned now, it's, I think uh, this icon is bigger, so we can just bring them next to each other by, by adding flex to this UL. And then we want to add a space between them. So we can just use item center first to align them vertically. And also we want to add a space between them. We just say gap 4 in the mobile size and the, in the bigger size. After the mobile, I want to change the gap to be 6. So like this, and then in the bigger screen, we have more space. So let's see the final version. Uh, we have, I think yeah, that's okay. That's the same things we are doing here. Okay. So after this, we're going to have the parking and other things. So for the parking, uh, let's actually copy this one one more, two more times. So one for the parking. So the conditions here are different and also the icon is different. So the icon is going to be for the parking, FA parking. We need to import it. And then here the condition is listing. If listing the parking is true, we want to see that. We want to say if the listing. So if it's true, we want to say parking or we want to say no parking. Or we just say parking a spot and no park. So no parking for this one. And then for the last one is going to be the furnished. So we just say FA chair. And then we need to import it. And the condition for this one is going to be similar. We just say if listing that furnished is true, we want to say furnished. Otherwise, we want to say unfurnished. So this is furnished and we have no park two no parking, two baths and one bath. In the bigger screen, we have it like this. I think in the final version, we don't have too much space after the uh yeah, I think the spaces are a little bit more here. Let's see. So in the div at the top that is covering all of them here, I added margin y. And gap six, I can change this one to gap four. And then after the, you just remove the margin here. Okay. So, okay, it looks better. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. 
The other things I want to check, it's, uh, it's in the real mobile size. For example, if you inspect it and then make it mobile, we should uh, we can see a little bit of problem here because this furnish is went outside and made this screen a little bit bigger. So we can fix this one by adding inside this on order list. After the flex, I want to change the flex to flex wrap. So flex wrap means if we have a if they cannot stay in this screen, they go to the next line like this. So it's working in the mobile size as well. Okay. I think that was it for this uh, section. In the next section, we're going to work on this contact landlord. So if this uh, listing is not yours, you should see a button here saying contact landlord. When we click on it, uh, let's see. Let's refresh the page first. As this is the a free version I have put it inside the render so if you see it like this is uh, just moving because render for the free version if there is no traffic for the website this is going to make it sleep so it takes time to be awake but it's fine if you uh, use their paid version you don't see this delay but this is not always when you have enough traffic you don't see the actually this delay so now it's refreshed now if you click on this Contact icon, you see uh, contact this person, the name and for the this title. And then we can just write down the message uh, and then send a message. And this is going to open your default email software. And the message is going to be there. And also you're going to have the uh, other information, the email of the person as well. So in the next section, we're going to work on this section. So in the sending message to the uh, owner. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So here we just add all of them. I have just modified the create listing and update listing. And, and this is going to be complete uh, listing page. So we can just uh, commit and push to GitHub. So that was it for this section. In the next section, we're going to work on the contact landlord part. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed our page until here. In this section, we're going to do the contact land role. As you can see from the final version, we have a button saying contact landlord. When we click on it, this is going to, first thing first, the mess, the button is going to be disappeared. We're going to have a different button saying send message. And then we have to get the information of the user like its username and then the, we get the title from here and then we write down the message. When we write down a message, for example, we just say hello. When we click on send message, a window is going to pop up, which is your default email, the email address of the person who has created this listing is going to be filled in the to section and also subject is going to be the name uh, and the title of the listing and also your message is going to be here. So it's ready to send and we click send this. This is going to send the message. So we want to first thing first, we want to add the button and then we want to add some conditions. So if the person is not authenticated, shouldn't be allowed to see the button. And also if you are, if this person is already created this one, cannot see this listing as well. So I'm going to create the conditions first. So let's go back to listing.jsx and after that div here, it uh, should be this one. Okay, this one has the, the max width 4XL. I think we need to put it inside this one, otherwise uh, the button is going to be bigger. So let me add a button. So let's bring this one to the left side so we can see the changes here. So we're going to have a button saying contact landlord landlord okay see it here let's style it so i'm gonna just apply a simple styling like a background a slate 700 let's change the text to be white and then we're gonna have a rounded corner let me make it uppercase when we hover over it we want to change its opacity to 95 percent okay it's like this, and then we're going to have a padding of three. 
So we're gonna have it like this, and then we have the hover effect. So everything is uh, looking okay. So we wanna add the condition now. So we wanna add a condition. We just say if there is a current user. So if you remember, we have the current user from the React Redux, and only if there is a current user and if the person is the owner. So we have the listing here. So let's see, at the top, we have this listing. If there is a listing, and then if the listing that user ref is not equal. So we wanna other people than the owner of the listing see it. So if uh, you, this one is equal to current user that underline ID, and then we wanna see the button. So here we're gonna bring up this button. Okay, so let's see what error we are getting. Let's refresh the page. Okay, current user is not defined. So we need to bring the inside the current user. So we can use the use selector. Here I can import use selector from React Redux. And then inside here, I'm gonna get the current user using that use selector. And this is going to be a state that user. Okay. So now we are not getting an error. Let me refresh the page one more time. So for this true and false, we can just remove the console log here. I feel we, uh, okay, this one, I can remove this console log. So let's ref So now we are not getting anything here. So now we see the contact land road. Actually, we shouldn't be able to see it. Let me see. I think we are the owner of this. So the listing that user ref is not equal to current user dot underline ID. And then we want to see it. Uh, let me check. Uh, let's, let's try to another listing. For example, I go to this person's profile ref, and then I sh click on show listings. Let's try the other one. This one. Are we still seeing this contact land room? So let me console log these current, uh, let me console log this, uh, listing that user left and also the current user that underline ID. So we go to the top here after this current user, let's add a console log for the current user that user, uh, sorry, that underline ID. And also we want to console log listing that user ref. So let's see the console. Okay. The first one is undefined actually. So what is the, uh, what was the first one? Current user that underline ID. So that current user is not wor uh, uh, working, but if there is no current user, we cannot see even the button too. So let me console log the current user itself, not the ID. Okay, it's showing me current user. Okay, we have current user, but the underline ID is undefined. So. Let's try it again, and then we find the reason. Okay. Okay, I got the, I got it. Why with this one actually should be the structure like this because otherwise this is just the uh, user, not current user. And then now we try. So now we see both the current user that underline ID and the other one, so they are equal. So now we shouldn't see the button. Okay. So let me delete this console log. And then here, so we have the current user and it shouldn't be equal. So what I want, what we can do is to create a log out. Uh, I'm going to copy this URL, put it here, and then I'm going to sign out and sign in with another person. So I, I should be able to contact that person. So I'm going to uh, sign in with an, my another Gmail. And then here, I'm going to paste this link. So here I should be able to see this contact landlord. So because I'm signing with another person. Okay. So it's working. And then what we want to do when we click on this button, we want to activate a piece of state called contact landlord. And then we remove this button and we want to show other things. So I want to add a piece of state here at the top and we call it contact. We just call it contact for example, and we set it to be false at the beginning. 
And then when we click on this button, so we can add an on-click event listener, and then we're gonna have a callback function. We wanna set that contact. So we wanna set it to be true, okay? And then we wanna add a condition here. So we just say, if this one is true, don't show this button. So we're gonna say, and not contact. So if this one is true, this is going to be false, so we cannot see the button. So now we see the button. When we click on it, the button is going to be disappeared. But instead of the button, we want to see something else. We want to say if there is a button, and then uh, if the, the contact is true, show something else. We just say contact. Oh, we need to add a condition here. If there is a contact, show. So I want to make a component for the contact. So we just say contact component. Let's close this. And then we need to create this component. So we go to the Explorer section inside the components in the SRC folder. I want to create another component called contact.jsx. <clears throat> and, and then we can use RFC to create a React functional component. So, and then we can import it here. We just use control space to import it. So when I click this on this contact, we, I should see the contact that we have here. So inside this, I want to add some, some F, actually, first we need to send this listing information as a prop. So here I want to say, send the listing. And then this is going to be equal to that piece of state that we have listing. Okay. And then we want to get it in, as the input of this contact. Uh, we can just get a like a prop and then destructure it, but we can destructure it directly. We get the listing. So here instead, so what I want to do, actually, I want to actually get the information of the user, this landlord. So we need to create a API route for fetching the information of a user, a public user. But for doing that, you need to be uh, authenticated. So you need to have a current user as well. So we're going to protect that API route as well. So let's go to API. Let's me close this one. And then we go to the first, we create the route user.route.js and we just create a get request. We just say router.get and then we want to create a request. Uh, we can just say we don't need any address. We just say search for this ID and the person should be verified. So we need to add the verify token. They need to be authenticated. So let's see, not this one, verify token. So it's already uh, imported the verify token. Also we want to, uh, we just say get user. And then we need to import it from the controller. So we need to create it first. But we just import it now, so we don't forget to import that. I can close this user dot route, and then we go to controllers and user dot controller dot js. And here at the end, I want to create that API route, and then the name is going to be get user, and then we're gonna have the request response and next for handling the errors. Let me close this, and then it's very simple. What we do is just to get the user. So we just say const user is going to be equal to await user. And then we're going to search for the user based on the parameters that we provided for the API endpoint. And then if the user is not existed like this, we want to return an error using our error handler. We just say user not found. Otherwise, we want to bring back the user, but we don't want to bring back the password. So we're going to separate the password, but we should call it something else because we have used it somewhere. We just call it pass. And then we separate it with the rest, which is inside the user that underline doc. And then we can return this uh, rest. So this is like this. And then also we can add a try and catch a statement as well to handle any other possible errors. So we can put everything inside try. And in the cache, we're going to use our next to handle the error. Okay, so everything is okay. We have created this API route for get the user. So now inside the contact.jsx, we can use that API route to get the information. 
So what we do here is to create firstly a piece of state called landlord. And then this is going to be null at the beginning. And also we need to import use a state. Let me delete this. And then we want to fill this information. So we have the landlord. We just use use effect. And then we just run it one time based on this. Uh, we just uh, add the listing that user ref. If this one changed, we want to run this one. But it's, this is going to be run one time when the contact uh, is uh, the component is called or shown in the page. And then we want to fetch this uh, landlord. This is going to be asynchronous. We can use try and catch. We get the response. If you remember, we had forward slash API forward slash uh, just the listing that user ref. So I'm going to add a dollar sign here, listing that user ref. So what we want to do here, we just want to, because it's a get request in it, we don't need to add anything. And then we get the data by getting, uh, converting it to JSON. And then we set the landlord to this data, which is the user information. And then we can just close the try and catch a statement for the, uh, we just, we can just console log the error or we can just, uh, we can just create a message and show it too, but uh, it's very simple to do that. I just want to, for simplicity, console log the error, but you can just add another piece of state called for the error and then show it to user under the button that error. For example, user not found or something like that. But if there is no user and it, if the person is not authenticated, they are not even able to see the button to reach to this point. So actually, uh, we don't need to be, that one would be useless even adding that. Okay. So, and then we're going to close this function and then we want to call the function. So this is going to get the landlord's information. Now we want to show it here. So let's uh, remove this div. And then here I want to have, if the landlord, if there is a landlord, we want to show these things. Otherwise, we don't want to see any of these things. So what we want to see here, let's add a div here. And then inside the div, we're going to have a paragraph. And inside the paragraph, we just say contact. And then we want the person's, uh, we want a, con a username. We want to show the username. So we add a span here. And then here, we just say landlord.username. So we get the landlord by fetching the data. And then we show their username. So if I click now on the contact, we are not seeing anything yet. Let me see. Let me see if there is an error here. Let's, let's refresh the page. So we click on contact landlord. Okay. They said not found. It means that uh, the URL we have provided is not correct. So actually, uh, uh, this one is, should be API forward slash user forward slash ID. Because uh, in the backend, in the index.js, we just say for slash API for slash user. And then inside the user.route.js, we just set the ID. So that should be correct. So let's refresh the page and try again. Okay, now it's working. We just say contact this person's uh, username. Okay, so it's working now. Let's bring this one to the right side. And then what we want to do is to... After this span, we want to say four, and then we want to add uh, another span saying the listing.name. So we have the listing as the input. We just say listing.name, and then we want to make it lowercase. So we just say two lower case. So let's try again. When we click on contact landlord, we just say contact this person for new listing updated, which is this title. And if it's capitalized, we want to make it lowercase. So that is fine, but we can just some uh, add some simple styling for that. So we can just, uh, for this uh, span, for example, this username, we want to add, we want to make it bold. So we just say font semi bold. And then for this one too, we can make it semi bold. So I'm going to copy this and add it to this span. Okay. So it sounds good. And then we want to have this message text area. So after this 
one we're gonna have an text area so with name we just say message the id is going to be message for the columns and we don't need any columns but for the rows we just say two row so make it a smaller and then the value for this one so we need to actually create another piece of state called message the initial value would be an empty string and then here we just say value and this is going to be that message piece of state and then we want to have an unchanged event listener which is going to call an unchanged function so we can create the function here at the top which is going to set the message to e.target.value so we're going to save the changes inside the message so let's see okay so we can now do changes here. So let's add some styling to this text to be able to see it properly. So if you don't have any text, we want to have a placeholder. We just say placeholder. We just say enter your message here. And then for the a styling, uh, let's add a class name. I want to set the width to be full first to make it uh, full. And then we want to add the border. And then we added some padding of three. And then we want to make it rounded large. So I think it's fine. And then we can add some space here by just making this one flex, flex column. There, I want them to be on top of each other. And also let's add some gap between them. We just say gap two. So after this text area, we want to have another button or Instead of the button, we want to add a link because I want to activate that email. So we add a link which is coming from React Router DOM. We're going to close this. And inside the link, I want to just say send message. And then uh, for the two is going to be like this. If you want to add a back tick, this is going to be mail to. This is going to activate your mail system in the, in the Windows. And then this is going to send it with the email of the landlord. The subject of the email is going to be regarding listing that name. And then for the body, we want to send this message. So GitHub Copilot is getting smarter and smarter. That's, uh, I like it here. Okay. And then uh, we want to uh, style it a little bit. So we want to add some class name. We want to add a background, a slate. 700 we want to make it text white and what else we can just make it bring it to the center using text center and then let's add some padding of three we want to make it uppercase rounded large and when we hover over it we want to have opacity of 95 so this is happening when you actually uh, uh, when you write down more code so github copilot is not only using the code from the internet they use your code as well so they understand your styling of the code and the the more you reach to the end of the project the better suggestion you get okay so now i think it's ready to be tested we just say hello i am sending a message regarding your listing and then we can click on send message so this is going to pop up this one to this email subject is going to be regarding new listing updated. And then this is our message and it's ready to be sent. And then this is the email of the owner of this listing. That's it for creating the landlord uh, button, contact landlord button. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So here I'm going to add all of them. As you can see, we have created the API route and also we have created a new component called contact so here the message is going to be add contact landlord landlord functionality to the listing page okay and also we can commit and push to get out so that was it tool for creating this page so in the next section we're going to work on the search functionality so we want to add the API route for the search. Actually, this is the most difficult part of the uh, project. I, I highly recommend you just uh, pay more attention to this part. So we're going to have a create a, an API route for the search functionality. We want to add 
we want to be able to create like a, a pagination. We want to add some uh, condition for the search and etc. So see in the next section for adding the search functionality to our project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the contact landlord functionality. In this section, we're going to work on the search functionality. And we're, first, we want to create the API route of search. And then after that, we're going to create the page. So let's go to Visual Studio Code. And the first things we need to add is the API route. So we, I'm going to close all the tabs. So we're going to focus on only the backend side. So we go to API. First, we go to route listing.route.js. And then here, we're going to add that router. This is not a protected because everybody can search even with, without authentication. So this is going to be forward slash, for example, get. And then get listings because we want to get more than one listing. And then we don't need to pass any ID because we want to get more than one. So I'm going to add this one to the controller imported here. And then we're going to create it in the controller listing that controller.js. So here at the end, we're going to create export a function called get listings. This is going to be synchronous. And let's close this. So the first things we need to add is to add a try and catch a statement for possible errors. We just say next. We use our middleware to handle the error. And then we, what we want to do here, we want to create the request, but uh, we want to search inside the listing. But before that, we want to get something like limit. We want to limit the page, for example, because we want to make a pagination. Uh, we want to add the limit. We want to have a start index because we want to know which page we are in. And also, uh, we want to get the offer, furnish, parking, type, and etc. Let me show you in the final version what I might mean by that. So if you search something, for example, I search for this word, modern, just pay attention to this URL. So we're going to be inside the forward slash search, and then the search term is modern, which we are getting from here. And the default one is both for the rent and sale. And then, and the sort is less latest. So we can have a sort for the price high to low, low to high and also the oldest. And then uh, we can just search for rent, sale, offer. So when we click on, for example, offer and click on search, you can see that we get only the place for the offer with the offer. For example, this one has a discount, $10 discount. Okay. So, and so, and the URL, when I click on offer, you can see that the offer here is true. And then once we click on search, we're going to accept these things too. For example, we just say parking, false, sort by created at, order by descending. So we have to uh, create this URL. And based on this URL, we can have the information and then we can just search. And also if you have more than one, for example, if I remove this offer, if I remove this search term and search, we're going to have nine uh, listings and then also we have a show more button here so this is the if you click on show more so this is going to show the next one okay so so we should have the ability to do the all these things by just one api route so we want to create only one api route to be able to do all these things so now so what we want to add here for example we want to have a limit so the limit is going to be, we have to parse actually the integer. We're going to have an integer. And what is this request that query? So everything that is coming from here, uh, not, not here, sorry. The, if we have a request inside our API request, that URL, for example, in Insomnia, we can add the limit and other things. For example, we can have a query. And if there is no query, we want to set it to be nine for example so inside insomnia let's make a, a search request for example in listing i want to add a new request and then this request is going to have the name for example we can call it search and then this is going to be a get request for forward slash api forward slash listing forward slash get 
And then we want to add the query. So what I mean by query is here. For example, for the query, we just write, so here we add a question mark. For example, we just said limit to, for example, two. Okay, so this is going to be request that query that limit, and this is going to be two. So we want to say, if there is a limit, use it, parse it, and make a number. Otherwise, use nine, because we want it limited to nine. And then what else we want to do here? We want to have a start index. We just say const a start index. And also this is going to be from request that query that is a start index. And if there is no index, we want to set it to be zero. And also for the offer and other things we can do too. For example, we want to create a variable. We call it offer. And if the, this one is equal to request that query that offer. Okay. But offer can be true or false or it can be undefined because if we don't uh, send, if you don't write down the offer, it's going to be undefined. And we can make it false, we can make it true, or we can make it undefined. So we want to check this one. We just say if, if the offer is equal to undefined or the offer is false, so if the offer is false or undefined, for example, in the final version here, this is by default is false. For example, if I search, offer is false. But if you click on this modern, if you go, for example, in the home page and click on modern, we don't have even the offer. So the offer is undefined. But if you search from here, we can see that offer is false. So in both cases, we want to set the offer. We want to search inside the our uh, database based on this because we just say if it's false or undefined search we should add a dollar sign and then we just say in search inside the database both true and false so it can be false and true because we are not defined the offer we are not defined the offer we want both of them we want the listing which can be offer or not because we are not defining anything. We don't say it false because the user comes to our website. He wants to see every listing by default. But if he choose the offer, he just wants to see the only the offers. So if there is no offer selected, we need to search both of the offers and not offers. So this is the logic. And similar things happens for the rent as well or furnish or we, we need to add all of them like this. For example, for the furnish, so first we just say request that query. We get it from the query. And if the furnish is, is equal to undefined or it is false, we just want to search inside the furnish, both the true and false. So that is exactly the same. And also we can do it for parking. So we just say let parking. And we want to get it from the query. And this is going to be exactly the same. So if the parking is undefined, or false, we want to search both the true and false. And the next thing we want to add is the type. So we just say type, we get it from the query. And then we just say, if the type is undefined or type is all, because uh, uh, all, what does it mean with all? For example, here we have rent and sell together. If this one is selected, which is the selected by default, or there is no type, on the query. So the query is undefined or this one is selected, which is all. In this case, we want to set the type to be, we want to search both the rent and sale. So this should be sale and rent. So you, you should be on, uh, now getting the concept. So we should consider both things, the undefined and all. And here, undefined and false. So this is a default behavior of the search. So if there is no type, or the type is all, search both the sale and type. So after that, we want to get the search term. So the search term, we get it from the query as well. So we just say search term, and this is going to be equal to request that query that search term. And we want to get the sort as well. We just say sort query that sort. And also here, we want to add a, other things. We just say if there is no search, just an empty string. So search for nothing uh, specific. And then for the sort, we just create a constant called sort. And this is going to be 
from the query or is going to be created at because we want to sort it by latest. And then we're going to have the order. So sort created at descending. So this is the default behavior we're going to have created at and descending if there is no sort or, or order. After the order, so uh, everything is done now. We got all the queries we needed. Now we want to get the listings. So we just say const listings. We're going to await and use our listing model. We're going to say find. So here, just I want to keep it simple. Uh, so we just say search on the title. You can add a description as well, but for simplicity, I want to add the title. And then we want to say search for the search term. Rejects means uh, if they have, a, for example, some title. Let me show you here. For example, we have a title. Rejects means search for, for example, when I say modern, you search here, here, all of them. Rejects. Rejects is a built-in uh, search function functionality for MongoDB. And for example, uh, if I search for DE, this is going to find this one as well. So it's not only limited to the word. It can be some part of the word. So we're going to search for rejects. And also we want to add another option, which is I. Which this one means uh, don't care about the lowercase and uppercase. For example, this modern is uppercase. It has a capital M. But when we search for modern lowercase, we're going to get that one as well. So this is this. So search inside the name. Search for the offer. Furnished parking. Search for the type. So everything is ready now. And also we want to sort it as well. So we're going to add dot sort. So we're going to sort it. If you remember, we want to sort it based on the created at. So we want to sort it based on this created at. So sort and order. So we just say whatever sort is, for example, created at descending. It can be a uh, price and descending or ascending. So it can be sorted for different things because we have added latest price high to low and low to high. And you can add it for many things. For example, number of bedrooms. So a number of bedrooms from high to low or something like that, you can add it yourself. It is exactly the same. And also after the sort, we want to limit this one too. We just want to limit it to limit. Uh, we, we have to find the limit at the top here. And also we want to skip the start index. If the start index is zero, they're going to start from the beginning. But if it's one, this is going to skip the first nine for us because they, uh, we want to limit it to nine by default. So I want to add this one too. So this is going to create a listing for us, get the listing. Now we want to return this one to the user. We just say return or we can just yeah, return response 200 and then we're going to bring back this listing. We can test this one in our insomnia. So I just want to get limited to two. Let's test this one. We get an empty array. So let's see if they have any. Uh, so this one is actually API for slash. I think this one should be listings. Let me check. So inside the index.js, now it's listing. That's correct. And then the API route is get. So this is going to call this function. So let's remove this limit and then we try again. Maybe we have, okay, we only, we are receiving an empty uh, object. So we should have some listing here because we have created before some listing. We, are, I think we still have, uh, if you look at the, our final version and we refresh the page, there's no listing. Okay, let's, okay, maybe I deleted. So let's, let's log out and sign in with, uh, okay, that person doesn't have any listing, but this person has one listing, I think. So if I check here, uh, we have two listings actually. Um, I think I find a problem here. So actually this undefined shouldn't be a string. This one is undefined like this. So I made a mistake here. I just accepted the GitHub Copilot. So, and then, so let's try now. We click on send. Okay, now we are getting all the listings that we have created before. For example, here I have test three. We have updated or something like that. Let's search and we see that we get them. So we're gonna send the search 
return. For example, we just say test. And then we click on send. We get the test three and also test two. Test, test. Okay. So it's working. The search is working. And then I want to limit some other things. For example, this one is furnished and this one is furnished. So all of them are furnished. So I want to limit something that is unique. So parking is true. Okay. I get, uh, let's uh, test the limit. For example, here you need to add and, and then we just say limit, for example. So the first one is question mark. The second one must be from the second one, you should say and, and then we just limit it to two, for example. When we click on send, we just get one and two. And then we want to get the uh, latest one or the, the higher the price because the prices are exactly the same here. So we cannot do it, but it's working. Uh, and then if it's, there is a problem in the real uh, client side, I'm going to fix it. So you just need to add, for example, more query. It can be offer true, for example. So this one, uh, offer is true. So now you are searching both the offer true and offer false, but you can just add, for example, offer false. Okay, offer false actually search for both of the offer and false and true too, based on our logic. I want to just limit it somewhere, but they are exactly the same, but it's okay. Later, we're going to make more, I'm going to make more listings and then we're going to test this one in the client side as well. So that was it for our uh, search API route. So we have just got the queries like limit, start index, offer, furnish, type, search terms, sort and order. And then based on them, we're going to search inside all our listings. We're going to limit them, skip the index we want. And also we want to order them like this. And then we're going to return this listing. So that was it for creating the listing API route. Uh, sorry, search API route. So we're going to add this one to the GitHub. So we just say here, create search API route. So we can just commit and push to GitHub. So see in the next section for the client side of the search API route. All right, in the last section, we have completed the search API route. In this section, we're going to work on the client side. So the first things we need to do is to, when you write down something in the header and we click enter, or we press enter, or we click on this icon, we want to uh, search that term and change the URL, like the one in the final version. For example, here, if I search, for example, modern, and I press enter, we can see that we have the modern here and also in the search term. And also if I change here in the URL, for example, I change it to mod instead. If I press enter, you can see inside the search here, inside the search box, we see the mod. So we're going to be able to get the search term from the URL. And also we have to be able to change the URL inside. So here, for example, if I change it to modern, one, for example, if I click here, you can see the search term is changed already. Okay. So you have to be interactive, two sides. You can search, change this one from URL or uh, change URL from this one. So, okay. So here we go to the header. Let's close everything. And then we go to uh, client side components inside the SRC. And then we go to header.jsx. So the first things I want to do inside this input, I want to add an unchanged event listener. Before doing that, we need to add a piece of state for keeping the search form. So we just say search here or search term. And then the initial value would be an empty string. So, and then we want to track the changes inside this input. So first we set the value to search term and then we want to change this search term by just adding an unchanged event listener and then we set the search term to e.target.value. So now everything is ready. So once we submit this form, we want to uh, create that one. For example, uh, first thing first, we, wanna ch we can change this uh, icon to a button. So we just say button. So we want to submit the form with this button as this form as well. So we bring this one to this button. So 
when we click on this icon, we want to submit the form too. And what else we want to do is when we submit the form by enter, which is we can use this up unsubmit event listener. And then we want to call a function called handle submit. So once we add it, we add this one, we can create the function at the top. Here, we can create the function and then we can close it. And also we want to prevent the default behavior of a form by just saying e that prevent default. So we don't refresh the page. And also, as I mentioned before, we want to get the URL inside the search. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So here we search, we have search term, okay? And then, but if you want to add, for example, other things, for example, if I want to add the offer true, and then we search, we see that we have more than search term. We have other things as well. We have type all, we have parking. So when I uh, change this one, for example, to mod and search, we want to keep this, the previous queries. We want to keep this one. We don't want to delete them. So in order to get this information, we can use a, a method in uh, React, a built-in actually JavaScript uh, constructor called URL search params. So we can get the, the URL data with just the URL params. And this is going to be equal to new URL search params. And what we want to get is this, we want to add this from window.location.search. And then once we have all the information, we want to change its search term because we want to change the search term to this search term. So we just say URL, perhaps whatever we have previously, we want to set the search term to the search term we are submitting the, that we are changing inside. And then once we want to do, we want to navigate the user to this URL. So uh, f uh, once we, uh, what we want to do here, First, we want to get all the URL, uh, the search query. So the search query, and then we want to convert this URL params and the new one to the string because some of them is number, some of them are other things. We want to convert it to string first, and then I want to navigate. In order to navigate, we can use use navigate from React rather DOM. We just say use navigate. We import it, and then we initialize it here. And then we want to use this navigate. We just say navigate to forward slash search and then with all these search queries that we have. Okay, so now if we test our application, uh, it's not working. Let's see the error. Uh, probably I didn't import user state. Okay, I import user state and then we try. Okay, it's working now. So let's search, for example, for something like mod and I press enter. So the search. As you can see, the, we have forward slash search, and then we have search term mod. And let's change this uh, to, for example, modern inside the URL. As you can see, we don't see it here. The reason we don't see it here, because we don't have a use effect to each time the, this term changes to be able to change this one. So we need to actually add a use effect react hook here. Sorry, use effect. So we just import use effect from react. And then what we want to do, if uh, we want to get the URL params from the URL, so const URL params, we can use the URL search params constructor. We can get it from window.location.search. And then we want to get the search term. We want to get it this time. Last time we set it, I mean, we added. it. This time we want to get that. So we just say URL params dot or we just, uh, first let's, let's make a constant. We just say search term or URL search term or search term from URL, we can call it because I want to be, make it more specific because we have already that you uh, do that variable. We just say URL.get and then we get the search term. And then what we want to do, if there is a search term from URL, we want to set the search term to that one. And then also we want to, uh, add it like this if the so let's the, actually we don't need the window here if the location that search changes we want to search and we want to actually update our search term now we can see the modern here inside this one let's change this one to for example uh whatever we just say s we see the s here and if we change here for example to sahan we see sahan here so it's interactive and also if we have other queries 
for example, if I add something else, for example, offer equals to true, we still have this hand. If I change the search term to S, we have S here, and also we are keeping this offer true. And also if I change it to modern here, for example, we keep the offer true here. So that is working actually. So what else I want to do? I want to create this search page because we don't have this page yet, but let's do it for the next section. So let's add this one to GitHub because it's going to be a long video if you don't do it. So we just call this one update header search form, or we can just say complete header search form functionality. And then we can commit and push to GitHub. So in the next section, we're going to create this search page and then we're gonna make it like the one in the final version. We wanna have it two sides. In the left, we wanna have the, the conditions and another button. And then in the right side, on the right side, we can see the result. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the header search bar functionality. We could achieve changing the URL based on this uh, search bar. In this section, we're going to work on the creating the search page. And also we wanna have the UI of the page first because I, it's gonna be a long video. So I wanna separate it first, we create the UI and then we wanna add the unchanged event listeners. We track the changes here. And also after that, we wanna show the results. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and then we bring the website to the right side. So we can just, uh, first we wanna create the page. So we go to the pages and then we create a page called search jsx and then we can use the rfc to create a react functional component and then inside the app.jsx we want to add that page so this is very simple we don't have any like a id or something we are passing this is just uh, we create a route and then we just say with the path forward slash search and then we want to call this one a search which is coming from forward slash page forward slash search and then now we can see in the page, we see the search, which is coming from search.jsx. So it's time to create this one. As I mentioned before, the, it has two parts, the search side information, and also the listing results side. And in the mobile side, we see them on top of each other. And also in the, after the mobile side, we see them next to each other, after the tablet size and above. So what we, I wanna do here, let's start, so here we're going to have a div and inside this div, we're going to have one div for the left side and one div for the right side. So I'm going to just create a div here and then we're going to have another div for the right side. So in the left side, we're going to have a form. We don't need an action for that. For the right side, we're going to have an h1 tag just uh, saying results, listing results, for example. We can just add that one. We just say listing results and then we add a comma here so we see it here on the top and in the inside this form we're going to have different things for example we want to have if you remember here in the final version we have a search term we have pipe rent uh, sell and offer it can be offer amenities and sort for example for the search term let's bring uh, make them inside a div because i want to have a div for having these both things and then we want to have a label and then we have the input. So we want to have a div and then inside this div, we want to have a label and this label is going to be, we don't need actually HTML form for that, but this is going to say search term. You can say it like this. Let's see. Okay. We have search term. After this label, we're going to have an input with a type of text. And then this is going to have an ID of search term and then this is going to have a placeholder saying search and then we're going to have an, a style for that we just add a class name i want to add a border for that we could make it simple like the previous inputs we make it long rounded large and then we can add a padding of three for that and then we can want to make the width to be full so now uh, for styling this 
for the uh, diff that is covering both these two, we want to make that make them flex so they come next to each other. But I don't want this label to be on top of each other like search term. So here we can add a class name too. We make uh, the white space no wrap. We choose this one, and then for the uh, flex, we're gonna have a flex item center to align them vertically. Items center. And then we're going to add some gap between them. We just say gap two. So that's it. And then also we can see they are just connected to the wall. So that's not good. We want to add some padding for the parent as well. So what we do here uh, for the div that is covering this one, we can just add a padding of seven. So we push them a little bit inside. And then we want to add a border bottom. So we just say border B for border bottom and then we just say border bottom 2 because we want to have a border between these two when they are in the small size but in the big screen I want to make the border on the right side so we just say after the small size add the border on the right side and also make it 2 that's the thickness of the border okay so and also we what we want to do is to arrange them next to each other when they are in the bigger size. So this one actually should be medium because I wanted the tablet size to have a border too. And then here we want to make the class name. We want to bring them next to each other when they are in the tablet size and above, but they should be on top of each other in the, the small screen. But in the medium size and above, I want to make the flex direction to be a uh, row. So they are next to each other. So now, now they are on top of each other. And then when we go more than medium, you see they are next to each other. But this border, I want it to be until here. So what we want to do is to add a minimum height for the medium size and above. I want to make the minimum height to be a screen size. So this is going to expand this border up to the end. Okay. And also in the small screen, you see it's working. Okay, what else we want to add is I want to make, I don't want to make them half half in the screen. Actually, now you can see it's actually this size, but if you add more things, this is going to take more space. So well, let's see, first we try and then we check. If there, there's no problem, it would be fine. And then what else we want to add after the, this form, the, after this div, we want to have another div for handling the type. So I want to add another div. So let's close this div. And this div is going to have a label, which is going to say type. And then after this type, we're going to see all these uh, inputs. Like uh, we want to have the all input, rent, sell, and offer. So here we're going to have a div and inside there in this div, we're going to have an input with the type of checkbox. And then uh, we don't have a name for this one. And then the ID is going to be all. The first one is going to be all because it's going to be rent and sell together. And then we want to have, so we can just add a class name to increase the height to be five. But we cannot see it now. We need to actually install the parent first. So what we want to do here, I want to add the span here first. I want to add a span saying rent and sale. Like this. And then here inside the top one, I want to make it flex. So once you make it flex, you see that the checkbox get this size uh, width. And then I want to add a gap between them. We just say gap two. So we add some space and also we want to bring this next to each other too. So we add a class name here. We make it flex. And also we want to add some uh, a space between them. We just say gap two. But uh, if we have more items like one, two, three, four in the small screen, I want to bring the next one here at the bottom. So in order to do that, we can just change the flex to flex wrap. And also we make the item center to centralize everything vertically. So, so now we added the type rent and sale. As you can see, they are just connected, these two. So in the 
in this form, we want to add some style too. So we just, uh, in the form, we can just make it flex, flex column. So they have to be on top of each other. And also we want to add some space between them. We just say gap. For example, I just choose gap eight. So you see the space now. So that was it for this checkbox for the all. And then we have the rent and sell. So we can use this one to create other things. For example, for rent, we can just copy this div and then we just copy it two more times or three more times. Uh, the, the next one is going to be with the ID of rent. And this is going to be rent. This one is going to be sale, the ID of sale. And then here we should say sale or sell. You can write down different way. But it's okay, the same meaning. And then the last one is going to be offer. So the ID is going to be offer. And then we want to have this span saying offer. So we're going to use this ID to later we're going to track the changes. But for now, everything is okay. So now after this div that is covering all these types, we want to have the next things, which is amenities, which is very similar. Actually, we can just copy this one. Copy this type until this type, we can copy it one more time. So instead of type, we should say amenities. So uh, here we just want to say amenities. Okay. And then the first label is going to be parking. So the ID is going to be parking. And then we want to have this, this one saying parking or parking lot. Okay, after that, we're going to have that furnished. So the ID is going to be furnished. And here we're going to say furnished. Okay, and then we want to delete the rest. Let me see if we have added anything else. Okay, parking and furnish. That's it. We can delete the last two. Okay, so that's it for the amenities. After that, we want to add this uh, final version. We're going to add this sort and this selector. So we're going to add a select and then we want to add some options like these options. So here after this div, I'm going to add another div. And inside this div, we're going to have a label. And then this one is going to be for sort. We just write down sort here. And then inside the label, we're going to have a select. We just say select. And then for the select, we're going to have an ID. But as you remember, we have sort and order. In order to understand both of them, we just say sort and underline order because we want to, and then later we want to separate them and get the information from them. So inside this select, so let's add the options. For example, the first option, the value, value we don't add now, later we want to add the value. But for now, I want to just add the price high to low for the text. So as you can see, we have this option now. Let's add three more options. And then the, this one is going to be price low to high. And then for the next one is going to be latest. And the last one is going to be oldest. Okay, so we have all of them here. Let's style this a little bit. For example, I just want to add a flex and then item center. And then we want to add some gap between them. Okay. For the select, we can have a class name as well. For the select, I want to have a class name. Uh, I want to add the border for that. We want to make a border large, rounded large, and we can add some padding as well. So this is going to be like this. For the options, we don't need to add any styling. So that's it. I think it looks okay. Final version. So we have the search term type amenities and sort. And after that, we're going to have a button here, which is going to submit this form. So here at the end, I want to create a button and we just say search. So we should see it now. And then we can style it real quick. For styling that is going to be very simple. Actually, background a slate 700 and the text to be white. After that, I want to have a padding of three around it, large for the corner. We make it uppercase. And also when we hover over it, 
I want to see opacity of 95. So that's it. I think it's enough. For the listing here on the right side, we want to add some styling as well. A simple style because later we want to add the cards. But just for now, I want to add some simple styling. So everything look, is looking okay, actually. And then in the here, what we want to add, I just, for this class name, I want to make it larger with just a text 3XL. And then we want to make the font to be semi-bold. And also we want to add border at the bottom. Also, we want to add some padding of three for this. And finally, I want to make it a little bit lighter. We just say text a slate 700. Okay, so this one is looking okay. Uh, let's add more margin at the top. So we just say margin top five. So I want to add some margin, more margin. So this one looks fine. Uh, you can actually make this one bold too. Search term type amenities and salt. Let's quickly add these two, these things too. So inside the form for the label, I just want to add font semi bold. So where is the other labels like this one? You want to add font semi bold. So let's copy this class name and add it to the other labels. So where is the other label amenities and also sort. Okay. So I think this is fine. So we have completed the UI of this page. In the next section, we're going to get the information by changing this form. And also we want to add the ability to search and change the URL as well. So let's add this one to the GitHub. So this one is create search page UI. And then we can commit and push to GitHub. So see in the next section, for the functionality of the search page. All right, in the last section, we have completed the search result page UI, and we have created this uh, menu on the left side. In this section, we're going to add functionality. We want to track the changes here, and then we want to change this URL based on the changes we do here and we click here on search. So the first thing we need to do is to go to Visual Studio Code. I want to add a piece of state here at the top and I want to call that one a sidebar search params or sidebar data. So we can just create a piece of state. We call it sidebar data and then this is going to be, uh, this is going to have a function set sidebar data and also the initial value we want to define here. First, we need to import user state. We don't need this react anymore. And then here we just create the initial value. For example, for the search term, it's going to be an empty string. For the type, uh, it's going to be all as a default. Then for parking, we want to set it to be false for furnish it's going to be false for offer it is going to be false as well for the source sort we want to make it uh, created at as a default and for the uh, order the initial value would be descending so let's add this comma here so we don't get an error so now we have this piece of state we want to fill this one using a, an unchanged event listener and a submit function. So first we create a function here called handle change. Let's close this one. I don't want to do anything now. Let's add a, a, the unchanged to the inputs and also the value for them. And then we can come back to the handle change function to complete the functionality. For example, for the first input, uh, which is for the search text, we set the value to be sidebar data, the search term. And also we want to add an unchanged event listener, which is going to call that handle change function. Next, we have the input for the rent and sale. So for this one, we want to add, let's make it like this. So we want to add an unchanged event listener, like the one in the above, which is going to call the handle change. 
And also we want to make this one checked if the sidebar dot type is equal to all because both rent and sell we want this one to be checked. And as the initial value is all, and if you check our website, we should see this one is checked by default, rent and sell. So that's it for this one. For the rent is going to be similar. We're going to have unchanged event listener, which is going to call the handle change. And also it's going to be checked if the sidebar the type is equal to rent. Then for the sale, let's do it real quick. We add an unchanged event listener, which is going to call handle change. And then this is going to be checked if the sidebar data the type is equal to sale. For the offer, we have unchanged event listener. And then this, this is going to be checked if the, this is different from the previous one. So this is going to be checked if the sidebar dot offer is true. Okay. And then for the parking, this is going to be similar to the offer. We just add unchanged. And then this is going to be checked if the sidebar data that parking is true. Then for the furnished, we, add, we can add that one. Okay, so the sidebar that furnish is true. We can, this is going to be checked. But for the select, it's going to be a little bit different. So we want to add the value for them. We want to add the value to the options and then the unchanged event listener to the uh, select. So for the select, we're going to have an unchanged event listener. Let, let me bring this one down so we get the suggestion. So we're going to have an unchanged event listener, which is going to call the handle change. And then we want to have a default value. For the default value, I want to set it to be created at and also descending. So we just say created at underline descending. So this is going to be the default value. But the, for the first option, the value is going to be, let's, uh, let's just say, the first one is regular price, regular price descending. And also we can do it for the other ones. Uh, just do it a uh, regular price. If you do it for the discount price, because sometimes we don't have discount price. So this is going to have a problem. So you need to have a condition, for example, if there is an offer, choose the discount price, otherwise use the regular price. But actually the prices, mostly if you uh, just uh, sort it by regular price would be enough. So here, this is going to be ascending regular price ascending ASC. The next one is going to be recreated at descending. And the last one is going to be created at but ascending. So let me fix this one. Okay. So now we have all the unchanged event listener. So what we want to do, we want to complete this handle ch uh, change function here at the top. So there are some conditions because the inputs are different. Sometimes the input is a uh, Boolean, sometimes it's text, and sometimes it has a value like the uh, rent or something like that. So we want to have a condition. We just say if the e.target.id is equal to all or e.target.id is equal to rent so three the, these are they have a value like sale rent and all so in this case if it is all rent or sale we set the uh, sidebar data we keep the previous information and then we change the type to be either target.id for example a type can be all can be rent or sale okay so we're going to close this condition so what is the next condition so the, con the next condition, it can be a search term because so if the search uh, either target that ID is search term, we want to just change the search term. So we just say if E dot target dot ID, let me close this so they don't get an error. This one is equal to search term. Then we want to set the sidebar data we keep the previous information and then the search term is going to be e.target.value so we have handled the search term as well and after that we want to 
it it can be true and false. So the true and false are parking, furnish, and offer. So we can just say if e dot target dot target we have that parking or we have that furnished or we have that uh, e dot target dot id offer. So we want to set the sidebar, keep the previous information, and then this one instead of parking. Uh, we need to create another condition. We just say e.target.id, whatever ID is, this is going to be to its checked value, but sometimes the checked value is not Boolean. It's, uh, it can be a string, but saying true or false because we are getting the information from the URL as well. So we need to create a condition so we don't get an error here. So we just say if the e.target.checked is true or sorry this or e dot target dot checked is equal to true so it can be a string true or the real true like this in this case in this case we're going to have true otherwise we're gonna have false like this so uh, we're gonna check if the e dot target dot check is true this can be true because we keep it like this boolean true or the e dot target dot check is equal to a string true so it's going to be true otherwise in any other case it's going to be false and uh, after this one so we have uh, the last one we need to track is the sort so if the e dot target dot id is uh, sort underline order if you remember we had let me see that we have, we have this. So we have the select and the ID is sort underline order. So in this case, we want it, uh, first we want to get the sort. We just say sort is equal to, remember we need, we have a two, uh, con two things together. We need to split it. If you remember, we had created at underline, for example, descending. So the first value is going to be sort and the second value is going to be order. So the first value, we split it by underline. The first value is going to be sort. If there is no uh, first value, we just want to say created at. For the order, is going to be the second one. So we split it and we get the second information. And if there is nothing, we get the descending. And then we want to set the sidebar data. We, we get the previous information. And then we add this sort and order to that. So if you remember here, we had sort and order. Now we, we have both of them added there. I think we have done with this part. Let's console log this sidebar data and check our application. We just say console log sidebar data. And then we can just go here. We open the inspect. We go to console. Let's clear this, refresh the page. First, we have the initial value. As you can see, we have the initial value. For example, if I change the search term, to modern, you can see that now the search term is modern. At the same time, for example, I add the offer true. So now the offer is true and also it's Boolean. It's not string. We can add parking and furnished. Parking is true, furnish is true, and we can change the sort. For example, I change it to uh, latest. So now we can see that the order is descending. And also the sort is created at. If you do price high to low, the order is descending and also the sort is regular price. Okay. So what, what we can do with this information? Now we have this information. We want to change the URL based on this information when we click on this search button. So after clicking this search button, I want to submit this form on the left side and change the URL. So let's do this part. So we go to the Visual Studio code. Let's delete this console log. We don't need it now. And then we have this form. We want to add an unsubmit event listener for that. So we have this form. I'm going to add an unsubmit event listener. So once we submit the form by clicking on search, we're going to call a function called handle submit. And then we're going to create this function here at the bottom. So first thing first, I want to prevent the default behavior of the form submission. 
uh, which is the refreshing the page by saying e dot prevent default. You are already familiar with this. And then we need to call this. And also, uh, if you remember before I mentioned that it's not only this one. For example, we have this modern in the search term. I want to keep this one in the in there. When I don't write down anything here and this, I just click on offer, I want to keep this modern. I want to keep this modern in the URL and uh, submit the new one, just changing the offer. Okay. So in this way, we have to get the information of the URL first, and then we do other things. So uh, here inside, uh, we're going to go to the Visual Studio Code inside the handle submit. First, uh, we want to get the information already we have inside the URL. So what we do here, we just say we get the URL params using the, our, the method URL search params. We just need to call it this one. Uh, we don't need to write down anything. So we get the URL params here. And then, so actually we don't need to get the information now. I just want to set the new information. But later we want to add the use effect, which is going to, anytime the URL change, we want to fill the sidebar data with the, that URL. So what we want to do, we want to set the search term to the sidebar.search term. We want to set the type to sidebar.type. We want to set the parking to that. So I'm going to quickly fill this one, furnish to this one. And then we want to offer sort order. And that's it. I think that's it. Finish it. And also we want to say, uh, get the search query by converting this one to a string because we want to now navigate the user to that URL. So we have, uh, we need to import use navigate from react router DOM. We can initialize it here. And then now after the submission, we, we, we have created a, a search query. We can navigate the user to forward slash search with this search query. So let's test this one. For example, if I do now, we get the type all and everything else is false. Parking is false. Furnish is false. Offer is false. And sort is created at order descending. And then the search term is an empty string as well. So that is actually a problem here because we want to keep the previous search term and also previous data. And then when we submit it, we do it. For example, now I search here, for example, Sahan. If I click, we change it. And also we change here as well. But what if I change something in this here? For example, I just say modern. If I search, you can see the URL is changed, but here it is still Sahan. So we want to get the information of the URL and fill this one as well. We can do that by easily adding an un, uh, using a use effect react hook. So this is the next part. So we go to Visual Studio Code and we can add the use effect after this sidebar data. We just add a use effect. We need to import it from react and then First thing first, we want to get the information from the URL. We just a new URL search params location dot search. We get the information. Now we want to uh, we set a new data. For example, we just say search term from URL is URL params these params, and we get the search term from there. We can get the type. We can get the parking, furnish, offer, sort, and also order. Once we get all of them, we want to check if in any situation, for example, if there is a search term or there is a type or parking or furnish, offer, sort, order. If in this situation, if something like this happened, any of them changes, we want to set the, uh, we want to set the sidebar data. For example, if there is a change in search, we want to say search term equals to this one. And uh, in case there is a problem here, we can add the or a string as well. And also for the type, we can do it. We can get the type and all. We can get the parking. If it's true, we get true. Otherwise, we get false. Because URL is a string, we need to add the string here. And then we have furnish, we have offer and sort. 
if there is a sort we set it to be sort otherwise we just say created ant and ascending so in this case we wanna uh, and also we want this one happened if the location the search changes we wanna call this okay let's see what we, error we are getting okay we, I didn't close this if okay so now if there is a change in loc loc uh, location the search we wanna uh, change the sidebar data. So, for example, if I search here Sahan and I change the URL, you can see the change is detected by use effect and also fill this information here. And imagine, for example, we change something here. For example, I just change the order to ascending inside the URL. If you do that, uh, let me see. Now we have the default value. This one actually it's okay. We cannot change this one, but for furnish, for example, we just say true here. If I press enter, you can see furnish is checked. Parking, true. We see the parking is there. So we can change the URL and also from the URL, we can change this one. For example, if I remove this parking and search again, the parking is going to be false. And here, if I change it to latest, we can change it here. Okay, so we have actually all the information. So what we want to do here in this section, we want to actually based on the information we have we want to fetch data from the database so and show the result here so after this use effect we get the use effect we can here fetch the data because we already uh, called the use effect we can fetch the data here we can create a function called fetch listings for example or fetch data and then we need to call this function here because this is asynchronous we call it here and then uh, the reason I actually I explained it before because we cannot change the this one to uh, asynchronous we create a synchronous function here and call it at the end. So what we want to do here we want to sh have a loading effect as well. So here we add a piece of state we call it loading and we set it to be false at the beginning and. Uh, for the loading we do here and also we want to have another piece of state called listings so we can fill it with that use effect. So after that we're going to complete our use effect this uh, functionality here. So we create a we set the loading to actually true and then we want to get the URL. Now we have updated this URL. We got it here. Updated the URL. So we want to get the response based on that uh, search query. So we just say const search query is going to be equal to that U, uh, URL here, URL params. And then we want to convert it to string. And then we, can, we just want to say response is going to be equal to await. We fetch the data. If we remember, we have created a, an API route with this URL forward slash listing. And then we want to get, so forward slash get. Uh, sorry, I think it was, yes, I think it's get. And then inside the controller, yeah, we have created this function here called get listings. So we want to use that function, which is going to be forward slash API, forward slash listing, forward slash get. And then we want to add the search query at the end. And then once we get the data back, we want to convert it to JSON so we can use it and we set the listing to data. Okay, but before that, we can just, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, and then also we want to set the loading to false. We can just add some error effect as well, but it doesn't matter. If there is no listing, we want to say there is no listing at the end. So for now, for loading effect is enough. It can be added, but it's not necessary here. So let's check the inspect and then we go to console. Here we need to console log listing at the top. So now it's an empty array, but imagine, uh, so let's, let's clear this search term because probably we don't have something like that. And then when we search, we get now seven listings, test three updated, something like that. And then if we, for example, added test here inside the input and search, instead of seven, we get four because we want to only with the test three. And then uh, let's, for example, sort this one by 
uh, orders. As you can see, the order is changed from test three to test to test to test three. So actually we are getting the data here. Now it's a good sign. So what we want to do next is to show this information inside the listing result. And we want to create some cards to show them like this more beautiful. So I'm going to do this one in the next section. So let's add this to the GitHub. So what we did here is to add unchange and unsubmit functionality to the search page. Okay. And then we can just commit and push it to GitHub. In the next section, we're going to use this information that we are getting these listings. And then we want to fill this listing result. And also we want to create a card, a component that shows all the information of the listing, including the name, description, uh, like a, we want to add the price and etc. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have added the unchange and unsubmit functionality to the search sidebar search bar. Now we got the information from the database. We want to show this one inside the listing results section. So what we want to do, I want to create a card like this first. So I'm going to create a component inside the client side. We go to SRC components. And then here we're going to create a new component. We call it listing card or listing item JSX. We can use RFC to create a react functional component for now. And then inside the search JSX, let's, let's keep this control log for now. And then we want to, uh, after this listing result here, we want to add some condition here. We just say, first, we want to add a div here. And inside the div, we're going to say if, uh, if there is no loading and the listing that length is equal to zero. So there is no listing. For example, in that search term, we don't have any listing. We want to see some uh, message so we can create a paragraph here. We just want to say no listing found, for example. And then we can just add some quick styling for this. We add a class name. We just make it x, uh, x, uh, x large. And then we want to bring, bring it to the center. Uh, let's change this actually text color to a slate 700. So let's see what we get inside the browser. Now, if I search something that doesn't exist, for example, I just search something like this, we see that no listing found here. And then we want to just add some padding to that one as well. So inside this div at the top, we want to add some padding of seven. Okay, like this. I think that is fine for now. And also for the loading effect, we want to add some other things. For example, we just say if there is a loading, we want to add another paragraph saying loading. So the text large, but we, I want to bring it to the center, this one. So we just say text center. But in order to text center to be working, so we can just add here with full. So we see the loading effect. Okay, but it's not in the center. Okay, so we need to actually, in this div, we want to add the flex and flex direction to column. So I want to add some uh, gap between the everything. So when we do the flex, I think this is going to come inside the center. So let me ch change something. Okay, still getting some. So text center with full. Or oh, instead of this flex col column, we just say flex wrap because we want to actually have these listings come here. And then if there is no space, they go to the next line. Let's see, I can fix that loading. So in the final version, when we refresh the page, we see the loading in the center. So I think the here, that div that is covering everything, we can change the flex to flex one. Let's see now we can, okay, now loading came to the center. Okay, that's fine. So we got the loading effect. After the loading effect, we want to just, uh, if there is no loading, if the loading is false, and then 
if we in this case we want to see the listing that map but we want to check if there is a listing as well so we just say listing if there is a listing to and then we want to map through the listing get the each listing so we're going to add it like this and then here we want to get this listing item we want to add that one here so we just say listing item we want to import it at top and then let's close this and let's close this parenthesis here we have another parenthesis okay and also as we are using the map we need to add a key here so we just say key is equal to each listing dot underline id something unique and then we want to pass the listing as well we just say listing equals listing and then what we want to do is to get this listing inside the listing item as the input. So we just say listing here. And then for example, for now, I want to show the listing dot name, for example. So let's try this. For example, I remove this search term and then I click on search. We get the name of all the listing. For example, if I just, just choose the offer, we see less listings. Let's add parking. Okay. And then we can just sort it by the oldest. Okay, it's already oldest. Let's do the latest. Okay, so it's working. We are showing the, the, the result inside the listing item. Let's make them uh, like a card. So I want to bring this one to the right side so you can see the changes. Actually, you cannot see the changes very nice here. Let's make this one bigger. Okay, this here should be fine. So I want to bring this one to the left side so you can see the changes here as i do so inside the listing item i want to add some for example this div is okay but i want to have a link tag for example in the final version when we click in all the places in this card even here we want to go to the page of this listing so we want to have a link that covers all this card so let's delete this and we want to add a link tag. First, we need to import the link, which is coming from React Router DOM. And then we can cover everything with that link. So we just say link, uh, which is going to forward slash listing and then listing that underline ID. That is okay. So we can close that. So everything should be inside this link. And inside the link, we're going to have an image first. The source is going to be listing dot image url and then we want to add the only the first one because we want to have the first one as the cover so we just say image urls and then we want to get the first one we just say zero so let's see if we get anything here it seems like it's not working let's check the console okay we are getting the listing and each listing should have the image urls okay here uh, it seems like the image urls is not working because I didn't have added any image URLs, but let's see, some of them should have actually. Uh, this one doesn't have to. What about this updated? So let's add some listing with the image so we can see them. So I'm gonna create a listing. For example, here I just write down modern home. We can just copy this one for the name, description and address with the same price. And then I just choose one image from my desktop. Here, I just choose two images, upload them, and then after that, I'm going to create the listing. So as you can see, this listing has an, uh, some picture. For example, if I search now, modern, okay, now we see the image. So now we can just actually style it better. Okay, let's bring this one here, and that's enough. We can style it now. So for the image, so for the alternative text, I just say... Uh, for example, listing cover. And then we want to uh, style this one a little bit. For example, for the class name, I want to add, let's add a height of 320 pixels. But in the a small size and above, in the big screen, I want to set the height to be a smaller, we just say 22 pixels. And then after that, we want to set the width to be full and then set the object. I want to set the object to be covered. So let's keep this aspect ratio of the image. 
And then when we hover over it, I want to change its size, the scale of it to 105%. So I'm going to add 5% to it. So like this, when we hover over it, you see it's bigger now. And then we want to add some uh, transition to the scale as well. So it doesn't quickly change. So we just say transition to only the scale, not all. And duration, we can just say, for example, 300 milliseconds. So if I do, you can see it like that. But this one is actually going over the card. So for the card itself, I want to set the background color to be white, actually. And then we cannot see it anything because we didn't add any other things. Let's add at least uh, some name to it so we can see. So inside here, we're going to have a div. Uh, so it should be inside the, sorry, the link. So we're going to have a div. And inside the div, we're going to have a paragraph showing the listing name, which is the title of the listing. We just say listing.name. Okay, now we see that background white. So what I do here, I want to add the background white. I want to make it flex. And then we bring them on top of each other by changing the flex direction to column. And then I want to make add a gap between them using gap four. So we have some space between. It seems like it's not working. Well, uh, I think uh, the name, uh, uh, sorry, because the link is inside this one, this one's not going to work actually. So we remove this flex. For now, I just want to add some shadow effect. So we just say shadow medium. You can see the shadow. And then when we hover over it, I want to change its shadow to be large. So now when we hover over it, we see more shadow, but I want to, I want it to have with the transition. So we just add a transition in to the shadow. We add some transition to this transition. Okay. Now we have a, and also as you can see, the image goes over this card. So we can fix this one by adding the overflow hidden. So now the image is going to be inside the cover. And after that, we're going to have, we want to make it rounded, for example, large, like this. Let's add more things so we can uh, see it better. So for this paragraph, we can add the padding here. So we're going to have a padding of three. So we push them a little bit inside, we see. Okay, so now we have this padding. And then what we want to do here, we want to style this listing name. So the listing name, the text is going to be large. And also we want it to be with the font of the semi bold. And then we want to change its color to text a slate 700. And also if we have a long, uh, long title, I want to make it truncated like the final version. We want to add some dots at the end. So in order to do that, we can simply add here truncate. So truncate is going to remove the extra letters if we don't have enough space. So we can just uh, test it here as well by editing our listing. So this modern home, I'm going to edit it. So let's add more title name. For example, I just want to copy this one two more times. Create. Why well, it says create list uh, update listing. It's fine. Okay. Update listing. But that one should be updating us. Okay. Let's fix that one too uh, before I forget. So uh, listing item, update listing. Uh, where was it? Uh, here. When we click on the button, it should say when it's loading, we just have to say updating, not creating. Okay. So that's fine. So now if we go to the search page, we can see. Oh, okay. Because they, we didn't put any width for this one, this is going to fill with uh, this. Uh, any name we have, it, this is going to be a stretch. So we need to have a width for our card. So what we want to do here is to add a width. So here, after this div, we're going to say width to be full. Now it's full. But in the large scale, actually, we want to set the... If it's more than a small size, I want to set the width to be only 330 pixels. So we limit it like this. So now you can see the title is truncated by three dots. So it's working now. Let's close this one so we can see the other changes. 
So after this paragraph, we're going to have that uh, address. So we want to do it exactly like the final version. So this is the final version. So we have the name, we have the address, we have the description, price, and the number of bits and path. Of course, you can update it yourself with whatever you want later. So here we're going to have a div. And inside this div, we're going to have that icon, which is MD location on. And this icon is should come from the uh, React icons. We just import this one from React icons forward slash MD. MD, whatever you see at the beginning of the icon should goes at the end. Okay. And then here we want to, uh, let's close this one so we don't get an error. So we see the icon here. After the icon, we want to show the address. So we're going to have a paragraph saying listing dot address. Okay. So the address is modern home too, because we have just write it down like that. So we, we, we want to bring them next to each other. We're just saying flex. And then what we want to do here, uh, we want to make it item center. So we want to align them like this. We want to add some a space between them. We just say gap two or gap one should be fine. So after that, we want to set this icons. We're going to install this icon. We want to set its height to be four and width to be four and change its color to green, green 700. Okay. For the paragraph, which is saying address, we want to truncate this one too and also make the text as small with the color text gray. So here we just say text as small, text gray, for example, 600, and then we want to truncate it. So everything is good, but why they are connected to each other? Because this div, we didn't add anything here. So in this div that we have par padding three, what we want to add here, I want to set the, make it flex and flex column to bring them on top of each other. And also we want to add a gap between them. For example, we just add gap two. So this is going to be some space and it's, I think it's fine now. We can set the width to be full too. So later we want to add other things. We want to set the width to be full to completely bring them in the full screen. So that is okay for the address. After the address, we want to add the description. So description is going to be similar. But if you check the description in the final version, you can see that it is truncated with two lines, not only one line. But we don't have such a class inside Tailwind CSS by default to add two lines and truncate it. But there is some library, there is some plugin we can install to be able to do that. The, the library is called line clamp. So we need to install it on Tailwind CSS. So here we can search for Tailwind CSS line clamp. If you search this one and there is there is a plugin, I think this is the GitHub repository, Tailwind Labs for slash Tailwind CSS line clamp. This is the official plugin of the Tailwind CSS. They created themselves. So when we click on this GitHub repository, we see we need to install it like this. So let's copy this one. And then we just go to Visual Studio Code and we need to install it in the front end. So let me clear this terminal. And we, we, we need to go to the client side, CD client. And then here, I'm going to paste that code to install install it. And then we want to add this one to the tailwind.config.js. So we need to add this plugin here. I'm just going to copy this plugin. And then we go to Tailwind CSS file, which is tailwind.config. Uh, which file was it? Yeah, tailwind.config.js. And then we want to add it as the plugin. So I'm going to paste it here. Okay. So now what uh, we can use it, seems like we are getting an error. So yeah, we are getting an error. Cannot find this module. Okay. So let's uh, see inside the here. We have installed it already. I think we need to restart the server. I'm going to stop it using Ctrl C and start it again. Because when we are changing the config file, we need to restart the 
server otherwise you cannot get it okay now i think we are not getting any error for now let's test this uh, line cramp that we have added first i want to create this description a little bit longer so i'm going to edit this so i'm going to copy this one here and paste it here uh, let's go back i want to paste it two times three times update listing so the description is longer now let's go and search for this one and then bring it here okay th this icon looks like a very small too so what is the problem of that so we set the height and width to be four for this one so well, let's remove this i think it's too small for that no it's not related to that actually so let's see what's the problem here uh, flex item center gap one we also truncated md location on md location on okay seems like this text is pushing this uh, md location we can add some width of full here and uh, this is going to fix it in the paragraph so let's add this uh, description as well so we're going to have a paragraph here with the text uh, listing dot description uh, okay i think i i changed the address instead of the description so that's a problem and that was too long so it happened like this so i think i made a mistake here let's edit this yeah i changed the address so let's cut this one and put it inside the description i just add something in the address so we don't get an error so we update this let's bring this one to the right side we search it okay now description is too long we want to fix this description's problem. So let's style this description. We can add a class name here. And for the description, we want to make this text to be first a small. And then we want to change its color to be gray 600. And then we want to truncate it, but two line. We just say line dash clamp. And then we can just clamp it for two line. As you can see, now we got the two line cramp. You can do it for three lines, you can do it for four lines, and etc. So this is the plugin and it's working now. So everything is done for now for the description. After the description, we want to see the price of that listing. So let's add a paragraph here. And for this paragraph, we're going to have a condition because we want to show the discount price if there is a this offer. And so we just say listing dot offer. If this one is true we want to see the uh, listing dot discount price otherwise we want to see the listing that regular price but if you remember we want to add some comma if you remember inside this uh, final version for example let's search for something else if you for example we see a place we can see that here we have 733 and then we have a comma so in order to add it, remember we, we have just added something at the end of the discount price and the regular price. So we want to do that one here as well. So let's change the listing instead of the rent to be sell. And then let's set the price to be 500,000. And then we update the listing. And then we go here. So let's fix this number. And we did it before for the listing page. So listing.jsx, if you remember for the prices, I have added, uh, it was in the, here. We just added this one, two locales, the string, English, US. So we can add, we just copy this one, okay? And then we go to listing item. We need to add this one at the end of both of them. And we just need to add actually the dots here. Okay, now you see the comma here. That's working. And also we want to add some dollar song dollar here at the beginning. Okay, that's working. So, and then also we want to style this paragraph. We just say text, for example, slate 500. We want to add more space here. We just add margin top of two. And also we want to set the font to be semi bold. And also when it's rent, I want to see uh something else here so after this we want to have we just say if the type is rent show the 
forward slash months like this one. So let's test this one. For example, if I change this listing to rent, we make it rent and then we just say, for example, $5,000 per month. Okay, now it's 5,000 per slash months. So it's working fine. Uh, I think uh, they're not aligned very nicely, but I think it's fine. Yeah, it's working. We can change the flex and then item center to completely align them. Here, for example, we can just say flex and then item center. But I think, yeah, it was okay. It's just, it looks like they are not in the same line. Okay, let's delete this one. They don't need it. So after this uh, price, we want to add the number of beds and number of bathrooms as well. So they want it, I want them to be next to each other like this, four beds and five baths. So they should be next to each other. So we're going to have a div here. So after this paragraph, I want to have a div and inside the div, we're going to have, for example, two paragraph. Actually, we should have another div because we have one div to cover all of them. And also we have one div that is covering four embeds. So we can fix that one by adding another div. And for the first one, we want to add if the listing dot bedrooms is more than one, we want to say, for example, listing dot bedrooms beds. Otherwise we want to say listing the bedroom just bed because it can be one bed or two beds. For example, now it's just a one bed. We see one bed. If we modify this one and then we just change it to two beds, for example, now we should see two beds instead of one bed. So that's working. Let's just style this one so we don't need to style the next one separately. We can just copy this. So the font is going to be bold. And then text should be small or extra small, we can just say, make it too small. I think the final version, yeah, that's similar. Just we need to change the, the color. So we can change the color in the uh, top div so that we can apply it for both of them. We just say text a slate 700 here, okay? And then text is small, it's fine. Let's uh, just copy this one one more time. And here, instead of the bedroom should be bathrooms. So I'm gonna, change this one to bathroom and then this bed should be bath okay and then we want to bring them next to each other we just say flex and then we add a gap between them we just say gap for example four yeah that's okay that's yeah that's exactly like the final version so what is the difference here no Okay, we just have some a space here at the top. We don't have it here. And that's fine, actually. We don't need to add that, so that's fine. Okay. So when we click everywhere in here, we see the shadow effect, and also when we click on it, we should go to this page. So let's uh, try, for example, add some discount for this one too, so we test it. So the regular price is this. We make it offer, and then we just say, Instead of 5,000, the discount price is going to be 480. So $20 discount, we're gonna update it. And uh, the problem here, I just see the 20. We forgot to add the discount here. So in the final version, if we go to an offer, let's add an offer. We see here discount, $10 discount. So we didn't add it, we forgot. So let's add this one too. So we go to listing.jsx here. And then let's see the, let's search for the discount. Okay, here after that, we're gonna have, uh, we can just say off or discount. Uh, that's one is fine too, off. Okay, $20 off, but you can make the off like a capital. Okay, so that is okay too for the, here we are, uh, if I see any other problem, we're gonna fix it at the end of the project. So let's search again. And also I want to see more things like, uh, let's don't search for modern, for example, search. So some of the listings, they don't have image. So we see just the listing cover. That is fine. We can delete them later. And then <clears throat> we can also add some cover, uh, cover too. For example, we can search for 
uh, real estate. We go to images. For example, this image, I want to use this image, for example, as the cover. So we can just use the copy image address. And then inside our card in the image, in the listing item, we just say if there is no image, we just use this one that we have copied. And we have to put it inside the clone. Okay. So if you now go to our website, if you refresh the page, okay, it's not working for this URL. So what was the problem here? So if there is no image, oh, there is an image actually, but the link is broken. So that's a problem. But this is not going to happen because we're going to at least upload an image because we I have created this test by Insomnia. And for example, in Insomnia, I have created a listing, but... For the image URLs, I just added something uh, like this. But if you uh, create a listing, you should upload only images. So this problem is not going to happen. I'm going to delete this one in the, for the next section. But as you can see, they are, they are next to each other and, and it's very beautiful too. And the other thing is, when we, uh, if you remember, we limit the listing to nine listings. So if we, we have more than nine listings, for example, if I add another one, uh, let's paste some text here, new listing. I just gonna copy this one. Just choose one image, upload it. We create this listing. And also if we make another one, that's why we just make it two. Choose an image, for example, I choose this one. So I just want to show you if we have more than nine. So now if we search, we see only nine listings, okay? But it's actually we have 10 listings. So what we want to do, we want to have a show more button here. And when we click on it, we want to see the next nine listings. So we want to add them here, like the final version. So in the final version, for example, I search for no think. We have nine image uh, listings here, and then we have a show more button. When we click on it, we can see we have an extra listing at the end. And also we don't see the show more button because we don't have more than that in the database. So we want to add that show more listing in the next section. So for now, I just want to add this one to the GitHub. So I'm going to add everything. And then we just say, uh, create the listing item component and show all show listings so we can commit and push it to github so in the next section we're going to work on the show more button so see you in the next all right in the last section we have completed creating the listing item i mean the listing item card in this section, we're going to add the show more button when we have more than uh, nine items in the listings. We want to have a show more button. When we click on it, we want to fetch more listing. So we can go to Visual yeah. Studio Code. We go to, we can close all of them. And then we can, we can just go to the listing uh, search.jsx page. First, we want to add a piece of state called show more button or show more. So let's delete this console log. We just create show more. We set it to be false at the beginning. But when we fetch data in the use effect here, if the data is uh, more than, so it's equal to nine, it means there is a possibility that we have more listing. So here we can just say if data.length is more than eight, so it can be nine. So in this case, we want to set the show more button to true. And then we want to make that show more button at the end of the page. So here, uh, when we just added everything, the loading effect, we show the listing. So after this div, which is here, listing result, inside this one, after this loading, we want to say if the show more is true, let's close this. We want to have a button, and then in this button, we want to have an onclick event listener, which is going to call a, a function called on show more click. We need to click uh, create it. So 
And then this button is going to, we don't need to install the button actually. I just want to say show more. So let's, let's close the button here at the top. And we bring this text inside this button. Uh, what I want to do, I just want to make it green. So I just add some simple styling here. So add a class name. We make the text to be green, 700. And then when we hover over it, I want to add an underline. Underline. And also we want to have a padding of 7 for that. So we should see the button here now. We can bring it to the center as well. It doesn't matter. So how we can bring it to the center? We can just say text center. Now it's, uh, and then we should set the width to be full. Okay, now it's in the center. So when we click on it, we want to call a function. And then the call, the function's name is unshow more click. Actually, we don't need to have a callback here. I just delete this one. Let's save. So we're going to click uh, create this function at here before the return. I'm going to create this function. This function is actually is going to fetch more data, but based on the index, because we don't want to fetch the data from index zero. We want to fetch after the whatever we have. We want to after that, we want to get the new listings. So what we want to do here, we want to get the number of listing first. We just say number of listing is going to be equal to listings.length. So the, for example, we have nine listing in the listings. So we're going to start from 10 to fetch. If we have, for example, 20, we want to start from 21. So first we get the length and also we want to get the uh, params because based on the previous params, we want to fetch data. So we get the params here. We get it from the URL. And then here we want to create the index. We just say index or a start index. We can call it a start index. This is going to be equal to that number of listings. Okay. And then we want to add this start index to the URL as well. So here, what we want to do, we want to set the start index to this start index that we have. And then we want to create the search query, which is we want it uh, to and uh, to convert this one to the string. And then we want to fetch data. So we're going to fetch data from forward slash API listings, forward slash git, and then we pass this search query. And then we want to convert the data to JSON. And then if the length, now, for example, the new one, if it's nine, we want to show the show more button more again, but if it's less than nine, we don't want to see it. So if it's data that length is less than nine, not eight in our case, because we set it to be a nine. In this case, we want to set the show more button to false. So we don't want to see that button anymore. And also after that, we want to set the listing. We want to keep the previous listing and we want to add the new listing. And as this listing is the, uh, an array two, we want to add an array to the previous array. We just spread operator the data as well. So we, we add the new listings to the previous listings. So let's test this one. Now we have actually nine listings. If you click on show more, we see another one. And as we don't have more listings because this is not nine, we don't see the button show more anymore. So let's refresh the page. And also we want to, for example, only get the offers. So the offers are only seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you click on show more, there is no nothing to fetch. And as you can see, the show more button is gone as well. So, uh, so we can do that one for the first listing uh, fetching as well. If the fetching is less than nine, we don't want to see the show more too. We can do it as well. So in this fetch, where was it? The use effect. So fetch listing here. So if it's more than nine, eight, we want to make it true. Otherwise, if it's less than nine or equals to eight, otherwise, okay. Else we want to set show more to false. So now test it again. Okay. Now we get the seven and then we don't see the show more button. But if you remove the offer, we get nine listing and also show more is here. So we have fixed that one as well. Let's try it with the rent. So 
now this uh, all of them are rents so let's add parking to it okay now it's here it's six and also as you can see we see the show more button oh, that is a let's remove the parking loading add the parking so you see the show more button here just a second as you can see so we see uh, before fetching we need to set the show more button to false here as actually set show more to false so now if we refresh the page without parking now we see the show more button with parking we don't see show more button so actually we have added successfully the show more functionality so let's add this one to the github so we have just add everything we did we create a message we just say add show more listing functionality listings okay so we can commit and push it to github so in the next section we're going to work on the home page so we have completed the search one in the next section we're going to work on the home page we're gonna design this beautiful landing page and then we're gonna add this uh a slider and also show all these things in the home page so this is going to be actually as we have the listing item card so creating this page is going to be very easy and also we have created this a slider before so we can use that one as well as our reference and we just need to create the, this design for our landing page so see you in the next section All right, in the last section, we have completed our search page. In this section, we're going to work on the home page of our project. For now, we don't have anything in the home page. We're just saying home. And then, as you can see from the final version, we have three main parts. At the top, we have this uh, title, then we have the swiper, and then we have this uh, like a result for the offers, rent, and sale. So we're gonna uh, separate our homepage to three parts. So I'm gonna go to, let's close this search. Now we go to homepage. And inside the homepage, we're gonna have three parts. So what we wanna add here is the top side. Then we have the swiper. And then finally we have the, like a showing results. So listing results for offer sale and rent okay so for the top section let's put it inside a div and let's bring this one to the left side since we can see the changes here so i'm gonna add an h1 tag and inside the h1 tag i want to say find your uh, next and then instead of uh, because i want to make this text to be in a different color so I just want to put this one in an span. So I'm, I'm going to add an span here. And inside the span, I just want to say perfect. After the span, we're going to say place with ease. Okay. After this H1 tag, we're going to have this section. So we're going to have another div. And also I want this uh, place with width goes to the next line. So I'm going to add a brick tag here. So to bring it to the next line. So after this uh, H1 tag, we're going to have a div. And inside this div, we're going to say, for example, Sahand Estate. And we can just accept these things, like uh, is the best place to find your next perfect place to uh, leave. And then also we want to have a line break. And after the line break, we're going to say, we have a wide range of properties for you to choose from. And then I'll, after that, we're going to have a link here, which is going to uh, direct us to the search page. So after this div, I want to add a link tag, which is coming from React Router DOM. You need to import it. Let's close this. <clears throat> and this is going to go to the search page. So we just say forward slash search. And then inside the link, we just want to say, uh, let's start now. Let's get it started, for example. Okay. So we have done with the uh, content. Let's style this now. 
So what I want to add is to this h1 tag, I want to add, I want to make the text to be a slate 700, font to be bold, and text to be 3 pixel. And then when it's a large screen, I want to make the text to be 6 pixel. So 3 pixel for the small size and the large, large screen, I want it to be 6 pixel. So, and then for the perfect, I just want to change its color to a slate 500. So text doesn't suggest me any text. Okay, here, text slate 500. Then we want to style this div. So for the div, I want to change the color to be gray 400. So text gray 400 and then text to be a small or uh, yes, X is small. For the mobile size, x is small, sorry. And then for the after the mobile size, I want to make the text to be a small. So like this. And then for the link tag, let's add some styling. It's going to be text x s a small and above. Make it text a small. Makes the text blue, eight hundred. And then. Uh, Let's make the font to be bold. And then when we hover over it, let's change, let's just add an underline like this. So now they are just uh, connected to each other. What we do here, we go to this div at the top that is covering these things. I just want to, uh, we make it flex and then we just use flex column and then we can set the gap to be six so what i want to do next is i want to add some padding in the y-axis so padding in the y-axis here <clears throat> so we make it 28 in the y-axis and then in the x-axis i want to make it three okay and then we can set the maximum width to be six xl so in the larger screen i want to uh, make it 6xl but in order to bring it inside uh, in the center we can just say mx auto like this i think that's it for the, this part as you can see is exactly like the final version okay so we have done with the title section let's keep continue and add the swiper if you remember we have added before the swiper but here we don't have any information we don't have any images so we don't want to add an aesthetic image. I want to use the images for the recent offer. So the last four offers. So what we want to do here, we first we want to fetch data for the offers. And also we want to fetch data for the rent and sell. It's very similar to the search because here I just want to limit the search to offers and for results. So we can do that first and then we can keep continue creating our pages. So what we do here, I want to add three pieces of states for the listings. So we have offer listings. We need to import user state. And then we're going to have for the sale. And also we want to have for the rent. So once we have these pieces of state, we want to fill them by using a user state, use effect react hook, and we're going to fetch these data. So I want to use use effect. We need to import it from React. So let's close this. And also we want to run this one one time when the page is loaded. So we're going to create a function. And this is going to be asynchronous. So what we want to fetch first is for the offers. So we just say fetch offer listing. And this is going to be asynchronous. And then we need to call this one here. Uh, sorry, not, we just need to call it. So what is the endpoint for here? So first we need to add and try and catch to catch the error. We just want to console log the error because we don't want to show the error to users. That's fine because even if they don't see it, it's fine. They just see the top section. But for the try, we want to create a response and we want to fetch data from forward slash API forward slash listing forward slash if you remember it was get and then we want to add the query we just say offer true 
we want to only get the offer and also we want to keep the limit. I want to add a limit of four. Okay, after getting the response, we want to convert it to JSON and then uh, we just set the offer listing to this data. Okay, so what we do next, I want to create another one because I want to make it a step by step. First, we want to get the offer and then we want to get the uh, places. First, we want to get the offer and then we want to get for the rent and then the sale. So when we refresh the page and come to this page, I don't want suddenly uh, request for all these things. I requested one by one. I request first the offer and then we want to request for the rent and then we do for the sale. So how we do it? So after this one is successful, here I want to call another function. So I'm going to create the function here. I want to create another function, which for example, uh, first we do the rent. Okay, first we do the rent. So here I want to create a function for the rent, for example. And then what I want to do is to call this function after this data is clear. So here I want to call that function. So in this case, until this result is not clear and the response didn't come, we don't fetch the rate for the rent. So this is going to be a step by step. So the page is going to be loaded better for the users and uh, more nicer. Okay. So, and then here, this is going to be similar. We just uh, use try and catch. We console log the error. And then we just, uh, we don't want to set the offer actually. We just say type to be rent limited to four. And we set the rent listing to data. And as you can see, we are just calling the cell listing. So we need to create this function as well, cell listing. So we use try and catch, we console log the error. And here we're gonna have a response, but this time the type is going to be cell and limited to four, we convert it to JSON. And then we wanna set the cell listing to this data. So in this case, we get the data for the offer, rent and sale. Uh, one by one after each other. Okay, so uh, let's test and we see that we are getting this data or not. So I'm gonna console log the last one, which is the sale listing, and then you see we get if we did, we get the sale, it means we already got the other ones. So we console log the sale listings. Let's go to our website. We open the in uh, web tools. We go to console, let me clear this, and then I refresh this page. Okay, we are not getting the result. I just wanna see if I have any sale listing. So let me create a listing for sale. For example, I just say new listing for sale. Let's copy this and paste it here. We make it this one for sale, and then I just put the price for 50, $500,000, I just choose some image and I upload it. So let's create this listing. As you can see, we have a listing for sale. And if you go to the home page, now you can see we have one place for sale. So actually it's working. So we are getting the uh, new listing for sale. The reason we didn't get any at the beginning because we didn't have any sale at all. So now we have this sale and also we have the offer and the rent, we can just now create our Swiper JS. So what we'd wanna do now is to go to after this, and then inside the Swiper, we wanna create our Swiper. And if you remember for Swiper, we need to, actually we need to create a condition first. We just say if there is an offer, so if the offer listings exist, and the size of it is more than one, the length of it is more than one. And then we want to create the swiper. So, uh, and also we don't need to do actually here, we can just look through the offer listing. We just say offer listings dot map, and then we just get each listing. And then here uh, we can dir directly actually return. As you remember, we have to cover everything with swiper slide. So actually we we can 
we need to cover all of them with swiper. So after this save, I want to just add the swiper. And then we put this one inside the swiper. And then here is going to be swiper a slide. Let's close this. And inside this uh, one, we're going to have a div. And a style for this one is going to be H, for example, 500 pixels. So we're going to have a height of 500 pixels. The key is going to be listing that underline ID. So let's close this div. And then what we want to do is to add some a style because Swiper doesn't work with the normal style. We need to add some style here, like a CSS style. So we set the background to be, we need to have a back tick here. And this is going to be URL. And then we have a dollar sign. We just say listing dot image URL because uh, we just want to get zero, the cover of these images. Because each listing has many, it can be, it, they can have six images, but we want only the cover. And then uh, we just want to set the, the background. So this background, it should be like this. And this one should be center and then no repeat. And also we want to set the background size to be cover. Let's save this. So background size. And also we need to add a comma here, I think. Yeah. So that's correct. And also we need to import the swiper and swiper slide at the top. So here we just import swiper and swiper slide from swiper forward slash react. And also we need to import its CSS bundle. So we just say import swiper forward slash CSS forward slash bundle. And also we need to import Swiper core from Swiper and then we need to initialize it as well. We just say here, Swiper core dot use and then we want to use navigation. We just say navigation, navigation. But we need to import navigation as well. Here we need to import navigation which is coming from Swiper, but Swiper forward slash module. Okay, so what is the error here? I think we didn't close some of these parentheses or something. So here we close this parentheses. Also, this is covering here. Also, another parentheses here. Okay, so as you can see now, we are getting the offer here. But maybe we have only one offer. Let's add another offer. For example, I add a name, new listings for sale with offer. So I'm going to just add more. So this is going to be sale with the offer. The price is going to be 500,000 and then discounted with few dollars. Let's add some images. So now we can create the listing. And if you go to the home page, we can see Okay, since sounds like that I don't have that uh, navigation tool here. Let's console log the offer. We see that we get more than one offer first. So console log offer listings. Let's open the inspect. Let's refresh the page. Okay, this error we should fix it because we need to add a key somewhere in the home page. And then we have four offers actually, but we don't have this navigation. So we need to I think I missed something here in the navigation. So this is navigation from swiper forward slash modules. Uh, let's bring this CSS bundle here at the bottom. And also we have this uh, swiper swiper slide from forward slash swiper forward slash react swiper core from swiper. And then we just say swiper dot core uh, swiper core dot use. And then we have used this navigation, I think navigation so this is correct uh, let's check here okay i hear i forgot to add navigation here as well so inside the swiper you need to say navigation so now we have the navigation you can just uh, let's refresh the page first okay it's working now uh, some of the images are broken so it's fine so it's working after the swiper we want to work on showing the 
listings. So after this swiper, we're going to show the listing. So I'm going to have a div here. And then also I want to set the maximum width to be 6XL. So we have the same uh, way here as well. So we just say MX Auto. We have a padding of 3. We want to make it flex and flex column. And then we want to have a gap between these listings of, for example, 8. And then we want to have a margin Y of 10. So, and then inside this one, we're going to have the three things. For example, we just say for the offer, we just say if there is an offer and uh, if, let me fix it like this, offer listings. So if we have offer listing and then offer listings length is more than zero, then we want to show the offer listings. And then we want to have a div here. And inside this div, we're going to, first thing first, I want to add an H. Uh, so let's see. So we have actually, in the final version, we should see that first we have a title here, H2 tag. We have a link. And these two are inside a div as well. And also then we have the listings. So we're going to have another div here. And inside this div is going to be a H2 tag saying recent offers. And then we want to have a link tag, which is going to, let's close this. And this is going to be the, with the address forward slash. We want to go to bring them to the search page. So we just say search and then we just say, but offer should be true. Okay. So they have to see more offers there because we, this is without limit. And then we just say show more offers. So let's see what we have here. Okay, we have this text. And then we want to have that listing. So after this div, we're going to have another div. Or we can just, yeah, we just say we add another div. And inside this div, we're going to say we create a kind uh, of, we just say offer listing dot map. We get all the listings, and then we want to show the listings. But we want to use our listing item components. So we just say listing item. We need to import it. So this is coming from here, listing item dot JSX. Let's open it so we can get the suggestion. So, and this one is going to have the listing. We're gonna send the listing, and also we have a key of listing dot ID. So. Uh, that's it, I think. So we need to close another parenthesis here. So let's check. Okay, we are getting the listings like this, but they are on top of each other. And also we see here. So what we can do inside this div, we want to create a flex box. We want to bring use a flex wrap. If we have a, a smaller size screen, we want to bring them on top of each other. Uh, so now they, they, they are next to each other. But if there is no space, the extra one goes to the next line. So that's why we are using flex wrap. And then we can just add a gap between them. We just say gap four, like this. And then let's style this H2 tag and also this link. So for the H2 tag, we want to create a text with the size of 2XL. We want to set the font to be semi-bold. And then we want to create the text color to be a slate 600, like this. And then what else we want to do for the link tag, let's add a class name and uh, we can just change the text to be a small. We can change the text color to be blue 800. And when we hover over it, we want to have a underline like this. And for the div that is covering both of them, we want to add a margin Y of three. Okay. I think that's enough. That one looks good. So we want to do the same things for the other ones, like uh, places for rent and places for sale. So we can just uh, copy this one and make it for other places. So we can just copy from here this offer. Uh, I'm going to close this so I can easily copy it. I want to copy it two more times using Alt-Shift-Arrow done. So we should see now three offers. So for the second one, this is the first one. The second one, the title is going to be uh, for rent. 
So recent places for rent. Recent places for rent. And then show more places for rent. And this is going to go to forward slash search forward slash type. And the type is going to be rent. And then we want to look through the rent listings. And also here we want to say rent listings. If there is a length listing and the length is more than zero. So we should see the places for rent now. As you can see, they are all places for rent. And the last one, this is going to be sale listing. Let's copy this and change this one. Change this one. This one is going to be recent places for sale. Show more places for sale. And this is going to be with the type of sale. So everything is good. Yeah, we only have two places for sale. Okay, everything looks good. And also here, when we click on it, we go to the search place. When we click on these show more offers, we go to the search page, but the, with the offer true. And let's test this sale as well. It is, this, as you can see, this is the places for sale. All right, so that was it for creating the home page. Let's add this one to the GitHub. So we just say complete home page. So in the next section, I want to just uh, deploy the website to the Versal. So I, we just, the only things left to the website is this about page that is very simple. So I'm going to create it in the next page, in the next section and then deploy it, deploy the whole website to the render platform. So see in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the home page. In this section, we're going to work on the about page and complete it as we have in the final version. It's very simple to do that. So we can go back to Visual Studio Code and then we can just go to about.jsx page. And then here, uh, let's add some. Uh, so let's bring this one to the right side. So we just copy this one. So what we want to do here in this div, and uh, we have an h1 tag saying about the hand state. After that, we're going to have a paragraph. And this is going to be the first paragraph. Let me copy this and paste it here. After this one, we have another paragraph. Let's copy this. And then finally, we ha we're going to have the last one, which is saying this. Let's bring the, our final version. Let's install this real quick. So for the H1 tag, let's make the text to be 3XL. We set the font to be bold. And then we want to add a margin bottom of 4 to add some space here. And then we want to change the text color to be a slate 800. For the paragraph, uh, let's add a dual cursor to the paragraph so we're going to style them together. So we can just... Okay, we cannot close it, but we can do the dual cursor by ch keeping the alt. And uh, we choose the next one, which is here and here. We just add a class name. And then I want to just mar add a margin bottom of 4 and set the text color to be a slate 700. For the div at the top, I want to add a padding in the y-axis of 20 and padding in the x-axis of 4. And then we want to set the maximum width to be 6XL. And we, we bring it to the center using MX Auto. Something like that. So that's it for the About page. And also I want to change this title from Width plus React to something more meaningful. So to change the title, we can just go to SRC. We go to the index.html. And here we can change the title. For example, I just change it to... Uh, the hand a state and then also the this link tag we don't need it we can delete it because we don't have this file anymore actually so now we should see the hand estate in the title so that was it for the about page let me uh, quickly add this one to the github so we just say complete about page so we have done with the website in the next section we're going to deploy it to the 
render platform. So see in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed our project by creating and completing the about page. In this section, we're going to deploy our application to render platform. Before doing that, we need to do some changes in our package.json and also index.js inside the API folder. So we go back to Visual Studio Code and let me close everything. And we go to API, we go to package.json. If you remember, we have added this MPN start for the production mode. We also need to add a script to build our client side. So we just say, if we run npn run build inside the server, inside the Versal, first install the backend, which is in the root of the, our project. We just say npn install. Then we can add an end. We just say, we can write it down with the prefix. We just say npn install with the dash dash prefix client. It means go to the client folder and then run npn build. And also before running npm build, we need to actually, uh, it actually we did, we did the npm install inside the client side. We have built it. And also we want to npm build also inside the client side. So we just say, first we install the backend and then we install the client side and then we build the client side. So once you build this application, you get an extra folder of the built application inside the client, which, which is going to be dist in vit they're gonna call it dist d-i-s-t and once you have this folder and then we can uh, run that folder by our uh, backend which this file index.js where is the backend api index.js so we need to actually do a couple of things here first i want to get the directory name so we need to import so here we're going to import path from path and using this path we want to make the directory name uh, what i mean by directory name is because we have a dynamic things for example here we have a folder structure in my computer okay this is a folder inside my desktop and then we have forward slash api and here we have forward slash client but inside this uh, server like a render we don't have such a folder inside the desktop so we need to create a dynamic path name so even in this computer or the other computers, this code is going to work. So we're going to get the, the create the dynamic uh, directory name by using path.resolve. And using this directory name, what I want to do is to create a static folder. Remember, we have built our, our client side, npn run build, and this is going to create a folder called this. And in this folder, we're going to have a file called index.html. And so what we want to do here after this API route, it should be after that. Otherwise, they're gonna, not going to work. So in this forward slash API user, we're going to call the API and here. But what if they go to the forward slash instead of forward slash API? So they, we have to run the client side. So we just say after use, we create a static folder. We just say express that static. We use the directory name that we have and we join it. So we have the directory name. So in my computer is forward slash, for example, desktop, and then we have the name and then API, but in the, comp in the render, it can be anything else. So we join the directory name, which is dynamic with the forward slash client, this client, and then the file that is built using npm run build, which is in this is going to be, in vit is going to be dist. If you use the create react app, this is going to be build. So that's the difference. And then after that, we just say any address except these three uh, run the index.html. So we just say get app.get if you go any addresses, but these addresses are excluded. Okay. So we have request and response. Let me close this first. Okay. So now we, we're going to send back a file. We're going to join the directory dynam dynamic directory name, bit forward slash client. Uh, we can we can do it like the this way too. We can just say client, and then this, and then we're gonna call that index.html. So any address we go on the URL that is not 
forward slash API forward slash user forward slash API forward slash auth and forward slash API forward slash listing is going to run this index.html, which is here inside the client side, inside the dist folder, which is going to be built during the NPN run build. So this is the meaning of this. So that is enough for us to be ready to deploy our application to render. So what we want to do, first, we want to uh, actually commit this one and add it to our GitHub repository because we need that GitHub repository in the latest update to be able to add it to the render. So I'm going to add this one and just call it add pre-installation. Uh, add pre-installation. So that's enough. We just uh, commit and push it. And now we go to render application. We just go to render. We search for not render forest, just render. And inside the search results, we go to render.com. And here we need to sign in. This is free to use. Don't worry about it. It's free. So we just go dashboard. Uh, but before dashboard, we need to sign in. I'm going to sign in with my Gmail account. Once you're signing, you see your application. I already deployed three applications before. So what you do here, you can click on new and click on web service. So we want to build it by our GitHub repository. We just say build and deploy from a GitHub repository. We just click on next. This is going to load my GitHub repository. The reason I'm seeing my GitHub repository because I have connected my GitHub repository to render. Otherwise, if you don't see this one, connect your GitHub repository. After that, you're going to see all your GitHub repositories here. And this, the last one that I committed one minute ago is Marin Estate. I just click on connect. And now I just create a name for my service. I just call it, for example, Marin dash estate. You can choose the, any location. Uh, I just choose US West and we choose the main root directory is going to be empty because the root of directory of application is just this root because we have the package.json inside the root of our directory. So you just keep it empty. For the runtime, we just use node. For the build, we just write down npn run build. And this npn run build is going to actually run this, this one for us. npn install, npn install prefix client, and etc. So npn run build, for the start, we have npm start as we have here, npm start. And then we choose the free plan. It's a bit slow, but it's okay. You can uh, use it for now for free. And if you have a successful application later, you can update it as well. And then in the advanced part, we want to add our environmental variables. So we just click on add environmental variables. We just go to our .env file. We just copy Mongo. We paste it here. For the Mongo, this is the URL. I'm going to paste it here. And then we have the JWT secret. We paste it here and then just don't copy the code. Just the text is enough. And then we want to add one more, which is inside our client side, which is with Firebase underline API key. And then this is the, we just copy the API key and paste it here. So this is for our environmental variables. That's enough. Uh, we can just leave everything like this. And then here we click on create web service. So this is going to take a while. This is our uh, URL of our application, but don't click on it until you get live here. As you can see, first, this is going to install, npn install, npn install the client and etc. And this is going to take a while. When it's finished, I'm going to come back and uh, we're going to fix the remainder part of our project. Okay, seems like we got an error. And if you scroll up, you see the error we get. So here, we can see that they couldn't resolve a sign up from the app.jsx. So if I come back, I go to app.jsx. When I imported the sign up page, uh, as you can see, the sign up is sign up with the U, capital U.jsx. But I have imported it like a sign up normally. So I'm going to fix this one, sign up. And also this one is okay. So I'm going to just... Uh, Again, add this one to the GitHub. We just say fix sign up, fix the app.jsx file for sign up. So, I, and then we can commit and push. And this is going to 
push the new version and probably this is going to run automatically again otherwise i'm gonna run this one manually so let's go back to our dashboard so as you can see now they are deploying it again because when you uh, change a commit inside a github repository this is going to actually trigger this render and this is going to deploy it again so if you click now again and then we go to our deploy we can see now it is working let's see if we can get the uh, this time a correct one we are getting some warning about the tailwind css line graph that's not important the warning is fine okay it seems like it's working it's building now it's already built our application it's uploading the build okay now it's deploying our application so it seems like this time is successful so it says build successful and we we need to wait until this one gets live because this is in progress even if it gets live in my experience you need to wait another few minutes like five minutes to test your application otherwise you get an error because they said live but it's not actually live so now it's running our node uh, js and as you can see the server is running on port 3000 and also it is connected to the database so let's uh, let me pause the video and i'll be i'll be back when the installation is completed all right so now this service is live as you can see we get the live here i waited a few minutes now so and now if you click on our the url of our application this is going to run our application as you can see the first page is working as i as we expect let's try to sign in uh, first we sign up with the user for example i sign up with the user 30 or 33 at and then user 33 at gmail.com let's choose the same email for password and we click on sign up okay the sign up was working let's sign in okay it's working too and then in the here inside the profile let's change the image first i choose my rooster image so now it's uploading so the firebase storage is working so along with the image i want to update the user name for example i just write down user 73 we can click on update as you can see user is updated successfully and then uh, let's create listing for example i just say new listing from user 33 i just copy it let's make it for example an offer with the price of five hundred thousand with a discounted price of this much let's have a parking furnish let's add some image so i'm going to upload four images so it's working too let's create the listing so this is the page uh the about page is working home page is working let's try these links okay search is working as well the show more button is working so what else for example we want to see the listing we can see the listing here and let's try to sign out with this user or delete this account let's sign out and then we sign in with google but as i mentioned before for the google we need to add the url otherwise the google is not going to work as you can see the uh, the the page is popping up and closing quickly so we need to just go to firebase.google.com make sure you go to your console here you choose the account uh this one was main estate and then in the authentication just go to setting and then authorize domain and add this domain so we need to copy this domain url and then add it here once you add it and then we can just click on uh, let's refresh the page first and then once you click on google uh, continue with google you can now you see it's working and then we can choose one of our accounts for example this one as you can see now we have profile with this person and uh, i think everything is working fine so that was it for de uh, deploying to the render the process thanks for watching i hope you learned many things from this project and let me know your opinion about the project and see you in the next project